Hey everyone. Welcome back for the fourth part of Cammy's experiment. I've seen you guys keep on showing so much love for this amazing story, and so I'm bringing you the next part as soon as possible. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Tuning exams, some things never change, and yet, something things never stay the same, the morning finally came, the tuning exams were here. Naruto didn't know what to expect since Tsunade had agreed to warn Konoha about Arishimaru ahead of time. He knew from Tsunade's and Shizune's briefing those plans had been changed and Tsunade told him that the 2nd round of the tuning exams would be completely different. Hopefully that would prevent Orochimaru from sinking his fangs into Sasuke and prevent a key event that led to the bitter conclusion. Naruto broke himself out of his thoughts and took a moment to appreciate the two blondes that were sleeping next to him. Ino had snuck out and joined the craziness at the Senju compound last night. He had kept it PG-13, not wanting to do anything too fast too soon, but that didn't mean he would refuse either of his loves his bed. The feeling of their heads on his chest with their blonde hair splayed out all of his body and pillows was truly a gift from Kami. Good morning, loves. It's time to get up, he whispered, placing a kiss on each of their foreheads. Ino mumbled and pushed her head deeper into his chest. Five more minutes. Tamari mirrored Ino, except she had a little bit of droll dribbling off of her chin and onto his chest. Hmm, ten more minutes, Naruto chuckled and played with each of their hair. He didn't have the heart to refuse them anything and they had plenty of time to get to the academy. He soaked up the affection and enjoyed the moment while it lasted. That was until Konkuro crashed through the door and flipped the bed, before turning around and running out of the room giggling like a loon. Two pissed off blondes in their nightwear grew tick marks and demon horns before chasing the doomed Sunijanan out of the room. As Naruto finished brushing his teeth, his sensitive ears picked up screams of pain coming from the training area. He chuckled again and shook his head, he could appreciate a good prank, but Konkuro never thought of the ramifications of his actions whenever said prank involved Tamari. Two hours later, after eating a good breakfast, Naruto linked up with Team 8 out front of the academy. Tamari and Samui convinced Naruto that showing up together would be a bad idea. They should keep their alliance under wraps for as long as possible to give them an advantage during the exam. He waved to Shino and Hinata and shot them one of his gigawatt smiles. You two ready for this? Logically speaking, we are well ahead of our Janan compatriots. I believe we have a high probability of success. Shino answered in his monotone. I, um, yeah, I agree with Shino, Hinata said. Naruto laughed at Hinata's sheepish response before he slung an arm over her shoulder. Ha ha, relax Hinaheim, you are strong. Plus, you will have Gara there to protect you as well. He wiggled his eyebrows for effect which drew a chuckle from Shino and a nuclear blush from Hinata. I, um, well. Hinata stumbled across her words as Naruto dragged her into the academy, laughing all the way. Team 8 put their game faces on once they entered the academy. They walked past the group on the second floor that was duped by the Genjutsu. Memories of Team 9's previous antics made Naruto laugh internally, which made Kurama chuckle as well. Naruto had requested for his partner to be in the seal with him in case he needed to confront Orochimaru. Kurama willingly agreed, saying that it would be fun to see how Naruto handled the exams this time around. Naruto noticed that Team 9 was absent this time around, but he sighed in disappointment when he heard Team 7 arrive as he was beginning to ascend the stairway to the three-road floor. Sasuke, ever the proud little Uchiha, had his monkey marbles active and Naruto heard him call out. Drop this petty genjutsu and let us pass. You cannot fool the supreme eyes of the Uchiha, Sasuke said arrogantly. Yeah, who are you to get in Sasuke-kun's way? Let us pass. Sakura screeched, making Kiba and Akamaru wince. Naruto turned and walked up the stairs, completely devoid of the will to put up with Team 7's bullshit. He ushered Hinata and Shino to follow him, Shino spoke up. I have tagged all relevant parties. My bugs will gather the information for us, he whispered. Good, remember, your targets are the Auto Team, Ame Teams, Kuza Teams and Iwa Teams. I am not worried about our allies, but I want you to have bugs spying on them. They are to return if they hear anything concerning them targeting us. Naruto answered back. Do you really think we will be targeted? Hinata asked with a hint of trepidation. Naruto shot an apologetic look at Hinata. Yes, without a doubt. I have not hidden who I am, 
and I have made a name for myself in Suna and Wave. Don't worry, I will keep you safe, Hinaheim. Not to mention Gara told me he would have your back as well. Hinata blushed and buried herself in her jacket to hide her embarrassment. Well, it is good to see you three looking confident. You shouldn't tease your teammates so much though, Naruto, Itachi said with a small smile on his face. Naruto smiled, come to see us off, sensei? Itachi nodded. Jonin sensei are required to make sure their teams report with all three members, otherwise the team would be unable to compete. I have trained you well, remember to work together and have faith in each other. You will do fine. Thanks, sensei. Chorus team ate before walking through the door, 30 minutes before the start of the test. Oh, and I like the new uniform, Ruto. Itachi added. Thanks sensei. Naruto replied as he smoothed out his uniform. He was wearing a black hoodie style jacket with pouches sewn into the front. On the pouch was the crest of the Senju overlapped on the Uzumaki whirlpool. On the back was a bigger version of this emblem and across his shoulders there was orange kanji that said, family above all. The sleeves were rolled at the elbow and tied with his weight bands. His resistance seals were condensed down into what appeared to be a tattooed bracelet on each wrist. For his lower body, he wore a burnt orange utility belt that held his sealing and medical kits with hitches for his scabbards in case he wanted to wear his swords on his waist. He left Benihim and his wakazashi in his wrist seals, not wanting to show off his mother's sword this early in the competition. He finished the outfit off with black cargo pants with burnt orange pocketing and black combat boots with burnt orange laces. All in all, he was able to satisfy his love for orange and he did it in a more tactical manner than the last time around. Walking into the room, Naruto noticed that all eyes in the room were fixed on him and his teammates. He barely noticed the paltry killing intent that the room of Janan were throwing, but it was clear that Hinata and Shino were put off by it. He flared his chakra a bit, encompassing his teammates in a warm feeling and saw that his two friends had visibly relaxed. He turned his attention on the classroom and decided to address them. All right, kiddos, enough with the intimidation attempt. You can barely scare off a small puppy, so just play nice or I will be forced to do something drastic, he said calmly. A scoff came out from the back of the room before three Iwa Janan stepped forward. A girl with short cropped black hair, black eyes with pink irises and her red Iwa uniform stepped forward. Kurotsuchi saw her main target and decided to get a glimpse of her arch enemy. Her two new Janan teammates stepped up and placed themselves on either of her shoulders. Seeing two easy targets behind Naruto, she flared her key in an attempt to throw them off their game. Well, 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 if it isn't Naruto Senju, son of the demon spawn, mass murdering son of A, Kurotsuchi's haughty tone ended abruptly, she choked on her own words before she could get the last word out. Her and her two teammates felt a deadly power choking the breath out of their lungs and forcing them to the ground. She looked up and saw emerald, green eyes, glowing with power and looking directly at her. She saw a faint green chakra aura emanating from Naruto and knew that she may have gone too far. Ah, Kurotsuchi, granddaughter of the Tsuchikage. Funny, I thought you were a Chunin by now. Can't say I am surprised since I have heard how your grandfather works. I suggest you refrain from talking about my parents in such a manner, you aren't in Kansas anymore. Princess. Naruto's voice came out in a calm tone that was much more menacing than his growl. It was overflowing with power, carrying the promise of death should its warning not be heeded. Kurotsuchi slowly nodded her head, her hands holding her up from completely collapsing on the ground. As swiftly as the pressure landed on her, it departed just as quickly. She was able to breathe again, but with the oxygen came the realization that she couldn't take this kid. As strong as she was, such raw power didn't belong in the hands of a mere Janan. Her danger senses were flaring, and she knew she would have to reevaluate her mission. Shaking off the fear and forcing herself to her feet, she noticed that most of the classroom wasn't faring any better than she was. Some kids were passed out in their chairs, others shaking while sweating profusely, a couple passed out cold on the floor and overall, the Janan teams were making an effort to avoid eye contact with Naruto as they regained their wits. A cough from Naruto forced her attention back onto him. Look, princess, I am not here to pick a fight, but it is clear you are. So, I will offer a warning. Don't fuck with my team. Do that, and you will have a pleasant stay in the land of Oz. Naruto flashed a toothy grin at Kurotsuchi and brushed past her to join Team 9 in the back of the large classroom. While walking, he listened to Kurama snicker and say that it was worth it being stuck in the seal again just to see that. However, Naruto was bothered by something. He racked his brain and searched his memory trying to remember if Iwa even sent any teams in his last life. By the time he joined Team 9, he realized that this was yet another change to the timeline. The only thing that could have brought Iwa here was himself. Oh boy, 
these exams are going to be fun. Of course, Naruto wasn't worried about himself, he was only concerned about Shino and Hinata. That was quite the show you put on, Ruto. Ten Ten snickered. Indeed, it was a most youthful example of your flames of youth. After your mom fixes my coils, will I be able to make such a youthful display? Lee shouted, gaining attention from around the room. Quiet down, Lee. We do not want to draw unwanted attention to ourselves. Naruto, that was quite the statement you made. You already have enough targets on your back, I would advise you not to needlessly add more, Neji said in a calm, yet dignified, tone. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. He he, well I was never good at laying low. She was about to cross the line and I simply informed her that it would be unwise to cross said line. Oh, is that all you did? Ten Ten said with a cocked eyebrow. Naruto shrugged, which let Hinata get into the conversation. Good afternoon, big brother. Did you bring your bow along? Father asked me to make a statement, so I was hoping you would join me. Neji smirked, yes, sister. I have my bow sealed away and I am more than ready to make a statement. With long-range prowess and the ultimate short-range taijutsu, the Hyuga clan will soon be feared again. How do you two like the new foldable compound bows? Any issues you found or tweaks you want made? Naruto asked, his voice indicating he was in his inventor mode. I like that it is collapsible and light. The sealed arrows are really nice too, Hinata said quietly. Neji nodded, I agree with Hinata. I tried using the bow as a short-range weapon like you showed, but I am concerned about breaking it. Will reinforcement seals work, like the ones you have on your swords? Naruto shook his head in the negative. Sadly, I already have too many active seals. It would become very chakra draining if I added the reinforcement seals and I would have to do that while they are being forged. That is why I added the bladed wings though, so you can channel chakra through them, which should make them able to stand up to any standard swords. Neji frowned, yes, I saw that. My chakra channeling needs work. Think I could get some pointers on that? This is the first time in my lifetime that Hyugas are actually using weapons. Naruto laugh internally. The difference between this Neji and the previous Neji during the Chunin exams was astronomical. Sure, he still had a chip on his shoulder and quite a bit of darkness from his father's situation, but he was still loads better. Kurama was just nodding his head inside the seal. In Naruto's previous life he wanted to break the seal and devour the pathetic bitch of fate. It was this comment that had Naruto distracted by his internal laughter. Naruto was broken from his musings with Kurama due to a loud and familiar screech. Teams 8 and 9 turned to see Sasuke being the center of attention that he always loved to be. Come to think of it, Naruto could see five other Uchihas around the classroom, yet another positive change. Sure, Kurama may disagree with that, but Naruto counted it as a positive. While Team 7 blabbered away and the talk with Kabuto began, Naruto was happy to see Ino and Team 10 walk right past Team 7. She sauntered up to him, placed her arms around his neck and placed a kiss on his lips. Naruto felt more than a couple kunoichi flare up in jealousy and he saw Tamari smirking at him when he broke the kiss with Ino. She was looking at him in a way that said, Just you wait, mister. I am getting mine when this stupid test is done. Naruto threw Tamari a wink and was pleased to see he got a small blush out of the kunoichi. Naruto tuned into the conversation as he saw Kabuto pulling out his nin info cards and he wasn't surprised when Sasuke asked for information on Gara, Samui, and Naruto. Before any of his friends' information could be shared, a super dense water bullet ripped through the stack of cards. All heads in the room turned toward Naruto, who was holding his right hand in a gun shape and blowing imaginary smoke off the tip of it. Now, Kabuto, was it? I don't think it is necessary to reveal to the whole world that you are a spy. You are probably even a pretty good spy, but the question is, who do you spy for? Naruto said in an overly calm tone, which made Kabuto start sweating. Kabuto laughed awkwardly and tried to steal Naruto's signature pose, which didn't sit well with our resident Jinchuriki. I, I don't know what you are talking about, Lord Sanju. Internally, Kabuto was enraged, but he had an image to project. He would get the bastard back in the second round where nobody would be watching. He was confident that he could take this. Shanan, but it wasn't yet time for his activities to come to light. I simply wanted to share information I have gathered with my comrades. Yeah, Senju, why did you destroy the cards before I got any good information? Sasuke snarled, he looked truly upset that he couldn't get the goods on Naruto. Naruto shot a look at Gara and Samui, who each smiled and gave him a small nod. Naruto stepped onto the desk and began an overly dramatic speech. Since everyone is so interested, I am Naruto Senju Uzumaki, son of Kushina Uzumaki and Minato Namikaze. I am damned proud of my parents, so if you wish for a painful death, 
Go ahead and bad mouth them in my presence. I was trained by Tsunade Senju, Rasa no Subaku and Itachi Uchiha. I am stronger than each and every one of you, not a question of if, but how much stronger that you should be asking yourselves. I lost count of my S, A and B rank missions, but I have a couple hundred thanks to my seals. Gara, you wanna go next? Naruto finished with a smirk toward his brother. Gara simply stood from his leaned position on the wall. I am Subaku no Gara, youngest child of the four TH Kazekage. Naruto is my brother, and he is the only one to ever make me bleed. Gara stopped here and flared his key while looking around the room. If you choose to fight me, and you are not Naruto, you will lose. Samui? Samui smiled at her two friends, she really missed spending time with them. Hmm, Samui from Kumo, Master Swordswoman, pretty cool at lightning jutsu. I studied in the exchange program with Naruto and Gara before graduating at the top of my class. If you aren't my friend, you aren't cool. People that aren't cool die, or at least that has been the trend so far. If you see those two, I advise you to run, or the results will not be cool, Naruto laughed heartily at Samui's address. There you go, your top three from Konoha, Kumo, and Suna. Anything else to add, spy boy? Naruto turned his cold gaze on Kabuto. NN no, Lord Senju. Th that was pretty thorough, Kabuto said meekly, which made Naruto's smirk turn feral. The thought of crushing this snake was starting to overwhelm Naruto's mind. Easy, kit. Wait for the right time and place. You have no proof that he is a spy at this time. Kurama calmed his container down. Who needs proof when you have a sword, Q? Naruto thought back. Kurama chuckled, HMMHMM, well, I don't disagree with your logic, but if you want to stay in this village then you will need to play this right. Stick to the plan, kid. The rest of the first test proceeded much like the main story, until the end. One of the key differences is that Naruto was leaking key throughout the exam, increasing the pressure on the Janan. It made Iviki's methods far more effective, and it separated the wheat from the chaff pretty quickly. At the 49th minute, smoke filled the classroom and there were three thumps followed immediately by the sound of cracked wood. By the time the smoke cleared, three auto ninjas were unconscious at their desks and their papers were nowhere to be seen. During the smoke screen, which was caused by the creation and immediate dispelling of over 100 shadow clones, Naruto made his move on the sound team. In the smoke screen, in less than three seconds, Naruto sent three shadow clones to smash Kin's, Dosu's and Zaku's heads into the desks before stealing their exams. Iviki was enraged that somebody disrupted his exam, but he had no definitive proof of what happened or who did it. It took him a total of 10 seconds to realize something was going on before he cleared the chakra smoke with a minor wind jutsu called air current. By the time the smoke cleared, everyone was looking around the classroom trying to figure out what just happened. Iviki glared around the room, trying to find the culprit. His glare was so fierce, especially when combined with overflowing ki, that a Janan from Kusa fainted and a Janan from Taki pissed himself. A Chunin proctor informed him that it was time for the 10th question, and he broke into his usual spiel. Instead of Naruto providing a confidence boost this time around, he let his aura leak out again for further intimidation. The result was a mere 32 teams remaining by the end of the first round. Naruto enjoyed Anko's display this time around, but he couldn't stop the blush that filled his cheeks. The lucid dreams that were actually memories of Rias and Anko immediately came to mind. Let's just say that even with his previous life's experience, Naruto was never so creative in bed and the images of the two beauties always rose to the surface when he saw Anko. A wad of paper to the back of his head combined with a glare from Ino shattered those thoughts and let him focus on what Anko was saying. Alright, kiddos, sadly I don't get to take you to my playground this year. Evidently, too many kitties died during the last excursion to my playground and the Hokage felt like playing nice. We have 32 teams remaining, so your team leader will come up here and grab a packet for me. Each of these packets has three coded messages that will tell your team where you need to go, and it will also have a cipher. You are to decode this message and report to the assigned training ground. These messages are standard in the shinobi world, and you need to know how to read them quickly and accurately. There are essentially four groups, kitties. There are four training grounds that you will need to locate and secure one of two medallions that are there. I will save the surprises for those who get their hands on a medallion. Any questions? An Ame Janan raised his hand and started asking his question. Too bad, I don't give a fuck. Figure it the fuck out, you are supposed to be shinobi. Now, team leaders, come up front and get your sealed packet. The packet will unlock once I let it, so don't try to open it before I tell you. Naruto and other team leaders moved forward and collected their packets. Naruto saw room, 201 on the outside of his packet and returned to gather Shino and Hinata. 
From what he gathered, other teams were assigned a room where they could work as well. He stood by Hinata and Shino and waited for Anko to explain further. Once everyone had their packets, Anko spoke up. If you haven't figured it out already, each group is assigned a room to work in. Fun story, each team in your room will have your same packet. Physical attacks on other teams are not allowed. Until you decipher your message, you are to remain in that room. You have 5 minutes to get to your assigned room before the 2 ND phase begins. Now, scram. Anko was cackling as she watched the Janan teams try to force their way out of the doors. The first Janan teams into each room were treated to paint bombs, tar, feathers, paralysis traps, and itching powder. Anko basically did everything she could to tilt the Janan teams and make it harder for them to focus. The Jonin sensei watched their teams on the monitors and they felt sorry for them while they rolled around on the ground clutching their sides. Best, Chunin, exams, ever. Asuma wheezed out through fits of laughter as he kept his eyes on the monitor. Baki, who was also on the ground laughing, added, that, crazy snake, lady is, terrifying. Kakashi, who was giggling normally while looking at the monitors over the top of his book, added, you have no idea, Baki. Don't ever piss her off. If you do, make sure you kill her or you run very, very fast. Han watched through his mask with a raised eyebrow while Kokuo let out deep chuckles in his mind. So, Konoha chooses to make a mockery out of the Chunin exams? Itachi stopped his chuckling and addressed the Jinchuriki. Trap making, diffusing and detection, as well as situational awareness, are being trained her. Maybe you are just mad your Janan princess got tarred and feathered? This comment, made in Itachi's stoic monotone, drew laughs from the other Jonin. Ah yes, Uchiha, you are the instructor of that boy. Look at what he is doing and tell me that is not a mockery. Han bit back. Itachi looked at the monitor and saw Team 8 huddled up in a privacy barrier while an army of clones were in the room performing a variety of distracting and arguably unprofessional actions. Asuma tuned the volume to listen into room 201 where Naruto's team, a team from Kumo, Kuza, Amei, two teams from Suna and another team from Konoha were. I know a song that gets on everybody's nerves, everybody's nerves, everybody's nerves. Yes, I know a song. Asuma rapidly muted the monitor as the Jonin sensei cringed at the off-pitched singing of the multitude of blondes. He is taking advantage of the exam's rules, distracting and agitating his enemies and guiding his team to the objective. I see no problem with his strategy. Itachi replied coolly, which earned a laugh from Yugito. Ha ha, Itachi, Samui told me your kid was a genius. I am just glad she is not matched up against him. Holy shit, he is done already? Ten minutes ago, in room 201. The second phase just began, and Naruto set his dastardly plan into motion. He knew Anko would never let the Janan escape her devious entertainment slash torture, so he had held his team back before entering the room. He watched on, heavily amused, as one trap after another caught the Janan teams assigned to the room. He sent in a couple clones to clear out a space for his team before they used Kawarimi to switch places with Team 8. As soon as they were given the go, he created 50 shadow clones and erected a barrier with Team 8, himself and two shadow clones inside. He used the principles of the shadow clone jutsu to copy the packet before he handed a page to Hinata and Shino. Okay guys, quick and easy. I copied the ciphers, Hinata and Shino work on your pages from top down. Clones, from bottom up. Meet in the middle and voila. Once we have the clues, we will figure it out quick while the clone army is doing its job. Naruto ordered and got two nods from his teammates. They set to work deciphering their messages in absolute silence, except for the scratching of pens to write down the transcribed message. He took the three-road page for himself and set to work with his transcribed message not making any sense. After eight minutes, Hinata spoke up. Okay, I have the first page. My transcribed message is 7 times 4 divided by 12. Now bend over and grab your ankles. Hinata blushed as she said the last part the clone deciphered. Good work Hinata, I'm almost done. Shino? Naruto said, clearly concentrating on his task. Shino put his pen down and pushed up his glasses. 2 plus 2 makes 4, dummy. Now add that to your previous score, Naruto chuckled, ha ha, Anko had fun with this one. Okay, done. Take your sum and multiply by 2, pwa ha 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 Anko. If you can't do the math, go to the whorehouse's bath. Shino suppressed a chuckle, or was that irritation, it was always hard to tell with the abarame. That means 4 plus 4 times 2 which equals 16. Naruto shrugged, training ground 16 then. Any team in here you guys want to help or fight? Shino looked around the room before his glasses fixed on a particular team. Do you want to fight that Kabuto guy? 
He claims he failed the exam six times already. What do you think, Q? Naruto thought. Probably not the best idea, Kit. He could hurt or kill your team. Remember, even if he is a snake, he is at least Jonin level. Kurama answered through the link. Naruto scoffed internally before replying to Shino. Let's not. Kabuto is not what he seems. Um, how about the Suna team with Mayuri on it? Hinata suggested. Fine by me. Naruto dispelled one of his clones and saw a shadow clone approaching the group of Suna Janan. Naruto dropped the barrier, teammate checked out with an extremely annoyed Chunin proctor and they used a series of shunshine to get to training ground 16 within 20 minutes of the exam starting. Naruto held up the hand signal for halt as he surveyed the training ground. Hinata, scan for traps. Remember, this is Anko we are talking about so be thorough, Naruto said. Hinata activated her Byakugan and saw that the clearing was filled with traps. She gulped before she began pointing them out to Naruto. These traps were more deadly than the ones in the classroom, but Hinata pointed out the medallions. Naruto locked onto the location before he turned and asked his question. Hard and fast or slow and easy? Naruto asked. Shino shrugged through his trench coat. It is a race. Will we survive hard and fast? Naruto smirked devilishly. We will. Before he formed his cross-hand sign. They won't. 100 Naruto shadow clones popped into existence and their creator pointed in the direction of the amulet. Shino and Hinata watched in morbid fascination as a horde of shadow clones charged in the direction he pointed. They ran, with no regard for stealth or decency, directly at the amulet. They charged forward, unsung heroes of the Naotoverse as traps exploded left and right. Small fireballs, braces of kunai and shuriken, spike traps, falling logs, spike netting and many more horrors illuminated the battlefield in an orchestra of gore and wasted ninja supplies. Shisui Uchiha was moaning and groaning about being a proctor for the 2ND exam. He was the Anbu commander for Kami's sake and now he was told he had to watch Bratz complete an impromptu test. To get his revenge, he had painstakingly set up a trap field that would be sure to entertain him. The setup took nearly two hours as he took the supplies Anko gave him and set up an obstacle course of Anbu fury. He finished setting up 20 minutes ago and was relaxing in a tree, peeking at a little orange book he would never admit to owning. Suddenly, Shisui felt a shunshine approaching and from the amount of chakra used he guessed it was a whole Janan team. He watched with interest as the topic of much discussion showed up. Less than a half hour after the second phase started. He saw the Hyuga use her Byakugan to identify where the amulet lay and the brief team discussion that followed. What came next both surprised and mortified him. Shisui's jaw hit the tree branch as he watched a horde of blonde shadow clones launch themselves into his trap field. With reckless abandon the horde moved forward and initiated a short, yet intense, symphony of chaos. The clones yelled things like YOLO or bring it on motherfucker. Or praise the log or any other number of suicidal phrases that made Shisui nearly fall of his branch in laughter. He would have done so if he weren't so enraged by all his efforts being undone by mere shadow clones. In less than a minute, the concerto of death ended in nearly 90 puffs of smoke as 10 shadow clones walked back to their creator like a scene out of a movie. Wind blowing their blonde hair, fire and smoke billowing behind them as they moved with a strut in their step and moving in slow motion. Suddenly, a trap they missed ignited as they were in the middle of their antics and the 10 shadow clones dispelled in a shower of flames and rusty nails. After all of that, it was the nail bomb that did them in. After Hinata declared the path clear and Shino ceased his buzzing, Team 8 moved forward to the site of the last fatalities. Naruto gave his clones memory a nod of respect before he bent down and picked up the medallion. He then looked over at where Shisui was posted up and cocked an eyebrow. Shisui appeared in a flame sunshine and directed Team 8 where to go. With the Suna team at the beginning of the 2ND phase, it was Konkuro that came through in the clutch. A puppeteer was all about secrecy and fighting from the shadows, as such Konkuro had gotten training from Chio and Ebisu about operating as a spy or spymaster. Konkuro was able to decipher the messages and Gara's team was the first to leave their testing room. He didn't miss the nasty glance from the Iwa team, since soon as rise, Iwa had been easily agitated and border skirmishes were more common. Gara himself had recently dispatched two teams of Iwa Chunin during one such skirmish. Gara approached training ground 12 just shy of 50 minutes after the start of the second phase. Tamari and Konkuro could easily see a couple of traps and presumed that the training ground was booby-trapped. Gara shrugged before going through a couple hand signs. First, it looked like the earth moved in a wave as his earth style, earth flow wave tore across the training ground. Tamari followed it up with a wide scale, blunt force wind attack wind style dash planar fan. The winds tore across the training ground following Gara's jutsu. 
traps either activated or fell apart as the two Jutsus forced their hand. With Samui, she was struggling to keep her cool temper under control. She could tolerate many things, but the leer of the Uchiha prick was starting to get to her. She remembers the many times he arrogantly approached her and told her that she would make a proper Uchiha wife, as if he owned her. The attempt stopped after she told Naruto, but it seemed the prick would. Need a reminder. She started the test by triplicating the cipher and passing one sheet apiece to her teammates. None of them were intel specialists, so they were slower moving than she would prefer. She saw the pink-haired banshee shout in triumph right as her team finished deciphering the message. Team 7 and Team Yugito dashed out of the room at a breakneck pace, each one wanting to get to the training ground first. Samui knew where it was in general, but she wasn't familiar enough with the place to use a shunshine. An hour after the start of the exam, both teams were on the edge of training ground 33. The teams at each other warily before Kiba pointed out where the medallions were. Amoe, the sensor of the group, informed Samui that there was another group heading in their direction, which spurred her to action. She ordered her team to alternate in use of lightning-style jutsus in order to spring or disarm the traps. Unfortunately, lightning-style wasn't the most effective at wide-scale attacks, so Samui decided to resort of explosive tags. The Kumo team began chucking out explosive tags every 10 meters on the way to their objective. Samui was forced to spit out the foul taste in her mouth when Team 7 beat Team Yugito to the medallions by using the Inuzuka's Fang over Fang and Tunneling Fang. Despite doing nothing, the Uchiha still wore a condescending look, like she was some prize whore to take home. Unfortunately, the proctor was there, and she wasn't able to wipe the sickening look off his face. She walked up and snatched the other medallion before being told where to report. On the northern edge of training ground 44, Orochimaru was waiting in disguise for an update from his spy. He found it odd that there had been no movement around the forest, which was the traditional place for the second phase of the Chunin exams. As he spread out his senses, he could feel Janan teams running around the village, but they were not running toward the forest of death. Furthermore, there were no proctors running around and preparing anything for the Janan teams. After two hours of waiting, which was sickening for the snake Sanin, Kabuto finally showed in front of his master, down on one knee like a good little servant. Orochimaru didn't say anything, he simply used his key to let his servant know that he wasn't pleased. It was hard enough getting into the damned village with all of the new security measures. After sweating for 10 seconds, Kabuto swallowed the lump in his throat and began his report. Lord Orochimaru, my attempt to gain favor with the Uchiha was thwarted, however, I could tell that he is every bit as egotistical and power-hungry as we expected. He will be an easy target for one as great as yourself. That being said, it is clear that they changed plans relatively quickly. The second phase was a cipher test and race to collect medallions. Given the number of medallions, there will likely be a follow-on battle phase, but I do not know where. I humbly beg your mercy, I was unaware of these changes. Kabuto bowed his head low, hoping his master was in a merciful mood. Orochimaru glared down at Kabuto, this was an alarming change of plans, and his follow-on plans will need to be altered. Enough, Kabuto. You know too much groveling makes me sick. We will adjust our plans, if the Uchiha makes it to the final round then he will get private training. Regardless, we will snag him up in the invasion. After you cast the Genjutsu, that will be your primary mission. We will merely need to break him before we build him back up and he is ready to be my vessel. As you will, Lord Orochimaru, Naruto sighed, it was already a long day, and this exam was far outside of his range of expectations. Sure, he gave the old monkey a warning but this was alarmingly different than what he expected. He sat with Team 8 in the arena, the place that was supposed to host the final stage of the Chunin exams, not the preliminary rounds. Even Kurama was surprised by the differences, but he attributed it to Naruto's meddling. Around 5 p.m., the final team was approaching, and Naruto smiled when he saw Team 10 walking calmly into the waiting area. Naruto noticed that Kuji looked a little worse for wear, but they were in one piece, nonetheless. Ino ran forward and embraced Naruto in a big hug, which was joined by Tamari from behind. She let Ino have Naruto in the classroom, so it was her right to have him now. So, Shika, why does Kuji look like he is the only one that went into battle? Naruto asked while peering through two sheets of blonde hair. It was too troublesome. I bribed him with two buffets at the barbecue to get him to roll through all the traps. His human bullet tank enhanced with earth chakra makes him the perfect mind sweeper. Shikamaru shrugged and yawned after delivering his answer. Kuji polished off two sticks of beef jerky simultaneously before chastising Shikamaru. Yeah, my lazy friend here said it would be too slow and troublesome to disarm all of the traps. That, and we had another team close on our tails, so I didn't have much of a choice. That was pretty ballsy of you, 
Tank. Came a female voice from behind Naruto. Kuji did his best Naruto impression before his cheeks blushed a bit. Ah, thanks, Kairo. It is nice to know you care. Kairo blushed before Samui spoke up, so, it is pretty clear we will be fighting. Best guesses as to how it will be decided? Shikamaru yawned before offering his two cents. Well, my coin is number seven. The others shared their coin numbers. Well, troublesome, it seems we will be fighting as teams. Before the inter village group of Janan could break that down further, the Hokage appeared along with the Jonin Senseis. The Janan formed up and waited for the Hokage's address. Hiruzen was pleased to see so many Konoha teams and he was pleased further by the fact that Orochimaru was nowhere to be seen. Perhaps the neighborhood watch misled him or perhaps his countermeasures were enough to thwart his students' plans. He cleared his throat before applying chakra to his vocal cords and projecting his voice. Welcome to the end of the second round. We will be conducting team fights in order to determine who will make it to the finals and represent their village in this very stadium in front of the most influential people throughout the lands. Tonight, those teams present will fight one battle against another team, which will leave us with 12 finalists. The Hokage went on to explain the true meaning of the exams and he explained the order of the fights. Hayate Gekko, the coughing proctor, stepped forward and explained the rules of the fights. There would be multiple proctors, if a proctor calls a participant out then that participant will be removed from the fight. Killing was allowed, but heavily discouraged. The first fight was to be between Team 8 and a team from Iwa. Naruto pulled his teammates aside, all right guys, we are fighting as a team. This is where we thrive. I want seals off, beat them with raw speed and keep as many of your techniques under wraps as you can. No need to show our future competition what we can do. Hinata, if you want to use your bow, I am okay with that. Shino pushed up his glasses before replying calmly. Naruto, I believe that I will need to use my bugs. That team has a member of the Kamazura clan, which is known for their use of bees as combat insects. Um, well then I think I should use my bow and neutralize that target first. Hinata offered. Okay, no need to fall into grudge matches. I think I will be their main focus for a variety of reason. I will distract and create an opening, you two capitalize and finish it. Naruto offered and got two confirmations in return. Team 8 walked calmly onto the field in between the three tuning proctors. Their opponents, Dub Steel Boy, B Boy and Chump One, scowled at them from across the field. Hayate stepped forward after coughing for a couple seconds. The match between Team 8 and Team Iwa begins, now. He knifed his hand down and jumped back. You have no idea how long I have been waiting for the day, Blonde Demon. Steel Boy began before being cut off by Naruto. Look. Monologuing is all well and good but you are just a side character. Save it, we get it, you hate my dad because he probably killed you mom, dad, grandma, grandpa or some other family figure in the war. I get it, it sucks, I am sorry for what it is worth. What about Uzushio? Did you ever stop and think that my dad may have been a little mad when you wiped out my mom's clan and homeland when they weren't even actively participating in the war? No? Well then shut up. Naruto's aura was flaring during his whole retort, demanding submission and silence from the Iwa team. Rather than let the arguments drag on, Chump 1 and B-Boy jumped forward and placed their hands on the ground before calling out Earth Style, Earth Dome. Earth began to rise up and attempted to entrap Team 8, but the Earth Dome was thwarted by Naruto, who whisper Earth Style, Grand Earth and Spikes. He stomped on the ground and eight Earth Spikes that were nearly 15 feet in diameter rose from the ground and shattered the dome that was close to enveloping Team 8. The Iwa team looked stunned that they were so easily outdone in Earth-style ninjutsu, but they were given no reprieve as three Narutos ran forward and engaged them. Naruto targeted the leader, who used the time to encase himself in stone and who appeared to have shiny skin underneath the stone as well. Naruto knew that Earth armor was tough to penetrate, but he relished the challenge. He and his clones closed the distance in under two seconds, but the initial assault was halted, at least partially. Naruto clone one charged after the Kamazura, wanting to distract the male Janan long enough for Hinata to take action. The clone coated its fist in wind chakra and began lashing out at the bees escaping from the B-boy sleeves. The clone was able to disintegrate a fair number of bees before a couple stingers caused it to go up in a puff of chakra smoke. Through the smoke came a volley of arrows, targeting each shoulder and the chest. B-boy was able to dodge the arrow going for his left shoulder before he was impacted by a blunted arrow to the chest. The impact of the arrow caused him to fall backwards before he realized that he was unable to move. From the impact area on his chest, kanji began spreading before glowing blue and dulling into dark black lines. The paralysis arrow did its trick as it completely neutralized the Kamazura, but that didn't stop his hive from acting on his behalf. 
As the bees erupted from his body, a massive water wave rose over the top of his down form and sent B-Boy and his bees crashing into the wall of the stadium, courtesy of Hinata. Naruto Clone 2 closed the distance between Chump 1 and engaged him in Taijutsu. It was enough of a distraction for Shino to surround the boy with his Kikaiku. The clone watched in amusement as the chump collapsed to the ground, completely drained of his chakra, after a mere minute of Taijutsu. Shino muttered something about disappointments before he turned to assist Naruto in finishing the fight. Naruto charged right at the steel and earth encased Iwa Janan. His speeds far exceeded Janan's standards and this idiot made it easier for him by slowing down his movements in exchange for durability. Naruto was more than happy to put that durability to the test as his own earth encased fists dissected the slow movements of his opponent. Blow after blow landed on the steel body and chipped off the outer casing of earth. Eventually, Naruto jumped back and shook out his fists. Damn, well at least I know you can take a hit. I am not as good as my mama, but each of those punches were enough to liquefy the organs of a standard Janan. Naruto took great pleasure in the shudder of fear he felt emanating from the contestant's box. Steel Boy was panting hard, having used up a great deal of chakra to reinforce his body and survive that onslaught. It is useless, you have nothing that can break through my armor. Naruto held up a hand to let his teammates know that he had this, which made them take a relaxed position behind him. Nothing, huh? Well, I was just trying to decide how to end it. In case you weren't paying attention, both of your teammates were taken out in less than a minute. I just found it amusing that you volunteered yourself to be a punching bag. Steel Boy growled and he heard shouts to forfeit from his friends up in the box, but he couldn't do that. This was his one chance at revenge. Bring it on, Namikaze. I will avenge my father. Naruto shook his head sadly, I have told you, I am a senju, my father was a senju. Naruto's frown turned into a wicked grin as an idea came to him. I tell you what, since you are so fixated on dear old dad, I will use one of his techniques to defeat you. Naruto heard more than a few sharp inhales as his voice reached the contestant's box. Steel Boy was nervous, but he had used the time to reinforce his steel armor and he was ready to fight again. However, when he saw the blue sphere and heard the wind whipping around it, his face fell. Before he could forfeit, Naruto closed the distance and slammed the spiraling sphere into his gut. Rather than release it, Naruto pumped his legs and drove Steel Boy back into the wall of the stadium before letting the Rasengan destabilize and explode after it had grinded away the steel armor. Naruto walked away from the new crater in the stadium wall before the dust cloud even settled. He walked up to his teammates and gave them each a high five before they walked toward the contestants' box to rejoin their friends. The Iwa team was being carted off the field by a team of medics led by Tsunade, who winked at Naruto and blew him a kiss. Naruto swelled with pride and warmth as he saw that his mama was proud of him before he returned his attention to the contestants' box. Kurotsuchi was scowling deeply, Steel Boy was a very strong Janan and the Senju just dismantled him and his team in less than two minutes. Now, he was looking at her as if challenging her and to make matters worse she knew she would lose. Her mission was to analyze the Senju boy and kill him if possible. The second phase being formatted the way it had prevented her from targeting him, but now she was grateful for that fact. Watching her fellow Iwa ninja be grinded to dust by that same infamous technique sent a blood-curdling shiver down her spine. She needed to report back to her grandfather and consult Han because it was clear that they would be need to neutralize this threat to Iwa. Naruto and Team 8 made it back into the booth and were clapped on the back by an overly excited Lee, and many other members of his study group. Even Samui and Amoe joined the friendly display of camaraderie, which set Kurotsuchi on edge even more. It was clear that this alliance would be too powerful for Iwa to accept, and it all hitched on Naruto Senju. As Naruto gave his two women kisses, and Samui sighed in sorrow at the missed opportunity. She remembered Naruto's warmth and affections less than a year ago and she wanted them back. During one night, she had caught him meditating alone in the garden and attempted to start things back up where they left off. With a sad look on his face, he had taken her head in his hands and placed a kiss on her forehead before giving her the softest letdown ever. He stayed with her as the tears fell freely, dried them and told her that his only wish was to be her friend. She knew about Tamari and Ino from the get-go and Naruto had never obfuscated his feelings for the two. Her only question was why she couldn't be one of his girlfriends, since he would be able to claim CRA or any other means of having multiple wives. His answer simultaneously warmed her heart and crushed it at the same time. Sammy, I hold love for you in my heart, I won't deny that. I somehow have the love of two amazing women that know everything about me and that is already more than I deserve. For me to ask for a third would be nothing more than selfishness and my greedy heart would never be able to stop at three. You are an absolutely amazing woman and there is a man out there that will actually deserve your love. As for me, I just hope that I can be your friend, 
he whispered softly into her ear while holding her in an embrace. Samui pushed the memories aside as her team was called into the arena. Kairu put a comforting hand on her shoulder, knowing exactly what had her usually cool teammate so hot and bothered. Team Yugito walked down into the arena while analyzing Team 7. The Uchiha, strutting like some overfluffed peacock and the pink-haired girl, yes girl, she didn't deserve the title of Kunoichi. To make matters worse, some dog boy was leering at her, and his eyes were never far from her admittedly sizable chest. Break them, Samui whispered to her two teammates. Kairu nodded excitedly, having heard many times about the vain Uchiha from Samui. How you want to do it? Amoi was thinking things through, using his knowledge from the academy to formulate a plan. Samui, distract the Uchiha and I will blind them with Flash Pillar. Kairo, keep the Inuzuka distracted. He is a very proud boy and likes to consider himself an alpha. Play on that and he will abandon his teammates. Kairo got a dastardly grin on her face. Oh, I can have some fun with that. What about Pinky? Samui shrugged, don't worry about the civvy. She might try a low-level genjutsu, but her raw stats and taijutsu are abysmal. Take out the guys and it will be cool. Team 7 and Team Yugito squared off in the arena and the Konoha teams were speculating about their chances. The conversation was fairly one-sided, which surprised Kurotsuchi and the remaining Iwa Janan. It might be unyouthful of me to say this, but Amoi and Samui are holders of the fiery flames of youth. Team 7 has unyouthfully refused to partake in our group sessions and I believe our comrades' flames will not burn hot enough. Lee started the conversation. Ino scoffed, Oh please, Lee. I was able to defeat Sasuke in less than a year of training with Ruto. Samui and Amoi trained with him for the whole time during the exchange program and they have probably shared the knowledge with Kairo and Kumo. I believe that Team 7 is fated to lose. I thought Guy Sensei's training sessions were crazy, but Naruto's training made more than just my muscles ache. My Tenketsu have doubled in size in less than 6 months and my reserves have tripled. Not to mention I am the first generation of Hyuga to actually learn and incorporate ninjutsu, Neji said matter-of-factly. Kurotsuchi listened on in a state of stunned disbelief. Are you telling me that Naruto Senju, that 13-year-old boy, trained all of you? She pointed incredulously at Naruto. Kankuro chuckled merrily and drew the contestant's attention. Ha ha ha, Naruto is a master at optimizing a training program. With his knowledge of human anatomy and the chakra system, not to mention mastery of Fuinjutsu. Kankuro was interrupted by a bonk on the head from Naruto. Bro, don't tell our friends from Iwa all my secrets. I am flattered that you hold me in such high regard, but please don't overshare. Naruto calmly rebuked his excitable brother. Sorry, bro. My bad, Kankuro said sheepishly. As Kurotsuchi struggled to take all of the extra information in, her threat assessment of the Senju continued to escalate. The plans would need to change to address this. Her attention was drawn by the fight and her analytical eyes focused on the competition in the stadium. Immediately, Samui blurred forward at high speed and engaged the Uchiha, who had his Sharingan activated. She was amused to see Karu distract the Inuzuka before planting a knee in his gut. Sasuke was immediately pressed and on the back foot. How does a Kunoichi possess more speed than him, an Uchiha? His eyes were tracking her movements, but his body was lagging behind the information provided by his eyes. He was so focused on the busty blonde and her lightning-covered katana that he missed the white-haired boy flipping through hand signs. After parrying a slash from Samui's katana and wincing at the lightning chakra numbing his hand, Sasuke looked to his right in time to be blinded by a brilliant flash of chakra light as he heard the boy call out lightning style, flash pillar. Sakura was relieved that she wasn't immediately attacked, and she tried to provide her dear Sasuke some relief from the blonde Kumo Kunoichi's onslaught by throwing some kunai and shuriken. She then saw the boy jump in to double-team Sasuke and her body lunged forward to intercept. Before she had closed the distance, her eyes erupted in pain as the boy's body glowed with a brilliant blue light that exploded into a blinding flash. Sakura stumbled due to the surprising pain from her eyes before her world went black. Amoi saw the plan unfolding as expected. Samui was more than enough to keep the Uchiha tied up and the pink-haired girl fell right into his hands. After unleashing the jutsu, he dashed behind her as she stumbled and slammed the hilt of his katana into the back of her head. She crumpled lifelessly at his feet, which made him feel a slight bit remorseful, but she was never one of the people he liked during his time in Konoha. Kairo trusted her two teammates and she was more than excited to deal with the mutt. As she charged toward him, she heard him say something that enraged her. She scowled deeply at the sexist comment and channeled chakra to her feet and legs before planting a knee into his gut. She was forced to dodge a slash from the puppy, who was surprisingly fast for a creature of its size. She rolled out of the way and thought about how she could neutralize the puppy without hurting it too badly. 
Kiba deeply regretted saying, oh man, why did I get the flat-chested one? He saw the spark of feminine fury and he was surprised by her burst of speed. He rolled into a crouched position with one knee on the ground as one hand instinctively clutched his throbbing stomach. He used his lowered position to activate Inuzuka Kinjutsu, beast mimicry before his features grew more feral and he called out Inuzuka Kinjutsu, all fours jutsu. Kiba looked like a feral beast as an aura encased him and he surged forward in a burst of speed. Samui took advantage of the Uchiha's blindness by dashing forward while weaving through hand signs. She placed her palm on the Uchiha's chest and whispered, lightning style dash lightning rod jutsu. She pushed the Uchiha and jumped backwards before a pillar of blue lightning chakra erupted around Sasuke and the boy screamed out in pain before collapsing to the ground unconscious. Samui saw the proctor jump to the boy's side and remove him from the battlefield as she turned her attention to Kairou and Kiba's fight. Kairou was parrying the claws of the feral boy with her sword as his surprising burst of speed and aggression had her on the back foot. She was grateful that Amoe had engaged and immobilized the puppy, which was one thing less for her to worry about. That was until the dog boy decided to take that personally and threw a chakra pill into his mouth. Amoe swatted the chakra pill the boy tossed to his canine companion out of the air and decided to call over a proctor to remove the dog from the arena. Kibo was incensed, his team was dismantled in a couple minutes and Amoe was holding a kunai to Akamaru's throat. His Inuzuka instincts flared up and he lost control of his emotions as he saw his partner's life being threatened. He downed an Inuzuka chakra pill and launched into successive fang over fang attacks as he attempted to tear his enemies apart. His spinning ended and his world went blue before everything faded to black. The Hokage sighed in dismay as one of his teams was completely manhandled. To make matters worse, it was the Uchiha's team and Fugaku was watching it all happen. Hiruzen saw the scowl of disappointment on the Uchiha clan head's face as his son was targeted and removed from the fight. Hiruzen was disappointed by the paltry teamwork displayed by Team 7 but he willingly admitted that Team Yugito put on a fine display of teamwork. The culmination was luring Kiba into a lightning-style, electrocution trap. Yugito was pleased with her team's efforts as she held out her hand to the silver-haired Kakashi Hatake. She had suckered him into a bet, and she was going to collect. She saw Kakashi crying as he handed over his copy of Icha Icha, Makeout Tactics. His tears doubled when Yugito burned her prize right in front of his eyes. She saw the womanly nod of approval from Kurenai which she returned with a wink. In the contestant's box, literally nobody was surprised. Team 10 and Kurotsuchi's team stood up and walked into the arena for their turn at combat. Kurotsuchi didn't miss the kiss the blonde girl gave Naruto on her way out. If she couldn't punish the Senju himself then her grandfather would approve if she were able kill or cripple one of his girlfriends. She shared her plan with her teammates as they walked down the long tunnel. Shikamaru was usually lazy and laid back, but he saw the look on the Iwajinan's faces, especially when Ino kissed Naruto. He was worried about his teammates, but he was more worried about what Naruto would do if something were to happen to Ino. Shikamaru was confident that he would sooner march into Iwa alone and lay waste to it before he let one of his girlfriends get hurt. Ino, you are to avoid the Kurotsuchi girl. I don't like the way she is looking at you. Huji, tank to the front, let me use your shadow to capture one then flatten them. Don't hold back, something tells me Kurotsuchi is no Janan. Release all seals and fight to kill, Shikamaru whispered under his breath while the team was in the tunnel. Are you serious, Shika? Huji asked, clearly not okay with going for the kill. You think they will target me? Ino added, ignoring Kuji's objections to killing. I have zero doubts, Ino. The way they have been looking at Naruto, you and Tamari tells me all I need to know. That Tsuchikage probably sent them as an ace to kill Naruto in a legal way. I think they understand that they can't do that and will take it out on you. Shikamaru whispered back. Team 10 walked onto the field, clearly nervous, and took their positions across from the Iwa team. None of them missed the smirk on Kurotsuchi's face, but they were determined to fight and represent their village. Naruto felt the tension and he sensed the foul intentions of the Iwa team. He was stood up and was already denting the railing with his firm grip. He watched the field with jaw clenched as the battle began. Huji rolled toward the Iwa Janan, targeting the bug user first, according to Shikamaru's plan. As Kuji expanded into his body expansion, human boulder jutsu, he sensed Kurotsuchi dashing past him along with the other male. Kurotsuchi was surprised when she was caught in Shikamaru's shadow possession, but that was why she charged with Mitsuchi. Mitsuchi saw the shadow spreading and saw a shadow bubble expand and collapse around Kurotsuchi. He immediately shifted targets to Shikamaru, but the blonde girl got in his way with dual kodachis. Ino saw Shikamaru was tied up and she knew she needed to buy time for Kuji to remove the biggest threat on the field. Her Kodachis clashed against earth-encased fists and a brutal close-range battle ensued. 
It was all Ino could do to hold Mitsuchi off and buy time for her team to finish their two opponents. She focused her chakra into the two blades, and they glowed with red fire chakra and emitted sparks as the blades clashed against earth fists that were hard as diamonds. Mitsuchi was surprised that the blonde girl could keep up with him, but he was in control of the pacing and spacing of their little duel. He forced her to roll away from one of his kicks and took the opportunity to dash toward Shikamaru, who was still holding the Iwa Kunoichi and was unable to inflict serious damage. Mitsuchi lowered his shoulder and focused his chakra on that part of his body. He slammed into the shadow user and took great enjoyment in hearing his scapula crunching from the force of his shoulder slam. Shikamaru was sweating as he felt the clear difference in power between himself and Kurotsuchi. Her chakra was far denser, more developed and more potent than his own, which made him struggle to keep hold of her and she flared her chakra to break his shadow possession. He had tried to master shadow stitching or shadow strangulation, but they were both advanced techniques and required flawless concentration. However, the current state of the battle inhibited him from advancing his shadows as he watched Kuji abruptly end his jutsu for some reason. Kurotsuchi smirked devilishly as she was finally freed of the annoying shadow possession. She nodded to Mitsuchi, who smirked at her in return. Before the blondie could forfeit, she dashed toward her and engaged her in taijutsu. Kurotsuchi encased her fists in lava and punished the blondie with scorching burns each time she was forced to block. After a minute of toying with her, she was able to connect a knee to Ino's gut and make her double over. Kurotsuchi took great pleasure in gripping the Yamanaka by the base of her blonde hair as she dragged her face up to meet her gaze. She saw the sky blue eyes refuse to submit to her, which only ignited Kurotsuchi's sadist side. Before the proctors could interrupt, she gathered lava chakra in her mouth and was prepared to scar that pretty little face. Naruto had been watching the battle with trepidation and not even Tamari's soothing embrace could comfort him. As Team 10 fell one by one, Naruto's worries grew and his grip on the railing tightened. He didn't even notice that he had sheared through the steel railing and his fist were balling the trapped steel. When Naruto saw Kurotsuchi pull Ino's hair and gather chakra in her mouth, he lost it. Naruto appeared in a red flash onto the field at Ino's side before a world-shattering kick sent Kurotsuchi flying back into the wall of the stadium. Mitsuchi attempted to retaliate before the proctors could intervene, but he was sent flying into the air by a knee from the blonde boy holding the Yamanaka girl. Naruto took a deep breath as he sensed the bees heading in his direction and he thought, wind style, divine breakthrough. The divine breakthrough was the great breakthrough with Kurama's chakra and sage chakra infused into it. The enormous blunt force wind slammed into the insects and turned them to molecules of chitin before the wide-scale wind jutsu slammed into the bee girl with the force of a semi-truck. The girl was sent flying over the wall of the arena and into the bleachers of the stadium where she crashed in a shattering of bones that echoed around the stadium. All hell broke loose after the red flash appeared in the stadium. Hiruzen, Itachi and Guy immediately jumped into the stadium and jumped in front of Han before he could surprise Naruto with an attack. A dense and eerie silence filled the stadium in the brief moments following Naruto's intervention. Naruto was holding Ino in a bridal carry and glaring defiantly around the stadium before his hardened azure eyes locked on Han's. Hokage, Han spat out, this was uncalled for. The battle was ongoing, and he had no right to intervene. His tone was deep and demonic as he was pulling chakra from Kokuo. I demand the chance to avenge my team. Hayate stepped forward, actually, your Jinan ignored me when I called the match. The Yamanaka was in no shape to continue fighting and I called the match. Your Kunoichi ignored my call and she was preparing a jutsu against a defenseless competitor. Han scoffed, so, that gives that demon spawn the right to launch a surprise attack on my Jinan? That gives him the right to hospitalize my Jinan? Hiruzen stepped in between the two, no, Naruto will be reprimanded, and any further interference will disqualify him from the finals. Now, I recommend that you see to your Jinan. Hiruzen's voice was firm because he did not appreciate what Kurotsuchi was about to do. The Tsuchikage will hear about this. Han growled. And you, Blondie, pray you never cross me in battle. Naruto simply smiled at Han. Oh, I think it would be fun. Tell Kokuo hello for me, although I doubt you even know her name. Kit, don't go sharing the name of my kin to simply taunt an enemy, Kurama roared in Naruto's head. Naruto watched Han disappear in a steam sunshine before he apologized to Kurama. It's fine, Kit. Blondie is like a mate to me as well. Be careful though, you are pulling on my chakra subconsciously and I cannot resist due to the influence of the Makutan. You will need to be careful and accelerate your training if you wish for this body to be able to control my power. Iwa is up to something and their Jinchuriki being here is not a good sign. Kurama replied through the link. Yeah, I felt it too. You think they will join the invasion this time around? Naruto's internal voice was very concerned. 
I don't know, kid. It is anyone's guess since you made sure Suna would never betray Konoha. I would assume the snake reached out to others this time around. Kurama seemed pensive. We will think about this later. Maybe I can find a use for the perverted toad. Naruto closed the link and returned to getting chastised by the Hokage. Naruto, no more of that. You could have caused an international incident. I should disqualify you for that alone, Hiruzen continued his weary rant. Naruto shrugged, honestly not caring. Do what you need to do, Lord Hokage. Although you will lose a lot of business if neither the Senju nor the Uchiha heir are in the finals. Plus, they were the ones that sent their Jinchuriki to a foreign village. Hiruzen used on hand to rub his weary eyes and the other to rub circles on his temples. Return to the contestant's box, Naruto Senju. We will discuss a fitting punishment at a later date. Naruto carried Ino to the contestant's box and watched as Shikamaru and Kuji were carried to the medical bay. He sat down with Ino on his lap as his friends offered their support for what he did. Nobody missed the cruel intentions of Kurotsuchi, especially after Neji explained that she was gathering chakra for a lava jutsu when Ino was clearly beaten. Dang, Naruto, you just went down there and one shot each of them in under five seconds, Konkuro said in an attempt to lighten the mood. Naruto sighed, yeah, I may have gone overboard, but I was subconsciously channeling Q's chakra, which made everything come out a little stronger than I wanted it to. Amoe slugged him in the shoulder, a little? He asked sarcastically. Ino stirred in his arms, and he kissed her on the forehead and told her to go back to sleep. The sand sib slapped him on the shoulder before walking down onto the field with Team 10. This fight would be a fierce competition between friends. Gara made a deal with Lee not to use Shukaku's chakra so long as Lee doesn't open the gates, which Neji forced Lee to agree to. He was not looking to fight a flipping bijou for a mere promotion to Chunin. As the Janan were making their way to the field, Rasa was chuckling at Hiruzen's distress. Relax, old friend. Naruto just demonstrated what it would mean to cross Konoha, and he made a powerful statement at that. Imagine if the old midget knew that wasn't even a fraction of his power. Gah, Rasa, don't make me think about Iwa or my troublesome Senju air. Hiruzen was rubbing out his temples and puffing on his pipe like on old-fashioned wood-powered train. Rasa wore an uncharacteristic smile that threatened to break over the edges of his face. Oh, Hiruzen, just relax. If that were my daughter in the Yamanaka girl's place, he would have prevented an all-out war. Those Janan will have Tsunade heal them up just fine. The Hokaye's grumblings could be heard all the way down on the field as the proctor started the match. Hayate jumped out of the way, knowing that many of the San Janan specialize in long-range and wide-scale jutsu. The two teams just took battle-ready stances, but Gara decided to speak with a maniacal grin on his face. Seals off, everybody. Gara's normal monotone crackled with excitement. Neji nodded, very well, we agree. Moments later, blue chakra light could be seen shining on the shins, wrists and chests of each of the six Janan. They had all partaken in Naruto's cross-fit training as well as the follow-on exercises. The San siblings had the advantage of training with the energetic blonde for many years more than Team 9, however, Team 9 had Guy Sensei, who was no slouch when it came to physical training. As Lee bounced on the balls of his feet in excitement, sudden puffs of smoke appeared around Konkuro before four identical puppets flared to life. Neji responded by unsealing his bow, Tenten began pulling kunai and shuriken out of her wrist seals and Tamari opened her fan up. Lee, who couldn't wait any longer, blurred forward and called out dynamic entry as a spinning kick crashed into a sand barrier in front of Gara. Lee flipped back with a battle-crazed grin on his face. As he landed, he made an over-exaggerated tee with his hands and called time out. He removed his jacket and handed it to Tenten, who sealed it in a storage scroll. Lee then loudly counted down from three to re-engage the fight before he blurred out of existence again. As Lee dashed forward, Neji sent arrows out at Tamari, trying to take her down in long-range combat. He was forced to roll to the side as a puppet with shield and sword made an easily trackable swing at his torso. Neji's Byakugan activated as he came out of his roll, and he blocked a downward slash from a puppet with one of the blades on the front of his bow. 10. Ten paused her onslaught on Tamari to move to defend Neji. She unsealed a warhammer and attempted a wide, horizontal swing at the assaulting puppet. Konkuro yanked his puppet backward and he yelped in surprise as Gara's sand played defense and stopped a powerful spin kick from Lee, who was blurring all over the field and keeping the long-range attackers from Suna on the defensive. Gara played his role as the ultimate defense for his team, needed his full attention to block Lee's attempts to pulverize his siblings. Getting frustrated with the high-speed attacks, Gara weaved through hand signs and called out Earth-style, sand pillars. Ten sand pillars emerged around his teammates, providing them cover and making it harder for Lee to move freely. 
Ten-Ten saw the sand pillars and knew exactly what Gara was attempting to do. She pulled out five clusters of explosive tags and attached them to her kunai with chakra. She flung them out simultaneously and saw that Gara's free sand moved to form a shield between the tags and his team. Ten-Ten cursed and decided to use the visual obstruction to relocate and decided to take out one of her trump cards. She dashed to the right and called out Rhino, which was Lee's cue to get out of the way. As she pulled two long scrolls and threw them into the air, Lee slammed a heel onto the ground and created a miniature dust screen. Tamari saw Ten-Ten throw two ceiling scrolls into the air, she knew that the threat was coming from the left and she saw Gara was occupied at their front. She opened her fan all the way and spun twice before turning her fan perpendicular to the ground and calling out wind-style dash sickle weasel storm. Five twisters fired out of her fan at surprising speeds before turning into the air and creating five vertical twisters that caught the airborne Ten-Ten and her scrolls in the wide area of effect jutsu. Lee cried out in distress as he saw his fellow teammate getting shredded by the slicing winds of Tamari's twisters. With no regard for his own physical condition, Lee crouched and darted at Ten-Ten's position, using his massive speed and strength to power through the winds of Tamari's jutsu. He pushed through and jumped into the air, snatching a bleeding Ten-Ten out of mid-air and cradling her in his arms. Neji saw his teammates were in a bad spot and knew that he needed to provide some relief for them. He saw the blood trickling out of multiple cuts on Lee's chest, arms and legs and he could also tell that Ten-Ten was out of the fight. Neji darted forward, leaving his bow on the ground and made his move at Konkuro, who was briefly distracted by Tamari's jutsu and its devastating effects. Neji closed the distance and was able to shatter two of Konkuro's puppets with chakra-charged fists. The sound of splintering would snapped Konkuro back to his purpose in the fight. He saw Gara was recovering from the concussion of the blast from Ten-Ten's explosive tags. Konkuro jumped backwards in an attempt to create some space from Neji, but when he pulled on his chakra strings, he found they were no longer linked to his puppets. That's when he heard Neji call out, You are within range of my divination, 8 trigrams, 64 palms. Konkuro's body was rapidly assaulted by 64 individual strikes that shut down his tenketsu and each strike felt like an internal stab of a kunai. Gara's head was ringing from the concussive force that his sand was too thin to stop, but as his vision cleared, he saw that his brother was in trouble. He directed his sand toward Neji and called out Sand Waterfall as a tidal wave of sand surged toward Neji who was in the middle of his Hyuga clan attack. He saw Neji's attack end before he started spinning and a blue dome of chakra erupted from Neji's position and sent Konkuro's body flying toward the arena wall. Gara used his right arm to direct a cloud of sand to cushion Konkuro's blow as he swirled his left hand and caused his sand to constantly press against Neji's chakra dome. Neji was struggling to sustain his eight trigrams, palms revolving heaven as the sand onslaught never seemed to end. Around his dome was another dome of sand that prevented Gara's sand from scattering. The second dome kept closing in and making Neji feel claustrophobic as he panted and pushed more chakra out to sustain the jutsu. His hands were starting to go numb due to chakra burns as he sustained the chakra dome for at least 30 seconds, which was the longest he had ever tried to do. Lee handed Ten-Ten off to the medics as he tried to firm his resolve and body to push through the pain of the many cuts that were trickling blood from all over his body. He saw Neji surrounded by sand, Tamari ready to halt his advance and Konkuro being taken by a team of medics from a sand pillow. Lee darted forward and was forced to dash to the side as a blunt force wind diverted his path. Every time Lee tried to dash in and close the distance, winds halted his advance and forced him to reroute. Up in the contestants' box, multiple girls were drooling as they looked at Lee's current state. His hair was constantly swaying due to his sporadic dashes, his shirt was disintegrated and showed off his toned upper body and the fierce look on his face was enough to impress more than one of the kunoichi present. To everybody's surprise, it was Samui that broke the stunned silence that accompanied the observation of the fight. So cool, Samui gasped out as she saw the demonstration of raw speed and power from Lee. Naruto chuckled, Lee is the only one our age that can keep up with me in raw strength. He will overtake me soon in the chakra null zones, Hinata giggled, despite her worry for Gara. yes, Lee is something else. Especially since Naruto's consecutive makeover bets have fixed his style and wardrobe. I am concerned for Neji, the chitin is very difficult to sustain for such a long time. Shino nodded, Gara's sand and his control over it makes him a fearsome opponent, Hinata gasped as the blue light stopped shining through the sand. She saw Gara closing his hand into position and the group heard him call out sand coffin. Naruto knew Gara wouldn't go for the kill, so he wasn't concerned. He was more concerned about Lee getting desperate. And opening the gates at this point. He took a moment to look over at Samui and was pleased to see the stunned look on her face as she watched Lee's attempt to overcome the odds. 
Lee finally managed to misdirect Tamari before he applied his fastest burst of speed and closed the distance between him and Tamari. He sent a straight punch at Tamari's exposed chest, but she was able to bring her fan up in time to block the fearsome attack. The blow was able to dent the reinforced and seal buff steel of Tamari's war fan and sent her tumbling back due to the momentum of the blow. Gara got the proctor to announce that Neji was disqualified when he heard a loud, metal clang and turned his head to see Tamari tumbling backward from a punch by Lee. He erected a sand wall in front of Tamari and stopped Lee from pursuing his down sister. He dashed forward, continually making movements with his hands and controlling the sand to obstruct Lee. Gara's next move surprised everyone in the stadium when he engaged Lee in a taijutsu battle. Lee was frustrated that he couldn't finish off an opponent, but he forced himself to focus on the taijutsu onslaught coming from Gara. He had his sand armor as well as gauntlets made of hardened sand that grinded down Lee's skin with each blow. Lee kicked Gara in the chest as he flipped backward to create some space. Lee blurred forward and disappeared from view for most onlookers before he appeared underneath Gara's guard and kicked Gara into the air with a fearsome kick. Lee jumped off the ground, placed another powerful, upward kick on Gara's torso and used that momentum to speed back down to the ground. He landed in a crouch before jumping up above Gara and poking him in the back to immobilize his opponent. Lee let his bandages wrap around Gara and he began spinning down toward the ground in a tornado-like fashion as he called out Primary Lotus. Tamari had recovered from the blow and was able to see he brother in a precarious position in mid-air. She took her dented fan and forced it open to create a powerful updraft that significantly slowed the descent of the pair. She watched as Lee spun one final time in a burst of momentum and sent Gara soaring into the ground, despite her jutsu. She watched in horror as Gara's body impacted the ground in a crater that spanned nearly 20 feet. She saw the Konoha boy tumble across the ground and she prepared to finish the fight. With the Jonin Senseis, a debate was ongoing between Guy and Kakashi. Guy, how did he use the primary lotus without activating the gates? Kakashi asked. And why did you teach him such a destructive taijutsu move in the first place? Guy smirked and nodded proudly and actually looked kind of handsome in his standard Konoha Jonin attire and his military-style haircut. Yes, the primary lotus only requires a certain amount of speed and strength. Thanks to our training and the use of Naruto seals, we have trained our bodies to the point where the gates are no longer necessary. Every ninja needs a finishing move Kakashi, and Lee refuses to use his bladed tonfa against allies and friends. Asuma chuckled as his cigarette smoked lightly, that kid is something else. It has been amazing to watch his improvements through Naruto's session. He will be something else once Tsunade and Naruto finish that little project of theirs. What project is planned for Lee? Kurnai asked, her interest peaked as she hadn't heard about this yet. Lady Tsunade and Naruto are creating a seal matrix that can overlap Lee's damaged chakra circulatory system that will at least allow him to use reinforcement type jutsus. It is nearly finished, but I told Naruto to focus on the exams for the time being. Itachi informed the group. Yosh. Naruto's flames burn so brightly that he has further ignited my youthful student. I am grateful to Kami that Lee was blessed with friends whose flames of youth burn so brightly, Guy said as he shot a fist into the air. A soft and melodic ewer welcome could barely be heard over the roar of the battle. I'm sorry Guy, did you say something? Kakashi used his one-liner to tone down his excessive friend. A storm cloud appeared over Guy before he raised his head and glared at Kakashi. You know, Kakashi, your hip attitude isn't needed. You used to be such a youthful eternal rival, but I have found many more rivals in Naruto's study group. I will no longer tolerate your attempts to dampen my flames of youth, Asuma chuckled, well said, Guy. You might want to watch though, your final student appears to be captured. Lee rolled across the field due to the backlash of his primary lotus technique. He was confident that he had removed Gara from the fight, so he only needed to suck it up and finish off Tamari before his body gave out on him. He was in so much pain and panting so hard that he didn't notice sand wrapping around his ankles and two handcuffs made of sand locked themselves around Lee's wrist and pulled him backward roughly. Lee felt his back slam into something hard and grainy before he was lifted up and lost the ability to move as he heard Gara say, Sand Crucifixion. Samui whimpered in either dismay or ecstasy as she watched Lee's tone form get hoisted onto a cross. Samui's eyes soaked in the glory as ever fiber of muscle resisted the imprisonment on the crucifix. Every flex of the biceps, every jiggle of the pectorals, the super-toned obliques writhing in an attempt to break their hold, the eight-pack abs flexing gloriously despite the futility of the struggle. Sweat and blood coagulated on Lee's form and made him appear as a warrior of legend, despite the position he was in. Hayate walked in front of Gara and announced, Winner, Team Suna. Gara dropped his hands and slowly lowered Lee to the ground before he appeared under Lee and offered him a shoulder to lean on. Lee cracked one eye open and met Gara's emerald gaze. 
before a content smile flickered onto his face as he passed out. Gara handed off Lee's unconscious body to the medics with a smile on his face before he went and checked on Tamari. Tamari was whimpering over the state of her battle fan as it was dented in the middle along one of the sides. She looked up and smiled brilliantly at Gara who embraced her in a hug. Rasa watched two of his children embrace in a hug and he couldn't suppress the fatherly pride that swept over him. Once again, he closed his eyes and thanked Kemi for Naruto's and Tsunade's influence on the life of his family. He made a show of clapping for Gara and Tamari when he saw them look up at him. He rose from his seat along with Hiruzen and Shunshin next to the Hokage on the field. The Hokage began informing the finalists present and the Jonin senseis of what to expect next. That was a wonderful performance. In fact, I was so impressed by the team fights that I plan on making this a standard for the second phase. You all fought splendidly and used your teamwork to bring out your individual battle prowess. I congratulate you on making it to the finals, but this is not the end. You will have one month to prepare yourself for the finals. We will use that time to inform dignitaries and spectators around the land so that you will be able to perform to your utmost in this stadium in front of a crowd. Prepare wisely and show us the fruits of your efforts in the finals. For visiting teams, private training ground have been prepared and privacy barriers have been erected to ensure that you will be able to train with no reservations. We will now draw numbers to determine the order and makeup of the fights for the finals. After the remaining contestants, or their Jonin Sensei, drew numbers, the matches broke down as follows. Match 1, Gara vs. Mitsuchi. Match 2, Hinata Hyuga vs. Karo. Match 3, Shino Abarame vs. Maki Kamazura. Match 4, Tamari vs. Samui. Match 5, Naruto vs. Kurotsuchi. Match 6, Konkuro vs. Amoi. That night, back at the Senju compound, a raucous party was being held in honor of the study group over representing in the finals. Tsunade did smack Naruto on his head for his interference with the Iwa team but then she pulled him into a hug and said she understood. Most people agreed with what Naruto did since Kurotsuchi was clearly out of line. That spawned a 30-minute speculative conversation on what Iwa would do in response to Naruto's actions. In the end, Kinji and Hodo said that they would put the Earth Daimyo and Tsuchikage in their proper places. Despite the tense topic of conversation, everyone was still in high spirits, especially when teams 9 and 10 joined the festivities after being released from the infirmary. Everyone decided that they would do the cross-fit training sessions before breaking off and doing their own individual training. Tsunade was coaxed into training Hinata for the exams and Shino informed Itachi that his father would be primarily responsible for his training, along with a hive experiment with Naruto. Itachi offered his training to Naruto, who agreed to let Itachi train him four days a week. He also made a request for Itachi to bring Tenzo, if he were available. Itachi agreed to the request and said he would make the request of his old Anbu teammate. At the Uchiha compound, Sasuke was glaring at everything and everyone. He woke up in the infirmary and found that his team lost in under two minutes and he was properly embarrassed. When he heard about the other team's performances, he was further incensed because of how easily his team was defeated. His injuries were nothing and he was released shortly after the preliminaries ended, which meant that he couldn't even copy Jutsus, to rub salt in his wound. Sasuke's ruminations were rooted in his inferiority complex that stemmed from living in Itachi's shadow. Every week somebody compared him to his prodigy brother, every day something reminded him of how insignificant he was to the Uchiha prodigy and future Hokage, every second his hunger for recognition and power drove him to madness. He could no longer silence his internal voice that told him he was nothing more than a disappointment. Then, the Senju returned to Konoha and made everything worse for him. He was upstaged at the academy and robbed of the title rookie of the year, which would have gotten him at least some recognition from his father. Now, he wasn't even among the strongest of his class anymore all of the other clan heirs had apparently closed the gap and surpassed him, which made his feelings of inferiority overflow. He was mentally spinning in circles down the proverbial drain, and he didn't know what to do if things continued going in the same manner. He finally reached his house, brushed off his mother's greeting with a grunt of HN and walked straight to his room. Mikoto frowned deeply at her son's attitude, and she grabbed Itachi's arm before he was able to walk out the door. Where are you going, Sochi? Mikoto asked. Itachi looked placidly at his mother and responded. I was invited to the Senju compound to celebrate with my team for getting to the finals. Mikoto fidgeted around nervously before looking up and making her plea. Itachi, could you please go talk to your brother before you go? It looks like he is taking his loss poorly, Itachi sighed and his hand traced down his tear tracks. Look, mother, I am probably the last person my little brother wants to see right now. I have told you repeatedly about his inferiority slash superiority complex. I am one of the avatars of his inferiority complex, Naruto is the other. Mikoto frowned deeply. 
Itachi Uchiha, you will go to your brother's room and try to help him through this. Now go, Itachi sighed and walked up the stairs. As he moved out of frame, Fugaku came to the stairwell with a frown fixed on his face. Fugaku had been deeply disappointed with Sasuke's results and attitude. He raised his boy to be a proud Uchiha and he has fallen behind his peers ever since Naruto returned to Konoha. Dear, could you tell me why there is such a difference between our two sons? Mikoto slapped Fugaku on the shoulder, husband, Sasuke took after you while Itachi took after me. He is a proud boy. Too proud to ask for help and seek the counsel of others. From my understanding, Naruto Senju has extended multiple invites to Team 7 to attend the joint training sessions. Sasuke has refused and as a result he has fallen behind his peers. Fugaku scowled, and yet, I have taken time to train the boy. He even has his Sharingan and still is unable to best his peers. Dear, have you talked to Itachi about the training sessions? Have you attended any of the sessions or attempted to understand the reasoning behind them? I have talked extensively with Shizun and Tsunade Senju about it and it is a tremendous blend of hard work, few injutsu and medical knowledge. You are strong, dear, but you do not train in such a manner. That is why Itachi has seen such improvements in his strength recently. Mikoto chastised her husband. Fugaku frowned and growled lowly. He had lost every spar for the last three months to his son and his pride was hurt. Then why has our son refused to partake in the training? Mikoto's motherly righteousness subsided, and she appeared to be sad. Because we have failed, dear husband. Sasuke grew up as the best among his age group and we did nothing to suppress the pride that came with that. He grew up thinking that he was superior to his peers and his whole world has shattered around him. Now, his Itachi complex is applying to all of his peers because they have surpassed him. At that moment, Itachi walked down the stairs and addressed his father. Good evening, father. Mother is right and I am unable to help my little brother. He will not see or listen to reason, especially when it comes to me. I advise that you let him have time to reflect and discuss this with him tomorrow morning. I will be at the Senju compound with my team, good evening. Itachi bowed to his parents before walking out the door. Hokaye's office, three days after preliminaries, Jiraiya hopped in through the window and waved to Hiruzen and a shadow clone of Itachi that was learning to perform the duties. Jiraiya asked for a bit of privacy and made an extra mention that it was a conversation meant for himself and Hiruzen. The Itachi clone respectfully nodded before collecting a stack of papers and leaving the office. So, it is finally time for him to take over, huh sensei? Jiraiya opened the dialogue awkwardly. You know, Jiraiya, I don't even care anymore. The end is in sight, and I will be forever rid of this monstrous paperwork. So, what did you need to talk about, Jiraiya? Hiruzen relaxed back into his chair and leaned back to take a break from the tiny white demons. I need your help convincing Naruto to sign the Toad contract. Ma and Pa are furious, and the old geezer Toad said that the prophecy is changing. They are worried if I don't make this right that it will spell bad news for the shinobi world. Jiraiya explained despondently. And you think I can help why? Hiruzen replied dryly. He was sick of trying to make things right with Naruto at this point and he resigned himself to being on the boy's shit list for the remainder of his days. Jiraiya tried to puff out his chest and regain some of his lost bravado. Because you are the Hokage, and it is a Konoha contract. I need you to help me convince him. The world is depending on it, sensei. Not to mention Ma's rolling pin really hurts, Hiruzen chuckled at the mental image of Jiraiya getting beat down by Ma's rolling pin. I still don't think that I will be of use in this. When we informed the council about his Makutan, that was the last straw. He gave us a chance to earn a way back into his life, Jiraiya. A chance that we threw away for something as silly as duty or procedure. Jiraiya scowled, Sensei, get your shit together. You did what was right by Konoha. Just like my student did all those years ago. We have always put the village first and it is high time that Brat does the same. I won't let his dishonor the memories of his parents any longer. So, where is he? Hiruzen shook his head, already seeing how this will play out. He trains at his compound in the morning, spends the day in the forest of death and then has an evening training session with his peers again. Jiraiya hopped to the window ledge. All right, sensei, I'm going. Don't worry, when I come back Konoha will have a new toad summoner. Forest of death, 2 p.m., three days after prelims, Itachi, Tenzo and Tsunade were watching a horde of Naruto clones practice a variety of tasks while Kurama observed the original Naruto meditating and flowing Sinjutsu chakra in and out of his coils. Kenzo was providing what few pointers he could to Naruto on the Makutan abilities. Truth be told, Naruto's raw chakra and life force far exceeded Tenzo's own, which made his jutsu far more potent than anything Tenzo could produce. 
Kenzo had the clones altering the surrounding trees and was focusing on honing Naruto's micromanagement of the Makutan. He was having Naruto do things like make words out of the trees or making the trees interact with one another. Of course, Naruto's clones being the knucklehead they are, decided to make the trees box against one another. Each hand guided potent Makutan chakra into the trees and made the usually inanimate objects have a full-on, no-holds-barred, slugfest with one another. The chakra control to do this with two trees simultaneously was impressive and the group watched on in amusement as wood and tree bark flew sporadically around the clearing. Once one tree was destroyed, another grew in its place and the sparring session began anew, leaving wood splinters, saw dust and tree branches scattered in piles on the floor. Itachi was focusing on Naruto's kenjutsu, speed of his hand signs and on Naruto's pet project. Naruto had read about the adamantine chains of his mother and other chakra chain variants of the Uzumaki clan. Kurama had informed the group that his chakra was more than dense enough to create the chains and that Naruto had the ability to do it. Itachi was reading Kushina's scroll on the ability and trying various things to get the ability to manifest in Naruto. Itachi loved watching Naruto train, even if he worked with shadow clones most of the time. The kid was just so focused on training and enjoyed every second of it, even if it got frustrating at times. That being said, Naruto was easily the most prodigious student Itachi would ever have and he wanted to play a role in his development. Thinking forward, Itachi also recognized the important role Naruto would play in Konoha's future and throughout his reign as the 5th Hokage. Okay guys, my guess is that clones will not be able to manifest this ability. Kushina never attempted it with shadow clones, and I think there was a reason for that. I want this group to join the Kenjutsu group. One-on-one -on -one spars with the resting clones making observations. If you have a moment of realization, condense your thoughts and dispel to share it with everyone else. Itachi called out to his group of 20 clones. Hi hi, Itachi senpai. The clones chorused in their usual response to Itachi. Itachi walked over to Kurama, who was still watching Naruto meditate. Itachi marveled at the warm feeling surrounding Naruto and the effects on the local plant life that Naruto had when using Sinjutsu Chakra. The only way to describe it was the overabundance of life force. Do you think I can try something with him? Itachi asked Kurama in monotone. Kurama looked over at Itachi and smirked you finally figure something out? Itachi nodded calmly, I believe that clones will be unable to perform the Kongo Fusa. I also believe that Naruto isn't visualizing it properly. I want to try something with him, do you think you could return to the seal and provide feedback from within? Kurama scowled at that in a pouty way, but it is such a nice day. The kit can figure it out. Itachi had grown accustomed to interacting with Kurama and knew what he had to do. I will personally hunt down two deer for you alone. I will also make Naruto release you with enough chakra to take on your kitsune form so you may properly enjoy them. Images of a bloody feast filled Kurama's chakra constructed mind. He grinned devilishly. You have yourself a deal, Itachi. Oi, kit. I am returning to the seal. Listen to this human instructor and do what he says. Naruto's head lifted and his eyes cracked open to show that he was in a stage 1 sage mode as Itachi dubbed it. There were only markings around his eyes that resembled eye shadow. This level of sage mode was meant to limit the amount of natural energy and it was Itachi's hope that this could become a sort of resting state for Naruto. I am listening, sensei, Naruto said in a natural calm. Itachi took a seat, Indian style, in front of Naruto. Look, Naruto, I think we have been going about the chakra chains the wrong way. Your mother said that they first manifested from her back in between her shoulder blades. I was thinking, with your tenon and more fox-like attributes, why not try to grow tails first? Your chakra cloak seemed to naturally form tails, so why not imitate that? Naruto smiled at the thought, especially when Kurama shouted his agreement in Naruto's mind. Kurama was excited because if the kit grew tails, then it would be like Naruto was truly one of Kurama's own. Over the years, the nine-tailed bijou had grown to see Naruto as a mix between a best friend and child. So, the idea of seeing his kit running around with fox tails excited him. That's a great idea, kit. You know how we can extend and manipulate the chakra appendages, try to concentrate your chakra like that. Focus on giving it form and send it down to the base of your spine. Kurama watched through the mental link and spread his senses around his host's body. Naruto stood up and closed his eyes in concentration. He stood perfectly still in a relaxed, athletic posture with his eyes close. His chakra aura flared around his body as Naruto focused on willing the chakra to take shape. It took three hours of flexing his chakra, resting, meditating and trying again for the first results to take form, and boy were they surprising. Itachi watched his pupil focus in a manner that blew Itachi's mind. 
Number 13 year old should be able to focus his being so completely on something for this length of time. The amount of chakra moving through Naruto's system nearly blinded Itachi when he activated his Sharingan, but he still did so from time to time to get a clearer picture of what was going on with Naruto's chakra. After a couple hours, Itachi activated his Mangekyo Sharingan and noticed that a new chakra focal point was forming at the base of Naruto's tailbone. He immediately shared his discovery with Tsunade, who was keenly interested in the development. Tsunade, being the legendary doctor of the elemental nations, had never heard of creating a new Tenketsu and she was excited to investigate. Then she saw nine appendages sprout out of Naruto's tailbone and take form. The chakra chains were unlike anything she had ever seen before, and she blinked multiple times to check if what she was seeing was real. Kenzo saw the clones freeze before they universally turned toward their creator and watched him perform his latest miracle. Kenzo immediately recognized the chakra that was pouring off of the tails and he felt his body react to the true activation of Makuten. With a tingly sensation. Coursing through his body, Tenzo watched as the formless chakra tails shaped themselves into thick chains made of Makuten chakra. Naruto opened his eyes, feeling that something had changed, and his efforts had borne fruit. He ordered a shadow clone to come over and take a good look at the nine chains that were nearly six feet in length. The chains looked like they were made of wood, but they were a dark, burnt orange and there was a forest green aura around each of them. At the tip of each chain was a forest green tip that focused down into a tail-like ending that reminded Naruto of Kurama's tails. You did it Kit. I can feel the new Tenketsu and it is already stabilizing at the base of your spine. It is just like the primary Tenketsu that forms the control center for my tails. Kit. Kurama's excitement wavered as he slid into a more analytical state of mind. Kit, these chains are composed of raw Makuten chakra mixed with trace amounts of Senjutsu chakra and my own. You need to be careful with them, I don't know what they will do. Naruto listened to Kurama with rapt interest, and he was beyond giddy to test out his new ability. He felt the chains waving about randomly behind him and decided to see if he could halt their movement. He felt like he was resisting the natural order of things as he forced his chains into a rigid position to prevent them from moving. He felt a burn in his tailbone before the chains receded back into his spinal column. Tsunade rushed over once she broke out of her shock. She immediately began running a diagnostic jutsu over Naruto's sacrum, pelvic bone and tailbone. She hummed with interest as Naruto willingly placed himself into a prone position on the ground, knowing that it was either futile or very painful to deny his mama when she was in this mode. After a couple minutes, Naruto felt the soothing sensation of his mama's medical chakra as she provided relief to the burnout Tenketsu. All right, Ruto. Great job buddy. So, you have a new Tenketsu at the base of your spine, were you trying to do that? Naruto shrugged his shoulders while his head rested on a pillow on newly grown grass. Yeah, it was Q's idea. I just kept my chakra focused on that area and I held it there for a couple hours. Tsunade tapped her chin and thought. I have never heard of creating a Tenketsu, but you have clearly done it. I don't know if it is because of Kurama or because of your potent chakra though. I will have to test it out. Anyway, the Tenketsu is new and you burn it out. If you want to be able to manifest your chains from other spots, I would try repeating the same process. This time, try to focus on the Tenketsu in your palms and try to adapt them to match the newly formed one. That would let you shoot chains out of your palms, if my guess is right. Naruto gave in to the yipping in his head and created a wood clone that glowed with red chakra out of his back. Kurama took form and added his thoughts. While it would be cool for you too. Walk around like a kitsune, your grandmother is right. If you focus on creating the chakra points for your chains, then you should be able to manifest them through other parts of your body. Tsunade bonked Kurama on the head. What have I told you about referring to me with that word, Q? She growled menacingly at him. Kurama shrugged before offering an apology. My bad, Suheim. I just figured that on top of being the most beautiful woman in the world, you may as well claim the title of the most beautiful grandmother. Naruto wolf whistled and Itachi chuckled while Tsunade blushed furiously. Kurama had been putting the moves on Tsunade for a while now and Naruto guessed that he was actually starting to have an effect. Smooth, Q. Like a real-life Rico Suave, Naruto said through his chuckles. Kurama grinned devilishly at the comment and Tsunade's blush. Thanks, Kit. No mortal is deserving of such a beauty, and I already see you as my own anyway. Tsunade went crimson as the meaning behind Kurama's words hit her. SSS shut up, BBB Baka Kitsune, Tsunade stuttered out in a fit of embarrassment, which earned laughs from all around until her aura turned murderous. Oh, you wanna go? Next one to laugh gets a free trip to wave country. Everyone immediately zipped their lips. A whistle came from the tree line before a big, recognizable man with white hair jumped down from his perch on the tree. 
Naruto instantly saw Ma and Pa toad on his shoulders and frowned. Flashback, start of the rebellion, Naruto was in Suna, resting after a long week of patrols and missions in Wind Country. He was gathering supporters and he had found a safe place for the Bijou to lay low. Things were going well and there hadn't been any direct offensives yet, which gave Suna time to prepare. He had just gotten out of the shower when three puffs of chakra smoke filled his room. When the smoke dissipated, Naruto saw Ma, Pa and a miniature form of Gamabunta. Naruto smiled brilliantly at his summons, not picking up on the mood. Hey guys, what brings you to Suna? Naruto boy, I need you to take a seat, Pa said in a serious tone and frowned a bit. Naruto sat on the bed and shot a confused look between the three toads. Bunta spoke up, look, brat, we just returned from a council of the summons, and we have bad news. Naruto remained silent, waiting for a further explanation. Naruto-chan, the summon council acknowledges that you were the child of prophecy, and you fulfilled the prophecy by stopping Madara Uchiha. Naruto smiled in a moment of pride before Pa continued. Naruto boy, there is a problem. Since you no longer belong to Konoha, we will no longer be able to be your summons, Pa said remorsefully, and the old toad nearly cracked when Naruto's face fell and tears welled in the sparkling, azure blue eyes. Bunta hopped onto Naruto's shoulder. We tried to resist, but our summoning contract was linked to Konoha by Jiraiya. We wanted to come in person to tell you that we need to remove you from our roster, and you will no longer be able to summon us. I'm sorry, kiddo. Naruto wept silently for nearly five minutes, trying to wrap his mind around this betrayal. Kurama did his best to comfort Naruto, but it was futile. The toads had played a massive role in his life, and he counted them as family, which meant this was a serious betrayal by family. Naruto's sadness pulled subconsciously on Kurama's chakra and sadness turned to anger. So, I fulfill your damned prophecy and you just drop me in a trash can like some used condom? That's bullshit and you know it, Naruto shouted hoarsely, still gripped by overwhelming sadness. Ma frowned, language, Naruto-chan. She held up her rolling pin menacingly at the young man. Bullshit, Ma. This is fucking bullshit. I don't give a damn about some council, if someone is family you fight and you die alongside them before you ever betray them, Naruto shouted despondently. Ma attempted to thwack Naruto on his head with her rolling pin, but Naruto caught it and his eyes flashed red. Pa stepped in, not wanting things to escalate. Naruto boy, you need to calm down. We didn't come here to fight. Naruto turned his red, slitted glare on Fukusaku. If that was all you have to say, leave. If that was all I meant to you then leave immediately. The three toads tried to protest, but it was futile. Their hollow words never penetrated the grief, sorrow, rage and betrayal that Naruto was feeling. The went back to Mount Mayaoku with heavy hearts and a lot to think about. End of flashback, Naruto's azure eyes turned frigid, and his warm aura turned menacing as he looked into the eyes of Ma and Pa Toad as they rode on Jiraiya's shoulders. Naruto still held love for the buffoon, but he had done little to nothing to redeem himself in this life. Furthermore, Naruto was confused why Jiraiya never told him of his lineage, why he never properly trained him and why it was always about the Kyuubi when they were training. These unresolved feelings were the main reason he kept Jiraiya at arm's reach this time around and Tsunade had backed him completely in his decision. Tsunade stepped in between Naruto and Jiraiya before scowling, What do you want, Jiraiya? Jiraiya plastered on a goofy grin and held up his hands. Don't be like that, Haim. I just want to talk to the kid and train him. Itachi joined Tsunade as an impromptu barrier in between his charge and Jiraiya. And what makes you think you have anything to teach my student? Itachi wasn't completely clued in, but it was clear to Itachi that Jiraiya had hurt his student, which was all the motivation Itachi needed. Jiraiya's gaze hardened as he turned his head to Itachi. Look, brat, I was winning wars before you were even born. That there is my grandson and godson, and you have no right to step in between us. Tsunade scoffed, godson? Mighty convenient to claim that title now that he has grown up. Jiraiya frowned at Tsunade and his eyes misted over with regret. Look, Haim, I made mistakes. I have tried to make up for them. Yeah, Tsunade, Jiraiya boy feels mighty bad about his failings. Just hear us out, will you Naruto boy? Pa backed his summoner up, but he wasn't ready for the look of betrayal and hurt that occupied the depths of Naruto's azure blue eyes. Lord Fukusaku, the truth is you will never know the reason why I refuse to sign the toad summoning contract. I am bound by a higher contract not to divulge that information. That being said, use your senjutsu and listen to my words. Naruto paused here, giving the toads time to get into serious mode. I will never be a toad summoner. I do not care that I am some child of prophecy. Yes, I know it is me. You will have no part in guiding my hand, 
no influence on my training and I care not for the games played by the Council of Summons or the visions of some old geezer. At the very least, I will offer the toads neutrality. Stay out of my way and I will stay out of yours. Jiraiya began his retort, but he was cut off by a wave of the rolling pin from Ma. Naruto-chan, what have the toads done to offend you so? I felt your pain and I don't doubt your resolve, but this doesn't make sense. You possess information that you should not know, and you claim you are bound by a higher contract, but I can tell that you are no summoner. Yeah, brat, the toads are awesome, and you shouldn't speak to them like that. Jiraiya's chastising was cut off by a murderous glare from Tsunade, who calmed down a bit when Kurama put a comforting hand on her shoulder. Jiraiya glared at the intimate contact, and he got his bravado back. And who are you, Red? Naruto laughed heartily, completely expecting this reaction from Jiraiya. Godfather, meet the Kyubi no Kitsune, you may refer to him as Q until he shares his name. Q, this is my absentee godfather, Jiraiya Senju. I know, Kit. I was the one that told you he was a Senju, remember? Q shot back, never losing his devilish smirk. Jiraiya and the toads were stunned with their chins rolling on the forest floor. Jiraiya was pointing stupidly at Q and Ma and Pa weren't faring much better. The group let this go on for a minute before Itachi coughed and brought them back to the real world. How could you, brat? How could you make your father's sacrifice meaningless? Jiraiya shouted, taking a battle-ready posture. Naruto shot an amused look at Q, who sighed before he returned to the seal. Naruto shot a cocked eyebrow at Jiraiya before creating another wood clone for Kurama to inhabit. Now, Godfather, I recommend you stand down before I put you down. I will not tolerate any aggression toward Q or anyone I consider family. Jiraiya-chan, let it go. That was not what we came to talk to Naruto-chan about. Ma jumped onto Jiri's head and began patting it in a comforting manner. Fine, Jiraiya huffed, but we will talk about this later. For now, Naruto, you need to sign the Toad contract. No. Naruto boy, it is prophesied that Jiraiya will guide the child of prophecy. Fukusaku began. Naruto shrugged before interrupting Fukusaku. I don't care. Like, literally, I give zero fucks. I am going to do me, and I will change the world how I see fit. Jiraiya face and tone hardened. Naruto, you will not disrespect Ma and Pa. You will sign the Toad contract, it is your birthright and your duty. No, Jiraiya, it is neither of the two. Did you know that I met my father, and he integrated his knowledge into me through the seal? Did you know he asked Bunta to look out for me? Did any of the toads even check in on me as I was left to rot in an orphanage? Or the year I spent alone in the Namikaze compound? Or the years after I found Mama and started my life with her? Spoiler alert, no, they didn't. The toads have no right to me because they denied my father's dying wish in the same way you did, grandfather. Naruto's voice wavered with emotion, but he never shouted or raised his volume. Three faces fell in shame, realizing that the boy was right. They looked up as Naruto bit his thumb and flipped through the reverse summoning hand signs. They tried to stop him, but Tsunade blocked them. This will take me to the summons I am most attuned with. I know the risks and I will leave it in Kami's hands. If I end up in my Aoku, then I may sign the contract. If I don't, please fuck off and leave me alone. With that, Naruto slammed his hand on the ground and disappeared in a puff of white smoke. Naruto's clones and Kurama popped out of existence and the clearing fell into a stunned silence. What did you just do, Tsunade? Jiraiya roared. He could die. Tsunade scoffed, oh, can it Jiraiya? Now, old geezers, I will tell you that you will never regain Naruto's trust. You will never know what you have lost or exactly why you have lost it. If you try to keep forcing the issue, you will make an enemy. Jiraiya puffed out his chest, relax, Heim. I am still more powerful than you and I wouldn't even need my sage mode, Tsunade laughed heartily while Itachi and Tenzo backed away slowly as Tsunade began cracking her knuckles. Oh, you think? Well, Toad Boy, I have spent the last seven years training with Naruto. Naruto altered my strength of 100 seal and added a yin component. I have trained every day with resistance and weight seals, and I am still stronger than my blonde grandson. If you want to test that theory. Tsunade let that hang and got into a combat stance as her aura surged and cracked the ground around her. Jiraiya held up his hands defensively, realizing that he just choked himself with his own foot. Now, Haim, there is no need to get physical. Tsunade cracked her neck while glaring at Jiraiya. Her honey-brown eyes glowed golden as power flowed through her. Aqua blue sage markings appeared around her eyes as the slug Sanin just debuted the slug sage to the world. Oh, but I think there is. Tsunade-chan, this battle would destroy Konoha if we let it continue. Please calm down. 
I would very much appreciate an explanation for Naruto's strong feelings against the Toads. Ma cut into the confrontation. Tsunade turned her powerful gaze on Ma and made the old Toad flinch. I am bound by the same contract Naruto is not to disclose that information. The only thing you need to know is that Naruto will never trust the Toads again and he has my full support in that decision. Jiraiya was getting frustrated now, and he stomped his foot on the ground. What is this contract you keep speaking of? At that moment, an ethereal voice was heard, and Jiraiya, Ma, Pa and Tsunade were pulled into an otherworldly white plane. A golden light appeared in front of the group and Tsunade got down on one knee with her hand over her heart. Ma and Pa followed suit, but Jiraiya stood in a stunned silence before Ma smacked him on the head with her rolling pin and he got down on a knee. I will not share everything with you because it would interfere too much in my little show. Fukusaku and Shima, the toads betrayed my chosen child in a previous life. You will never speak of this again and you will not attempt to get more information out of Naruto. You will be bound. By celestial contract and Jiraiya will wake up accepting that Naruto will not be a toad summoner. I cannot let him remember this. Ma and Pa, tell Gamamaru of this and share no more or I will stop letting him watch my shows. The ethereal voice giggled before continuing. Oh, and Tsunade, thank you for everything you have done. When the time comes, you will join me with your loved ones. Minato and Kushina are excited to see you again, along with Dan and Nowaki. The group was ejected from the ethereal world and returned to the forest of death. Tears were falling freely as a reminiscent smile graced Tsunade's face. Jiraiya was unconscious on the forest floor while Ma and Pa were godsmacked. Tsunade saw this and her smile turned to a stern look. I trust no more needs to be said. Please return to Mayaoku and let the old geezer know to let things go, Tsunade said sternly. Ma and Pa looked at each other before returning to Mount Mayaoku with no further arguments. Tsunade sighed and plopped down on the forest floor, determined to wait for Naruto to return from the summoning realm. Kenzo and Itachi offered their goodbyes before they returned to the village, leaving Jiraiya passed out on the ground. Tsunade erected an earthen house and unsealed a cushion to rest on before she unsealed some medical files and got some work done while she was waiting for her grandson. The great forest of Jura-Naruto felt like his body was repeatedly pulled through the eye of a needle as he moved through dimensions. His eyes were closed, but he felt like he could see streaks of light and his body felt weightless as it traveled through the dimension. Suddenly, he appeared in a forest he didn't recognize surrounded by trees that looked similar, yet very different to the trees of Fire Country. After shaking off the disorienting method of travel, Naruto decided to climb up the tallest tree he could find to get his bearings. At the top of the tree, Naruto looked around and saw an expansive forest that went almost as far as the eye could see. He saw a lake way off in the distance, a mountain range slightly closer and he could see a clearing in the forest nearly 10 miles away. Naruto descended from his perch and decided to use his sage mode to get a better understanding of where he was. As he sat down, crossed his legs, rested his hands on his knees and closed his eyes, Naruto reached out to the world around him. The first thing Naruto felt was that the energy of this world was completely different. It was potent energy, but it didn't bear the same makeup or feel as natural energy from his world. Deciding to play with it, Naruto gathered the strange energy into himself and found that it was far more pliable than the nature chakra from his world. Much like his world, this energy was in every living thing that Naruto could feel in the forest, and it was as eager to explore him as he was to explore it. Naruto could feel the plants, trees, ants, holy shit those were big ants. Spiders, what the fuck is wrong with those spiders, snakes? Kami, I still hate snakes even in this world, Naruto thought. Then he started feeling creatures and signatures that he wasn't familiar with, even thought they were highly condensed versions of this life-giving energy. Notice, unique ability, sage of the forest granted to individual Naruto Senju a mechanical voice sounded in Naruto's head, which completely distracted him from his meditation. Q, what the fuck was that? Naruto thought. I don't know, kid. You should know everyone is here though. When you came to this world it brought us with you. Kurama answered. This world? Isn't this a summoning realm? Like a pocket dimension or something? Naruto thought back. Rias was in her thinking pose, trying to process everything that was happening. No, Ruto. This is a different world. You felt all of the different signatures, which wouldn't happen in a summoning realm. Oh, shit, Naruto said out loud. Ara, Ara, what is this shit you are speaking of? A playful voice sounded from behind Naruto. Naruto whipped around to see a beautiful woman with green hair, wrapped in vines and wearing a light turquoise camisole with a blue dress that covered her feet. She felt like nature itself and she held a power that seemed familiar, yet strange, to Naruto. Naruto decided to play this carefully. Naruto rose from the ground, 
scratched the back of his neck while chuckling sheepishly and then bowed respectfully to the lady in front of him. Um, hello miss. I am Naruto Senju, a shinobi from Konoha and I somehow ended up in your forest. I was hoping maybe you could help me out. Also, did you hear that strange voice before? Trainee smiled at the blonde boy, she could tell that he was powerful, yet it was clear he didn't belong in this world. Ara, Ara, it is nice to meet you, Naruto. I am the dryad, trainee, servant of Demon Lord Raimuru. You are in the great forest of Jura, Demon Lord Raimuru's domain. She just said Demon Lord twice, that's bad, right? Naruto thought before he responded, letting his altars sort out things in his head for him. Um, Demon Lord? Naruto asked. Isn't that a bad thing? Trainee laughed, a beautiful and melodical life that flittered through the air like leaves caught in a breeze. Oh no, Demon Lord Raimuru is magnificent. Tell me, Senju, are you an otherworlder? Otherworlder? Maybe they know how to send me back then. Naruto composed himself and hid his emotions. Eh? Probably. I was trying to find a summoning contract and I was sent here. Are the Dryads a summoning clan? Trainee gave Naruto a skeptical and confused look. I do not know, the Dryads serve Lord Raimuru and help him manage the forest. That was actually why I came here, were you the one taking magicules from the forest? Magicules? Naruto asked, truly perplexed. After listening to Kurama and Rias for a second, Naruto then chuckled. Is that what I was doing? I was trying to go into sage mode so that I could determine where I was. Trainee was now keenly interested, but she knew that this conversation should probably include Lord Raimuru. Hmm, hmm, okay. Well, why don't we go talk to Demon Lord Raimuru and get this figured out? Naruto nodded hesitantly, not knowing if he was looking forward to meeting somebody calling themselves a Demon Lord. Trainee stepped next to Naruto before a magical circle appeared below their feet and the two disappeared in a flutter of leaves. It felt much like using the Horishin, but Naruto was honestly blown away that this dryad could so easily use the technique. Naruto appeared in a city, surrounded by creatures of all sizes and races. His senses were overloaded as his connection to the world reached out and touched every creature in the vicinity. He could tell that they harbored no hostile intent, but he could also sense that there were some more powerful than he was. He counted roughly eight creatures whose natural energy far exceeded his own. Kurama was cautioning him to be nice and respectful, saying that this was like no summoning realm he had ever seen. Trainee walked him toward an official-looking building made out of white marble with a circular creature in the place one would normally expect a crest to be. It confused Naruto and his internal passengers to no end, but he figured he would find out in due time. Naruto and Trainee received greetings from every creature they passed. Naruto countered humans, midget humans, lizard creatures, dogmen, big green men, little fairies and men with horns that screamed power. Naruto was starting to relax as everyone seemed friendly enough and the presence of humans made him feel at least a little bit comforted. Naruto was walked into an ornate office and saw two of the most beautiful creatures that he had ever seen. One was wearing a purple two-piece suit with purple hair tied into a ponytail, a massive rack and a black horn coming from her forehead. The other was wearing a shrine maiden-style dress, light pink hair, regal features that highlighted her raw beauty. Her smile made Naruto's heart flutter and the two white horns accentuated her beauty. In the center of the desk, there was a blue ball creature that Naruto didn't recognize at all, but he felt that it was powerful. Lord Raimuru, an unexpected guest appeared in the forest, and I thought that it would be good to bring him to you, Trainee said formally while bowing. Naruto followed suit and offered a polite bow. I think he is an otherworlder and he claims that he brought himself to our world. Naruto saw the blue sphere shift and somehow felt that it was looking at him and analyzing him. Naruto and Kurama were highly intrigued that this small creature was the so-called demon lord of these lands. He saw the questioning looks from the two females next to the desk and decided to wait and see how this played out. Raimuru was now keenly interested, and he was talking internally to Raphael to figure out everything he could about this strangely familiar human in front of him. So, Raphael, what can you tell me? Raimuru thought. Answer, this human is from another and unknown world. He possesses an energy different from magicules and has a demon sealed inside him. He is powerful and the voice of the world has already granted him a unique ability. The soft, yet slightly robotic, voice answered Raimuru's question. Oh, what ability? Answer, this boy was granted the unique ability, Sage of the Forest. It is unknown what this ability grants him. Raimuru focused on the boy and slight slits appeared on his slime form that gave the impression of eyes. Welcome to Raimuru, the capital of the Jura Tempest Federation. I am Demon Lord Raimuru, bringer of chaos. How can I help you, Sage of the Forest? Raimuru's voice was high-pitched and disarming. 
Naruto rose from his bow and scratched the back of his neck sheepishly. Were you the one that called me that back in the forest? The slime rolled to its side, as if cocking its head. No, you heard the voice of the world? Voice of the world? Naruto questioned, is that what that was? I dunno, I was trying to enter sage mode and I felt that the natural energy here was different from my home world. The slime formed a hand with a thumbs up. Nice job, you are taking this pretty well. If you don't mind me asking, what world do you come from and how did you get here? And what is this sage mode you mentioned? Um, well I am ninja from Konoha, a town in fire country in the elemental nations. I don't know what the world is called. Naruto cocked his head and pondered that thought before continuing. I used a reverse summoning jutsu to find a summoning clan that I could call upon to aid me in my battles and other things. Sage mode is the ability to gather natural energy from the surrounding environment and I use it to connect to the world and strengthen my jutsus. Ninja? Jutsus? Summons? Raimuru asked in his signature childish voice. Um, well, you see, I am a ninja from Konoha. We used abilities with chakra to perform powerful techniques called jutsu. In my world, we can link with an animal summoning clan that we can partner with. Naruto explained. Notice, powerful magical signature incoming. Raphael warned Raimuru internally, making him stiffen. A beautiful woman with goddess-like beauty and blonde hair appeared next to Naruto. She wore a white, Roman-style toga dress that strapped over her left shoulder. Her hair flittered around with small orange ribbons in it and Raimuru was glad he was in his slime form otherwise his jaw would have been on the floor. Oh, how interesting. Is Veldanaba around anymore? The goddess asked. Suddenly, all of Raimuru's most trusted guardians appeared in the room and took defensive positions in front of their lord. The goddess laughed a beautiful and ethereal laugh. Oh, this is too funny. Ruto, leave it to you to go to a separate world. A blush appeared on the slime, which made the females bristle protectively. Um, I'm sorry miss, but who are you? Oh, sorry about that Satoru-san. I am Kami, the goddess from Naruto's dimension. It appears that Veldanaba is no more. Are his children still around? The woman asked, completely carefree despite the threatening group of powerful creatures. A girl with pink hair tied in twin ponytails wearing what appeared to be a skimpy outfit stepped forward. How do you know my dad? What do you mean he is gone? Oh, how cute, Milam it has been decades since I last saw you. The only dragonoid, demon lord of destruction, Milam Nava. Your father ruled this realm, designated the cardinal world. I made contact with him eons ago, I am sad I never got to say goodbye. Just so we can bring everyone up to speed, please close your eyes. The monsters looked toward the slime, who simply rolled forward in a nodding gesture. Suddenly, everyone received an influx of information that explained everything relevant to the parties in the room. Raimuru was blown away and ashamed that he didn't recognize Naruto sooner. Naruto was wide-eyed, seeing that the slime in front of him used to be a human. Kami soaked in the reactions and enjoyed a good laugh. Milam was wide-eyed at the goddess in front of her that knew her father. Veldora was crying as memories of his father brought up tragic memories of the past. Shien and Shuna were crying having seen Naruto's memories and the struggles he has endured. Raimuru took his human form and bowed respectfully to Kami. Thank you, Kamisama. That saves a lot of time. After another chuckle, Kami held out her hand. Oh, think nothing of it, Raimuru. You and I will become good friends in the not-too-distant future. Now, while it is unconventional, I think we could both benefit from a mutual summoning contract. Is this agreeable? It was Raimuru's turn to rub the back of his bluish hair sheepishly. I dunno. It is all a lot to take in. I just recently took my place in the octogram and we are still recovering from dealing with Demon Lord Clayman. Ah yes, that was well done. Naruto has had to deal with a couple characters such as Clayman in the past, although he was a particularly slimy bastard. Now, I cannot spill any secrets and I technically shouldn't intervene in another realm but the god of this realm has passed on. So, what do you say to a mutual summoning contract? Benimaru stepped forward, I am the military advisor to demon lord Raimuru. I have seen the memories, but I wish to test this one's power for myself. I propose a duel to determine the overall value of entering an agreement with this Naruto Senju. Naruto thought it out and decided that there was little harm in a battle. He could feel the power from Benimaru and knew that they would be roughly even if Naruto didn't use Kurama or Sage Mode. I can agree to that. Um, Naruto, are you sure? The Nimaru is one of my stronger subordinates and a duel allows killing blows. It doesn't have to end in death, but killing techniques are allowed, Raimuru cautioned. Naruto saw a twinkle in Kami's eyes and swallowed the lump in his throat. I can handle it. If I win, 
I want the right to summon the dryads and, Kijin, right? Shian stepped forward and pouted. No fair, I want to fight too. She stepped behind Raimuru and plopped her massive bust on Raimuru's head. Naruto shrugged before he was encompassed in a red energy. A wood clone sprouted out of his back and the red energy rushed into it. Kurama cracked his neck and grinned devilishly at Shian. I will be your opponent then. On the battlegrounds outside of Tempest, Naruto squared off against Benimaru and Shian unslung her massive sword in front of Kurama. Kurama unsealed the blade Naruto made with titanium, chakra metal, Kurama's chakra and Makutan chakra, which acted as a stabilizing agent for Kurama's potent chakra. The red blade glistened and glowed with Kurama's chakra. An old, white-haired Kijin stepped forward, Naruto closed his eyes and reviewed the memory dump from Kami to remember that this was Hakuro. This is to be a duel. Killing blows are allowed but discouraged. The duel is over when one side concedes, dies or is no longer able to fight. The duel for summoning rights between Naruto Senju Uzumaki and the Jura Tempest Federation starts, now. Binimaru unslung his sword and encased it in a blackish-blue flame before he disappeared in a dash forward. Naruto held his sword behind him with one hand and blocked Binimaru's sword before Naruto turned and sent a chakra-powered punch toward the kitchen. Binimaru transitioned the sword into a two-handed blocking position, but he wasn't ready for the raw force of Naruto's punch. The flame-encased blade slammed back into Binimaru's chest and sent him rolling backward. The mighty clang of the metal reverberated throughout the forest. As Binimaru was recovering, Naruto weaved through hand signs before stomping on the ground. Earth and spear shot out of the ground in an attempt to skewer Binimaru, but the Kijin had recovered enough to dodge the earthen spears. Binimaru focused black flames into a ball in his right hand before he chucked it toward Naruto and called out Hell Flare. Naruto saw the black ball coming and flipped through three hand seals before slamming his hands on the ground and calling out wood style, wood wall. The black ball impacted on the wood wall and a sizable explosion erupted in between the Kijin and Shinobi. Binimaru was looking around for Naruto when two hands came up from the ground and pulled one of Binimaru's legs deep into the ground. Binimaru managed to shake off the other hand, but now he was stuck in an awkward position. Naruto resurfaced from the ground and attempted to put his sword at Binimaru's neck. The Kijin slapped Naruto's sword out of the way and gave a might shout as his power flared and blew the earth encasing his left leg away. Binimaru stood to his full height, encompassed in a bluish-black magicule aura with the flames on his sword expanding menacingly. Naruto focused water chakra onto his blade and took a defensive position. The two began a five-minute long kenjutsu battle that thoroughly impressed the onlookers and left Kami giggling like a schoolgirl. It was different for her to be in the presence of the battle rather than watching it from her heavenly realm. Raimuru was talking with Rigor, Shian, Diablo, Veldora, and Milam, who were all starting to get battle-hungry looks in their eyes. Raimuru was nervous that his forest would soon be destroyed if he didn't calm them all down. So, what do you guys think? Raimuru asked as the Kenjutsu battle continued. Milam's pouty voice sounded out first, it's not fair. I want to go to this guy's world and have fun. He is strong, and if there are more strong people like him then I want to go too. Apologies, Milam, that will not be possible. You have too many magicules to transfer in between worlds and it would upset my little experiment too much, Veldora laughed boisterously. You are just like my brother. He used to love playing with the humans and running through experiments. Although, he never reset the timeline like you did, Kami chuckled mischievously, that you know about. Diablo grinned and chuckled, if it is the will of my master then I will go. Nope, no demons. We have enough of those. Nine to be precise and you are looking at a representation of one over there with Shian. Kami answered and the whole group looked toward Kurama who was engaged in a destructive battle with Shian. I will allow the dryads, creatures of the forest and Kijin because both worlds would benefit in that instance. When the new god is elected for this world, I will negotiate a pact with him. How do you know a new god will come to this world? Raimuru asked, truly interested. Because Veldanava left the rules in place. Did you just think the voice of the world was randomly there? Or that the skill system makes sense without a higher purpose? No, there will be a new god and it won't take too long for it claim its rightful place in this world. Kami answered and made the group think. So, if we help your chosen one, I can call on him when I need him? Raimuru asked. Yep. That's the way it works, Kami said with a pleased smile. Okay then, I am sold. Raimuru answered after a small exchange with Raphael, who confirmed what Kami was saying. Kami held out her right hand and a contract emerged. Great, sign above your name and channel your magicules into your hand for a handprint, please. Raimuru obeyed, but he asked a question. Well, now that this is decided, shouldn't we stop them? Kami chuckled, let the boys play. 
What followed would be described as the decimation of Jura. All of the onlookers decided to join in on the action and multiple friendly battles erupted around the forest. Milam coaxed Veldora into a fight, she and went all out against Kurama, Hakuro ended up fighting Naruto after Benimaru was defeated. Diablo ended up knocking Hakuro out after 10 minutes and fought playfully against Naruto, who he found very intriguing. In short, the strongest members of the Jura Tempest Federation laid waste to the Great Forest of Jura. Luckily, the town managed to survive the rampage of the dragons, demons, Kijin and Shinobi. Naruto woke up the next day tucked into the massive bust of Shion. They were passed out on a table with mugs still in hand. Unfortunately, Naruto's head was underneath the massive bust, which meant one side of his face hurt from being pushed into the table all night. A great hangover made Naruto's vision swim and his stomach churned before his vision cleared and he was able to take in the town. People were laid out drunk all over the city as the sun started to crest over the remaining trees of the great Jura forest. Smoke still billowed up in areas, powerful, residual concentrations of magicules hung in the air and Trainee was running around screaming about her precious forest. Naruto gave Shien's shoulder a gentle tap to wake her up, but the purple-haired beauty rolled into a pile of her own drool and stayed asleep. Naruto chuckled and went out to calm Trainee down. Trainee took Naruto to the center of the destruction where he sat down on the scorched landscape and relaxed into a meditative position. He noticed that all of his altars were out of the seal, which means they were probably passed out amid the collection of creatures that decided to celebrate the new alliance. Naruto purged his hangover, calmed his energy and focused on taking in the residual magicules from the surrounding area. He played with them in his system and got used to the feel of them as they mixed with his chakra. After familiarizing himself on a deeper level with the magicules, he was able to get the potent magical energy to flow naturally alongside his chakra. As soon as he was able to do this, he felt the familiar surge of energy that reminded him of sage mode. Naruto stood and kept collecting his chakra and infusing it with magicules. Once he reached critical mass, he called out Makuten, deep forest emergence before he slammed his hands on the ground and channeled all of his collected magicules and chakra into the ground. Trainee watched, truly astounded, as a new forest brimming with life energy emerged in a circle around Naruto. The new trees grew and spread and grew some more until her whole vision was filled with a dense forest. Trainee sighed contentedly at the feel of Naruto's chakra infused into the trees of the forest. It was peaceful, natural and beautiful in a way that was alien, yet completely welcome. She took joy in noticing the new plants, flowers and trees that were now a part of her forest and she knew the animals would love this new addition. That was how the Great Jura Forest got its own subdivision that would later be known as the Forest of Death due to the larger than normal creatures that would feast on the chakra and magicule rich environment. Trainee tackled Naruto in an excited hug as the voice of the world evolved his unique skill into an ultimate skill called Keeper of the Forest. When his skill evolved, he felt it was more natural for him to absorb and play with magicules and he noticed that magicules had integrated themselves into his chakra pathway. Naruto rose from the ground with Trainee hanging from his back like an adoring fangirl and he returned to Tempest. Upon his return to Tempest, all of the creatures gathered and bowed to him. Flashes of drunken memories flittered through his head as images of a raucous party filled with adorable monster girls stamped themselves on his brain. He was guided toward the conference room in the town hall and when he entered, he saw all of Tempest's most important people gathered there along with Kami. Evidently the goddess took advantage of this impromptu vacation in another god's realm and left Minato in charge. The morning was filled with negotiations as the contract was drafted and solidified. Raimuru was the manager of the contract for this realm and Naruto would be the manager in the elemental nations. Kami created a link between worlds to make it easier to travel between them. Kaijin, Garm, Dord, Murd and Kurabe were highly interested in the few Injutsu seals that Naruto knew. A mutual trade agreement was made for sealing knowledge in return for runic knowledge. It would be a long time before the two would be interchangeable due to the different power sources of the techniques, but there was also a smithing exchange. In honor of the new alliance, Kaijin presented Naruto with a unique blade that he had named Ryuoko, which means Dragon's Roar. It was made from Veldora's chipped tooth and magisteel, so it channeled energy proficiently. Naruto was excited to replace his wakazashi with this blade and incorporate it into his twin rampaging dragon tails kenjutsu style. Naruto agreed to a summoning system that would require him to respond within one of his standard days, which was evidently only four hours in the cardinal world according to Kami. Due to this difference in time, it would let Raimuru assign available assets to answer Naruto's summons without inconveniencing him too much. He could make requests for specific summons and Raimuru would send them if they were available. There was no limitation on the summons except that Naruto would have to pay the chakra price for the summoning and it would require consistent chakra for any summons to remain in the elemental nations. All in all, 
it was a really good deal for Naruto, and he was excited to bring the Kijin and others over to explore. An, I don't plan on make this a total crossover. I am simply a huge fan of Tenshura and thought that it would be a cool summoning pact. If this story gets enough leverage, I will do a follow-on where the adult Naruto joins Raimuru for the Tempest Holy War arc. Forest of Death, one week after initial disappearance, Naruto appeared in the clearing of the Forest of Death after collecting his altars and Kurama, who had become best buddies with Diablo as a fellow demon. Naruto shook off the disorientation and was surprised to see Tsunade, Shizun, Ino, Tamari, the Subacus, Itachi and a couple others training in the clearing. He was tackled to the ground by Ino and Tamari before he completely shook off the disorientation. Everyone gathered around him to hear the story of the new world and summoning contract that Naruto was able to get, except he left out Kami's involvement. To quell their curiosity and disbelief, Naruto weaved through hand seals and nicked his thumb before slamming his right hand on the ground. To his surprise, Trainee and Treya answered his call. The two dryads waved at the stunned audience before they collaborated Naruto's story. They fawned over Naruto like he was their master, which made Ino and Tamari grow tick marks. After all, they were still only teenagers and these beautiful tree ladies were clinging all over their man. After introducing themselves to the group, Trainee and Treya returned to the cardinal world. With their curiosity satisfied, Tsunade stomped over and bonked Naruto on the head. Do you know how worried we were about you, brat? Naruto rubbed the bump on top of his head, sorry, mama, it was only one day over there. I just wanted to shut the toads up is all. Yeah, well, they aren't taking it well, brat. Jiraiya is throwing a temper tantrum and the council was waiting for your return. I was to bring you to the council once you returned. Tsunade informed him. Ah, do I have to? Naruto whined childishly. I am so done with those old farts. Tsunade barked out a laugh, ha ha, sure thing brat. Sadly, yes, we must deal with the council. Kinji can only protect us so much. Don't worry, I have already informed him of the likely topic, and he will be arriving in two weeks to back us up, Naruto sighed, fuck it. Ladies, will you be able to stay over tonight? I am staying at your compound, Ruto. Tamari deadpanned. I will tell daddy, Ino said excitedly before kissing him lightly on the lips. Itachi stepped forward, it may have only been a day there, Ruto, but you missed out on a week of training. Give me 300 clones before you go. 20 for me Ruto. Shizun called out. I learned something cool that I want to show you. 20 for us. Konkuro added, I need target practice for Crow, Black Ant, and Sparrow. I will take 10 wood clones for Taijutsu practice. Gara requested. Naruto sighed and made a show that his friends were treating him like some sort of draft horse. He created the requested clones that also made a show of complaining before joining their assigned targets. He then disappeared in a shunshine alongside Tsunade. Council chambers, 10 days after prelims, Naruto walked in alongside Tsunade and reported into the council. Naruto noticed that Itachi was sitting at the right hand of the Hokage, Jiraiya was standing next to the elders, Fugaku looked upset, and the council seemed agitated. Hiruzen waited for Tsunade to take her seat at the council and Naruto decided to form a seat to relax and wait for the shit show to start. Boy, you will stand in front of your elders in council. Homura began before he was cut off by Hiruzen. That is quite all right, Homura. He just got back from a journey to a summoning realm, Hiruzen said, blowing yet another secret to the damnable council. What summons did you gain, boy? Koharu asked condescendingly. Nunya. Naruto answered plainly. Koharu looked confused. I have never heard of a Nunya summoning clan. Naruto smiled glibly when he saw Shikaku groan, you may know it better by its full name. It is called Nunya fucking business. Naruto couldn't stop the chuckles that escaped his throat, especially when the elders and civilians acted up. Naruto winked at Tsunade and the other clan heads that were suppressing their laughter, except Sume who was howling. Naruto continued over the howling laughter. Besides, you two old farts are no longer part of this council. The vote was taken to remove you and I see no reason for you to be here. Hiruzen called order back to the council as Naruto reclined in the wooden rocker he made. Hiruzen gave Naruto a stern look, please refrain from inciting my council, Mr. Senju. I have asked Koharu and Homura to be here for the remainder of my tenure. Now, summons are council business so we will start on that front. What summons do you have? Naruto looked at Tsunade, who gave a nod, before looking at the Hokage. It is an individual summoning contract with the Jura Tempest Forest. You will receive no further explanation because it is a unique summoning contract. Shikaku glanced up as he lifted his head off the desk. You allied with a forest? Naruto shrugged, more specifically, 
The creatures of the forest. Shibi Abarame met Naruto's gaze and Naruto nodded. Yes, Lord Abarame, there are some unique insects in that forest. Some of them are sentient as well since they were named by the leader of that forest. Shibi hummed with excitement and anticipation. May I invite you to a formal dinner at the Abarame compound to discuss this further? Shibi didn't care about the objections and rules of the council, he needed this for his clan. Naruto smiled, completely different from how he interacted with the rest of the council. Yes, you may. I have a couple experiments with your bugs that I wish to try. Hiruzen coughed, so, other than bugs, what other types of creatures can you summon? All creatures are sentient and requested privacy. This isn't a servitude contract, it is a mutual summoning agreement. Now, for what other reason have I been called here? Naruto asked in monotone. Because you caused an incident with Iwa, boy. Homura was literally scowling now. He had enough of this brat. First Donzo, then everything that he had done to cause their deposal and now the downright disrespectful attitude. Oh, shut the fuck up and listen Homura. You are not an elder, you are a guest. I hold higher standing in this village than you, so you will stop referring to me as boy before I put you in the retirement home where you belong. Naruto stood from his chair and challenged Homura. Hiruzen stood and flared his aura while Itachi appeared in front of Naruto and put a comforting hand on his shoulder that told him to take it no further. Silence remained in the council chambers, but it was clear that the Hokage wasn't pleased. Naruto, enough of that. During your absence, Iwa sent a letter of reprimand and asked for you to be removed from the Chunin exams. Okay, so remove me, Naruto said, not giving a flying fuck. He made it through most of his previous life as a Janan, despite the fact that he had fought and killed multiples rank ninjas. Hyashi asked the question on everyone's mind. You don't want to be promoted to Chunin? Naruto, you clearly deserve it. Naruto chuckled dryly. Then asked the Hokage why I haven't been granted a promotion. I am sure you already know I could have earned a field promotion. That begs the question why I am in the Chunin exams, other than to support my teammates. Of course, it is most probably because of the publicity and earnings that Konoha gains from me being in the exams. Silence, dead silence as Naruto called the Hokage on his bluff in front of the council. Finally, Hiruzen's sigh echoed around the council, damn it, Naruto, must you treat me as an adversary? Naruto didn't respond. We have denied Iwa's request and told Onoki it was because of the improper conduct of their own Kunoichi. We will need to negotiate recompense for the injuries to their Janan. Naruto cocked an eyebrow. Recompense? When my own grandmother and member of this village council provided them healing free of charge. They were able to walk out of the arena that night. Grow a spine and tell the old fence sitter to go sit on a cactus. They sent that team here with a mission to cripple or kill me or the ones I love. If you want to shut the old fuck up, look into his granddaughter. She was promoted to Chunin like two years ago. This drew murmurs from the council, but Naruto knew it was true from his previous life. It was Inoiki that stood up and spoke in Naruto's defense. While there might be implications, Naruto's actions stopped the Yamanaka clan from calling for war. They deserve nothing and should get nothing from us. Shikaku backed up his friend, but he needed a question answered first. How do you know that Naruto? Next, I agree with Inoiki that your intervention was appropriate, if your methods weren't a little extreme. Hmm, Iwa is a known enemy of the sand. I lived in Suna for years. Ask Rasa for his file on the girl. She is a Jonin class Kunoichi and I am going to destroy her in front of her grandfather. Before you throw a fit, grow a backbone and understand the situation. Iwa has no allies and no backup. We are allied with Suna and Kumo and on good terms with Water Country and Wave Country. Naruto chastised the council. While you make good points, it is not wise to needlessly antagonize a great power, Naruto, Hyashi cautioned. Then couldn't you reverse that logic and tell Iwa that it isn't wise to antagonize three great powers while attempting to kill the heir of the Senju clan and fourth Hokage? Naruto shot back and shut Hyashi up, a little more harshly than he intended to. However, it effectively got his message to the council, who seemed to agree with his way of thinking. Why not use this opportunity to demonstrate that while Konoha desires peace, no country should mistake our kindness for weakness. Show Iwa how much they stand to lose if they oppose us and offer them a taste of what life would be like if they laid old grudges to rest. You say that, but you nearly crippled three of their shinobi, Hiruzen said wearily. So what? I know you're old but come on. Where is the god of shinobi? Where is the professor? Where is Hiruzen motherfucking Sarutobi? Naruto asked, raising his voice as he went. The shinobi council was stunned, Jiraiya was gobsmacked, the civilian council didn't know what to do with ninja affairs, and Hiruzen was hanging his head in shame. 
Stunned silence followed Naruto's provocations until Tsunade spoke softly. That is enough, Ruto. Let Sensei go. Fine, is there anything else? Naruto said calmly. Yes, I have informed the Council of the Prophecy, Jiraiya said, earning a groan from Naruto. Jiraiya, I gave you so many chances. You are so one-track minded that it astounds me. Tell me, Jiraiya, if you go so far to enforce a prophecy, isn't that counterproductive or self-fulfilling? If you follow this path, grandfather, I will make you regret it, Naruto said in a tone slightly more polite than a growl. Hiruzen decided to back up his student. Naruto, the great prophecies of the toads are not to be taken lightly, Naruto laughed out loud. A child trained by the toad sage will bring a great revolution to the world of ninja. If guided toward the light, the new day will smile upon the world. If left in the shadow, the shinobi world will end in suffering and misery. Naruto let that sink in. Now, Jiraiya, I am the third child you have claimed to be your prophesied one. Nagato, my father and myself. Nagato is still alive and living in Amei, my father died to protect me, and this village and I would have been left in the shadow if it weren't for my own actions, Jiraiya stuttered, clearly not expecting Naruto to know this information. How? Tsunade face palmed as Naruto laughed loudly and said, I have friends in high places. Is all that true, Lord Jiraiya? Shikaku asked. I, um, he, uh. Jiraiya's head fell. Yes, that was the prophecy. I have reports that my previous student, Nagato, is dead though. He isn't dead. If you spent more time with your network and less time in brothels or peeping maybe it would be more effective. For this council's consideration, Nagato led a group of revolutionaries in Amiga Corps. Donzo stepped right in it and stopped peace talks between Hanzo and the group called Akatsuki. Donzo was responsible for a betrayal that led to one of the head members of the organization dying, which made Nagato, a Rinnegan wielder, go mad. I don't know how many of Civil Wars followed, but Nagato killed Hanzo in single combat four years ago. Now, that student that Jiraiya left in the dark is leading a group of class missing ninjas in an attempt to capture the Bijou. Shove your prophecy up your ass and leave me alone you warty toad. Truth be told, Naruto regretted the way things were going with Jiraiya. He wanted his god slash grandfather back, but he needed the man to let go of this prophecy bullshit. He will never forgive the toads, period. Unless Jiraiya let that go, he would continue opposing him. He looked around the council room, seeing his point was made. Even the Hokage looked shocked by the revelations, probably not hearing the full story from his desperate student. Finally, Hiruzen caught himself, thank you for that information, Naruto. We will work to validate it, though we will need to discuss where you are getting your information from. I will inform the incoming Hokage when the time is right. Naruto responded quickly. He has not repeatedly broken my trust. I am still your Hokage, Naruto, Hiruzen said firmly, but he saw Naruto remaining silent. Fine, we will discuss this later. The final item to address was the approval of your marriage contract to Subaku no Tamari. We have voted to approve this, with dual citizenship for Konoha and Suna, any children will be members of Konoha, and the other standard attachments like peace until the end of such a marriage or some egregious betrayal. Naruto scoffed, members of Konoha? Funny how that word sounds like property. Whatever, I am sick of kicking your butt in verbal debates. I will accept that for now if Suna will. The whole council winced at the jab, but Tsunade growled as she missed that bit of information. She would have to make sure Rasa puts an escape clause in the contract. Tsunade decided to take the attention off of Naruto. Very well, the Senju clan is happy to hear our request has been accepted. I am sure Rasa will be available for any necessary amendments and I will share the good news with him, Tsunade said before sitting back down and waiting for the damnable meeting to end. Set up. After the accursed council meeting the day prior, Naruto was in a foul mood. Luckily, he had two wonderful women to cheer him up and they came up with something that would be truly entertaining. He has just gotten back from making a reservation at the Golden Leaf, which was the first phase of the plan. Luckily, he was able to convince the owner to move some reservations around and he came up with a private booth on the balcony that provided a great nighttime view of the city. Phase 2 was in effect as he was finishing up a training session with Itachi. The guy was a brutal trainer, and he was also a ninjutsu and genjutsu genius. Naruto lamented the fact that he still couldn't perform many genjutsu despite his vastly superior chakra control. Naruto had to focus on high BNA rank genjutsu, which were very hard to learn when he couldn't really put the basic genjutsus into practice. Naruto was in the cooldown phase as he was slowly dismissing his clones that were conducting various training exercises. As he was dismissing his clones, he did some calisthenics before meditating to collect his thoughts and focus the lessons learned from the day's training. 
He cracked his eyes open to see Itachi meditating alongside him with a peaceful look on his usually placid face. Itachi cracked an eye open as he sensed Naruto beginning to stir. Hey, sensei, I have something to tell you. The group of us splurged and want to take you to dinner at the Golden Leaf tomorrow at 6 p.m. It is formal attire, and you can't say no, Naruto said happily. Itachi smiled, that was nice of you. What is the occasion? He asked politely. Naruto had an excuse prepared, well, sensei, you got our rookie team to the Chunin exam finals. Also, we wanted to give you a congratulations for your nomination as the 5th Hokage. Itachi's smile grew before it changed into a coy look. You know, Ruto, I think you provided more actual training than I did. Naruto waved him off. Nah, sensei, you let me lead the workouts and provided key pointers. You could have been like Kakashi and prevented us from doing anything. Then you brought in the other teams and made the rookies a true family. You deserve a small show of our gratitude, Itachi laughed lightly. Well, thank you Naruto. I will be there. Tell me, once I become the Hokage are you going to bust my balls like you do to Lord Third? Naruto chuckled, nah, Itachi, unlike the old monkey you have never done anything to break my trust or earn my ire. I think I can make this village and world a better place if I work alongside you. Itachi reached over and ruffled Naruto's hair, you know, Ruto, I sometimes feel guilty for feeling this close to you when I remain distant from my own brother for most of our lives. Naruto shrugged, for what it's worth, I appreciate our bond. You were busy and you were dragged into the deep end of the shinobi life when you were still a kid. You only got a chance to breathe when you became a jonin sensei a couple months ago. It is not too late to make amends with the duck butt. Itachi frowned lightly at Naruto's statement. Sadly, I think it is. My brother is so torn between a sense of inherited superiority and a crippling inferiority complex. Naruto slugged Itachi on the shoulder, dude, I literally have three distinct personalities living in my head, not to mention a bijou. Nothing is beyond repair. Itachi smiled and grasped Naruto's shoulder before squeezing lightly, thank you, Ruto. I will give it a try after the exams. For now, I am content to focus on you. Elsewhere, Shizun, Tsunade, Ino, Hinata, Samui, Tamari, Sakura and Tenten were dragging Kurenai to the public baths after a girls-only training session. As they checked into the bathhouse, stripped their clothes and cleaned off before entering the baths, the girls were talking up Kurenai. Ino changed the conversation from training to the girls' favorite topic, so, Kurenai-sensei, do you have any suitors that have caught your attention? Tsunade scoffed, she isn't called the Ice Queen of Konoha for no reason. She has guys, nobles and daimyos chasing after her every day. Kurenai watched on helplessly as the talk of her love life escalated around her. I wasn't talking about guys chasing her, mama. I was talking about guys she actually is interested in. Ino shot back sharply. Tamari jumped in, all right, I can get behind this. Spill it, Kurenai. Who is your dream guy? Kurenai was about to respond when Hinata's voice cut in, I think Kurenai has a thing for Itachi sensei. He is so dreamy, manly and since he joined our training, he is really toned out. Oh yeah. Since Lady Tsunade cured his illness, he has looked much, much tastier. Shizun added with a perverted giggle. Kurenai's head was twisting back and forth as she watched her students and friends freely discuss her love life. I mean, I have Ruto, but Itachi Senpai is up there on the most eligible list, Tamari said with a far-off look. Samui made a slightly shy contribution, I, I think Lee is up there in the top tier since Ino changed his wardrobe. Mm, mm, his body is literally chiseled from marble. Now that he is wearing proper clothes and that sexy jacket, he is looking good. Tenten said looking directly at Samui. He still won't shut up about the flames of youth though. Sakura giggled, you can take the clothes off of the nut, but you can't take the nuttiness out of Lee. Not cool. Samui muttered. She had been spending quite a bit of time getting to know Lee recently. Once you get behind his mask, he is one of the most genuine guys ever with a heart of gold. Ah, somebody is smitten. Over Ruto already? Shizun asked, genuinely interested. Yeah, it was Ruto that pushed me toward Lee after he let me down easy. Tamari and Ino are lucky girls, she said wistfully. Ah, thanks sweetie. I wouldn't mind sharing him with someone sweet as you, but I am not complaining about more Ruto time. Now, Hinata, what's going on with you and Gara? Ino asked as she entered the bath of the hot springs. Hinata joined Ino and took a place next to Tamari. Well, I, I am kind of like Samui. Ruto shot me down and it hurt really badly. He had been such a nice guy to me, and he did so much for my clan. Then, he pointed out Gara and showed he is a real sweet guy, and he was right. He asked me out for a date after the Chunin exams end. 
This earned a round of coups and ahs from the girls. Tamari smiled and hugged Hinata, smashing two pairs of growing breasts together. I would love to have you in the family, Hinata. For what it is worth, he loves you like a kid sister. She tried to make sure the relationship with Naruto wouldn't end abruptly. Knowing from his memories of the past what his relationship with Hinata meant to him. Yeah, girlfriend, you are part of the family, so snag that snackable redhead and join the Subaku Senju craziness, Ino said, joining the hug and making a three-way compression of breasts that bulged in bulbous glory. At that moment, a crash was heard from the wall on the men's side of the hot springs. Tsunade scowled and jumped up onto the wall with her towel pulled over her chest to see Jiraiya giggling with a tiny trickle of blood. When Jiraiya sought Tsunade, consequences be damned, his head flew back and impacted the stone siding of the bath. Tsunade scowled, punched him hard in the balls and sealed him into a stasis scroll before she jumped back over to the women's bath. All right, pervert caught. I am going to lobotomize him to make sure he never remembers what he saw here, Tsunade said with a scowl. Ino perked up, um, mama, why don't we hand him over to the girls of the Yamanaka clan? We can do some memory modification, maybe remove his perversion and possibly make him gay for a year or so. She was rubbing her hands together mischievously as dastardly ideas flittered through her mind and out of her mouth. All of the girls were in agreement and the fixing of Jiraiya the perverted toad Sanin began right there in the baths. With the perverts removed from the vicinity, the girls enjoyed the rest of their bath until Ten Ten remembered the main reason they called for a girl's day. Um, Kurenai sensei I wanted to tell you that Hinata almost forgot to tell you about the thank you gift we got for you. Ten Ten said, looking to Hinata to take over. Um, oh yeah, well... Team 8 and Team 9 wanted to thank you for training us and helping us reach the finals. We have made reservations at the Golden Leaf tomorrow at 6 p.m., Hinata said shyly. Ino chirped, and us girls bought you a nice fancy dress to wear. You are going to love it. Kurnai cocked an eyebrow. I am flattered, girls. You didn't have to do that. Honestly, I don't know how useful I was in your training. It really seemed like Naruto, Itachi, Guy and Asuma did the most of it. PSH, you helped us girls a lot. Kurenai sensei It takes a woman with a woman's touch to train a proper kunoichi. You taught me genjutsu, positioning, tactics and how to be a proper support type kunoichi, Ino said boldly. Yeah, Kurenai sensei you taught me better chakra control, genjutsu and your taijutsu style Hinata added. Although I mainly use the juken, it was still good to know, and I was excited to expand my arsenal. Samui felt like she should join the praising, you are clearly a fine kunoichi, Kurenai. I have been impressed by your work ethic and you are doing extremely well in the joint workouts. Kurenai was blushing from the attention and praise, but the overload of praise had her partially subdued below the water and blowing bubbles. Thanks girls. I will be there. The next day at 5.30pm, Naruto showed up at Itachi's front door. He knocked on it and greeted Mikato before letting her know that he was here to walk with Itachi to dinner. A couple minutes later with some polite conversation, Itachi came to the front door dressed to the nines in a blue-black formal kimono with the Uchiha crest. His hair was tied into a man bun, and he was wearing formal sandals. Naruto wolf whistled at him as they walked out of the Uchiha compound. Naruto chatted casually with his sensei as they walked through the town toward the Golden Leaf. They made it inside the restaurant and Naruto sat in the small, patio booth next to Itachi. Itachi found it odd that it was a two-person booth but decided to say nothing about it. That was when the Naruto went up in a puff of smoke and Itachi was truly perplexed. Fifteen minutes earlier, at Kurenai's apartment, the girls were helping Kurenai get ready. A knock at the door was heard and Naruto walked in carrying a dozen red roses with a card buried in the bouquet. He whistled in an impressed and not perverted manner when he saw Kurenai in her ruby red, spaghetti strap dress. He handed her the bouquet and held out an elbow for her. Kurenai gave him an amused look and shooed him out of the room. Kurenai picked the card and read it before the girls could stop her in time. To a crimson princess, your ruby eyes are like jewels from the skies, shining down and dispelling the lies, lies that threaten to tear me apart, your eyes glistened and stole my heart, to the beautiful lady, fair and true, tonight I wish to extend an invite to you, an invite to eat and get to know, the one who appreciates and admires you so. Your not-so-secret admirer Kurenai began stumbling over her words as the girls pushed her out of the room toward a waiting Naruto. With a devilish grin, Naruto took Kurenai's shoulder and disappeared in a forest green flash. It would be discovered later that the Hiraishin flashed green when Naruto was using his chakra and red when Kurama's chakra was infused. Kurenai appeared on the patio roof of the restaurant next to Itachi when Naruto quickly said something before disappearing. Your bill is paid for, enjoy. P.S. You two are too good for each other to not give this a shot. 
Kurinai looked with amusement at Itachi, who shrugged and shot a smile at Kurinai. He stood, took her hand in his and placed a kiss on the back of her hand. You look breathtakingly beautiful, Kurinai. It would be my honor for you to join me for dinner, Itachi said smoothly. Kurinai was blushing furiously over the whole situation, which made her look even more beautiful in the setting sun. Why yes, I would L love too. Can you tell me if you wrote the poem? Itachi cocked an eyebrow with an amused smile on his face. He took the poem from Kurinai's fingertips and read it with a devious smile on his face. That is the work of Naruto. You wouldn't guess it, but he is quite the romantic. Although, he did an amazing job at describing my feelings. His look turned serious enough to show that he was actually interested. The two enjoyed a good dinner and Itachi was sure to splurge on one of the best bottles of wine the restaurant offered. They sat at the table, looking into each other's eyes and enjoying a delectable dinner. They ordered dessert and continued to prolong the date. They then took a walk through the town and Itachi shared a spot that Naruto shared with him. They shared their first kiss around midnight atop the 4th's head on the Hokage Monument. Hokage's office, one week to finals. Hiruzen walked into his office to start the day and found a sealed letter on his desk. He called his Anbu and Bor inspected the letter before clearing it and handing it to the Hokage. Hiruzen cautiously opened the letter to read a disturbing message. Hokage. The snake is planning to strike again at the finals. This time he will bring his village. Rumors say that he found some more support. Be on your guard. I have attached enough barrier tags that you can use to protect your important zones. Use the Senju boy to protect the stadium. We will be watching. Best of luck. Your friendly neighborhood watch. Hiruzen looked up at his Anbu squad. Get all the clan heads in my office along with every Anbu captain. You have one hour. Ichiraku Ramen Restaurant. Naruto had taken time overnight to transform Tucci's stand into a full-on restaurant. The original stand was placed in the back of a restaurant filled with identical tables made of Naruto's wood release. The other rookies found silverware, glasses, tablecloths and some decorations to fill out the restaurant. Kuji worked with his parents to provide stoves, ovens and other kitchen amenities. Naruto ordered enough ingredients for a week of non-stop cooking and Tsunade created menus for the tables along with some healthier options. Ayame and Tucci showed up at their stand and were truly baffled. They looked around aimlessly for their stand, confused out of their minds and an inch away from panicking. Then, Naruto's group jumped out of their hiding spots and shouted surprise. Tucci jumped out of his shoes and Ayame clutched a hand over her mouth. Naruto walked forward jingling a set of keys and handed them to Tucci, who was a second away from passing out due to overstimulation. Look, old man, I know you haven't known us for very long. My mother used to love this restaurant and it is one of my favorites. We came together to get this ready for you and I hope you aren't upset, Naruto said in his traditional sheepish pose. Tucci was stuttering, unable to form words so Ayame repeated two simple words over and over again while crying tears of joy. Thank you. The group gave Tucci and Ayame the tour of the new and improved Ichiraku's ramen. The two were overcome with gratitude throughout the tour and remained in a state of light shock for the whole day. Tucci insisted on providing free meals to the group, as much as they could eat. Naturally, this started a ramen eating contest between Naruto, Gara, Amoe, Kuji, and Lee. 163 bowls of ramen later, Gara, Amoe, Lee and Kuji were passed out with ramen noodles dribbling out of their mouths. Naruto was clutching an overfull stomach, but he was grinning victoriously. Morning of the Chunin Exam Finals the rest of the one-month intermission passed in a flash as the lively atmosphere around the Senju compound filled in any breaks in Naruto's training. Currently, the Senju compound was hosting his extended family from Wave, the Subacus, Team Yugito, I, Daru, Mabui, damn that woman was fine, and Naruto really wished he got to know her in his previous life, Kinji, Madame Shijimi, Kinji's daughter Kaori, the Wind Daimyo and his wife and Kiyami to round things off. Shadow clones of Naruto ran everywhere for the past three weeks preparing meals, making sure the guests had everything they needed, dodging glomming attacks from Kiyami and Kaori and so much more. It was refreshing to see the Senju compound bustling with so much life. It was honestly distracting from the exams, but he wasn't too worried about that. He had been more worried about fulfilling the sealing jobs given to him by the Hokage after the old monkey took his threats of invasion seriously. Naruto noticed the Jonin and Anbu patrols increasing around the village, and he had upgraded village security as much as he reasonably could. With the plan to debut his Makutan bloodline in the exams, Naruto created extra defenses around the village, which drew far more unwanted attention than he normally received. He put up with it in order to make sure that he mitigated as much damage as possible for the sake of his friends and their families. 
Most of his close family knew about Makutin already, but I was keenly interested in this ability, and he was upset that he only recently found out. The fourth rakage was more disappointed than ever that Samui's seduction mission had failed, but after speaking to Naruto at length he saw the futility in the underhanded attempt. The boy was a human lie detector, incredibly genuine and honestly funny to be around. I couldn't remember the last time he had laughed so much or had so much fun. Flashback, two days ago. I had arrived the previous night and received a generous greeting at the front gates and an invitation to stay at the Senju compound. He readily accepted the invitation and was overjoyed to hear that Naruto would be hosting one of his infamous CrossFit sessions the following morning. After a long night of mingling and drinking, I went to sleep dreaming of a new kind of workout. I dragged Mabui and Daru out of bed for the 6am CrossFit workout. He was surprised to see nearly 50 people attending the workout and he was even more surprised to see Naruto leading the whole thing. With names like Tsunade, Mike Guy, Asuma Sarutobi, and Itachi Uchiha, I had presumed that one of them would be leading the workout. He joined the morning calisthenic exercises and warm-up. The usually large training ground felt cramped with this number of people. As Naruto stood to address the group, he paid rapt attention to the boy. All right everyone, welcome to CrossFit this morning. Since we have a couple special guests in attendance, I wanted to do something special. Fire Lord Kinji, Lord Rakage, Daru of the Black Lightning, Mabui of the Milk Chocolate and everyone else, welcome to the Filthy 50. I laughed as he heard the groans from those in attendance and he wondered what the big deal was. Then, he saw Naruto weave through hand signs and place his hand on a seal array. Suddenly, I found himself face first on the ground as the 300 pounds he carried on each wrist in the form of his golden wrist bracers dragged him to the ground. The group struggled mightily to suppress their laughter, but they lasted mere seconds before the whole CrossFit group broke out into guffaws. What did you do, Senju? I groaned out. My apologies, Lord Rakage. I thought those wrist weights would be chakra-based. I activated the chakra null zone, which disables all use of chakra. Without your natural chakra reinforcement, that much weight is unmanageable. Naruto explained, struggling to suppress his laughter as the hulking man dug his face out of the ground and Mabui went over to help him remove the wrist weights. I stood up and shook his arms out before fixing a fiery glare on Naruto. Well, a little warning next time. Why disable the use of chakra? Naruto broke into an abbreviated version on the reasoning behind disabling chakra. He also provided I with some basic wrist and ankle weight since I insisted on at least matching what the advanced members were wearing. The advanced members wore a 50-pound vest with 10 pounds on each limb. Naruto then explained the filthy 50 to the group and had everyone find a teammate. I insisted on being Naruto's teammate, which Naruto readily agreed to. I watched with interest as the young blonde panted and sweat through the workout, finishing the filthy 50 in 10 minutes and 47 seconds. I was bouncing like a kid on crack candy for his turn to perform the workout. Naruto cast a knowing grin in his direction and waited until it was time for the second group. A panting Daru came over and tried to offer a word of caution to I, but the rakage waved him off and said he didn't need to listen to a lazy sissy. Daru's usually lazy face took on a maniacal grin and he moved over with Mabui to join the rakage's starting station for a front row seat to the show. I started the workout at a dead sprint, dedicated to living up to his title of fastest man alive. Unfortunately for him, that was the pitfall of this workout, and he was not used to being separated from his chakra. His muscles burned like never before and his lungs heaved trying to take in the required oxygen as he began his final workout as the clock struck 10 minutes. Eyes eyes lit up with a fiery determination as he heard Naruto call out, 50 burpees and you're done. I pushed himself past the breaking point as he blurred from a jump clap to a prone position and back to a jump clap. Eyes vision was getting blurry due to the lack of oxygen to the brain and the rapidly changing elevation as he continued through the exercise. Finally, he heard Naruto call out 50 and his whole world went black. I, for the first time since his Janan days, passed out form a workout. The rakage came to a minute later with an amused-looking Tsunade performing a medical jutsu on him outside of the chakra null zone. Quite the workout, huh I? Tsunade said with a shit-eating grin on her face. I slapped one of his massive hands over his face. Holy shit, your brat is evil. Tsunade bellowed out a laugh, that is what everyone says right after his workouts. Then they come back for more. Look at those Janan, I... Those Janan are better prepared than anyone from our generation and we were brought up in the warring days. I, still lying on his back, rotated his head and watched the group finish up their workouts with shouts of encouragement coming from their teammates and those that already finished. He couldn't stop a smile from emerging on his face. That kid is something else, Tsunade. To think about how much he has already changed our world. Tsunade got a far off look in her eyes and a big smile on her face. 
I know, I, I am proud of him. Why does my body feel so sore already? I asked randomly. Ha ha, because you are not used to being separated from your chakra. When I was explaining the chakra circulatory system to him, he came up with this bright idea. It builds up the natural muscle and strength of the body tens of times faster than your standard workout with chakra. Then, when your chakra returns and accelerates the body's healing, you get all of the bonuses with an enhanced healing rate. It also boosts yang chakra like crazy for some reason. Sunade explained. No shit, I said in amazement. How much would it cost to have the kid come to Kumo and install some of these null zones? Ns rank per zone. Sunade answered with money symbols in her eyes. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. That was crazy expensive, but if it produced such good results then it would be worth it. And how much for the seals that Samui and Amoe showed me? $1,000 per set. Sunade answered right away before adding. With a $2,000 trip charge. I laughed heartily, what do you do with all that money? Sunade looked lost in thought before she answered, hmm, let's see, we fund a total of 24 orphanages that house over 400 children, we have a couple charities that help out the less fortunate, we have a spy network for the neighborhood watch, we have two medical research divisions, we have a female clothing business, we have an inner-country fuinjutsu business and a couple other things I am sure I'm forgetting. Ai's jaw hung open and he looked up at Tsunade, why? Because we have the power and resources to do so. Naruto drove me to help as many people as we could. Once the money from his seals started pouring in, we worked with Kinji, Hodo and Kaisa to help as many people as we could. How? I asked in further astonishment. Tsunade chuckled, the shadow clone jutsu powered by the endless chakra of the Kyuubi and a will to use it. Are you sure I can't get your kid to marry someone from Kumo? Ha ha, sorry I. Naruto is dead set on only marrying for love and he already has two women that will love him forever. He already feels guilty enough for asking them to share and I support his decisions in that regard. Tsunade answered softly. Damn, Samui was really broken up when he ended things, I said, slightly pouting. Yeah, she is a great girl. If there were any girl that stood a chance at breaking into Naruto's heart, she would have been the next in line. I perked up at that, but Tsunade simply shook her head in the negative. They rejoined the group and I participated in the follow-on meditation and chakra exercises, only to be further impressed by the nature of Naruto's training methods. End of flashback. I shook his head as he remembered falling face first into the ground and then passing out during a workout. He had snagged a Naruto clone and picked its brain about workout methods, philosophies, chakra reinforcement and other topics that interested the fitness enthusiast. He would need to make some changes to his bodybuilding regimen when he returned to Kumo. I was determined to stay in the Senju's good graces, and he was excited to see his Janan and Naruto perform in the finals. The Fire Lord Kinji had enjoyed his stay in Konoha, despite the drab council meeting that occurred the previous night. He made Itachi the official fifth Hokage of Konoha, which was going to be announced today. He couldn't help a frown from spreading over his face as he remembered the disappointments of two men that had previously held his trust. Jiraiya and Hiruzen simply refused to see reason and it caused him a fairly sizable headache. Kinji had to get forceful with the two when they complained about Naruto not prioritizing the needs of Konoha. He threatened to simply relieve Naruto of his hishiate and let him move to another country or village to simply shut them up. He made it clear to the pair that Naruto held more of Kinji's trust than the two of them combined. He also let the damnable council know that as well. Oh well, the worst of it would be over after today unless Naruto's warning came to pass. Naruto had told Kinji about the high probability of an invasion from the snake Sanin. Kinji had brought the Guardian 12 and some of his best samurai just in case. He reviewed the defensive measures that Konoha had taken with Shikaku Nara, Hiruzen and Itachi and was impressed by the level of preparedness. He could only hope that things didn't escalate too badly. Tsunade had run herself ragged playing host to so many people in her family's compound. Despite the exhaustion, it was great for her to see the Senju compound bustling with life once again. On top of playing host, she had secretly prepared the hospital for the invasion. The hospital had a double-layered barrier defense prepared and she had an Anbu squad on standby to lock the place down in the event of an invasion. The double layer would allow them to take in casualties without letting enemy shinobi enter, which was a relief. As she walked to the stadium, she enjoyed the company of her important guests and all the stunned looks they garnered. She was proud of her grandson and wanted him to own the day. Sure, she had bet sizable money on each of the matches, and she was excited to cash in her winnings, but she wanted him to shine like the sun in his debut to the world. She would be attending the event with Kinji and Hodo from the Daimyo's box and she would be on standby for any serious casualties during the finals. 
she took advantage of the VIP status and used the in-booth betting station to place her gambling money on a combination bet for Gara, Shino and Naruto to win. The triple bet gave her 52 to 1 odd and she placed $1 million down without thinking twice about it. Ino was sad that she wasn't able to stand by Naruto's side in the finals of the competition. Seeing Kurotsuchi scowl at her made her remember how close she came to being maimed by the vindictive lava bitch and sent a shiver of fear down her spine. If it weren't for Haruto's quick actions, she would have, no, she couldn't think about it. The fact was that she had her soulmate and so long as he was around, she would be safe. As she focused on her love for the sun-kissed blonde, a familiar warmth encompassed her and quelled the fear that had started to take root. So, what you think, Shika? Who is going to bring this home? Ino asked in an attempt to distract herself. Shikamaru had noticed the increased security and tension around the village. He had taken mental notes of the looks and weariness on his father's face as well as the rest of the Jonin. He had a tingle at the back of his brain that told him something wasn't right. He had been distracted by scanning his environment and putting his super brain to use. Ino's question startled him out of his observation, and he responded. It's too troublesome to speculate Ino. I am pretty sure I know who will win the first round fights, but after that things will get crazy. Mentally he added, if we even get that far. TSK, you're no fun. What do you think, Kuji? Ino shifted targets. I think the safe bet is Naruto. After seeing how he one-shot that Iwa team it is safe to say that he would win if he took the fight seriously, Kuji said before downing the last of his trail mix. Kiba scooted closer and joined the conversation. If Naruto took this seriously, my mom said that he could destroy the stadium. I know everyone is strong, but that is just ridiculous. Leaving the Janan's conversation and moving to the cage booth, we find Rasa, I and Hiruzen chatting amiably about Naruto's training sessions. The talks halted abruptly when Onoki entered with his two bodyguards. One was Akatsuchi, a mountain of a man that looked like a giant from some kid's cartoon with that big-ass goofy nose in the center of his round face. The other guard was cloaked and masked in the typical uniform of a golem officer. Welcome, Onoki, it is good to see an old friend one last time as the Hokage, Hiruzen said cheerfully. Onoki scoffed, hello old monkey, why did you let the youngsters depose you? Now I am left alone to represent the old school. His tone was unusually playful, as if he were happy about something. Hiruzen shrugged, it was time for this old monkey to return to his tree and enjoy the quiet life. Maybe you could join me for a stiff drink and some peeping on a resort beach? Onoki trickled blood from his nose, to the amusement of the other cage. You know, that doesn't sound too bad. Let's see how today goes before I give you an answer. Onoki turned his attention to the other cage and gave them a small, brief nod. Rasa, I, long time no see. Rasa suppressed his feelings and replied in a stoic tone. Onoki, good to see you are still in good health. I simply nodded as a return of the greeting. Onoki put his hands on his belt. Well, I received this gift a while back that took away my back pain. Is it just me or are life-changing seals popping up all over the elemental nations? I, knowing who likely provided that gift, scoffed loudly. I think all our spies have reported an infuriating inability to gather information from each of our nations. It almost seems like the watch wants everyone to just mind their own business. Hiruzen nodded wearily, yes, truly vexing, that organization. I have tried for several years and spent millions of dollars trying to discover the identity of that organization. Rasa laughed internally, it was so obvious, and this old monkey was so blind. Well, I for one am happy for the help. Since our purge, I have never felt safer in my village. Onoki scowled at that, yes, but unlike the rest of us it seems Suna got some extra gifts. Tell me, Lord Kazekage, how did wine country suddenly gain so many oases? I find it astonishing that there was so much water in the desert. A family friend. Was Ross's simple reply. We can continue our conversation during the matches, I believe it is time to give the starting address, Hiruzen said before standing and walking toward the railing of the balcony. The stadium fell silent as Hiruzen's image came upon the big screen. Camera men around the stadium focused in on the Hokage's form and the Hokage projected his voice with chakra. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Konoha Chunin exam finals. Today we have representatives from four of the great five in attendance and there are a number of daimyos and influential dignitaries from around the nations in attendance. To our visitors, I open my arms to you and say welcome to Konoha. To my nation I say, thank you for letting me serve you over the past 58 years. My time as the Hokage has spanned from the Second Shinobi War to present and it is with great joy and pride that I announce my successor to you today. As the seasons change, new leaves bud and bring life, color and prosperity to the great tree. The old leaves wither and fall to the ground to become nourishment for new life to flourish on the great tree. 
I am an old leaf, in case you were wondering, and I wish to enjoy my swaying fall from the heights of our great tree. In my place, a promising new youth has appeared and caused a flourishing of new life. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Itachi Uchiha, the fifth Hokage of Kanahagakor no Sato. Itachi stepped forward wearing the full Hokage robe and hat with the kanji for fifth Hokage. He wore the Uchiha crest on his right lapel and the signal of Konoha on his left lapel. The back of his robe was bathed in red flames at the bottom with the kanji for fifth on the center of his back. Itachi always preferred a straightforward approach and had no need for elaborate nicknames. Itachi spread his arms and called for silence, which followed shortly thereafter. Thank you for the warm welcome. I would like to take a minute to thank Hiruzen Sarutobi for his dedicated service to Konoha and the Land of Fire. He was truly an amazing leader that kept the will of fire burning brightly and kept Konoha moving down the right path. Itachi paused and let the audience cheer for a couple minutes. Now today, we are all present to see the new leaves that have budded on our great tree as well as those from other nations. I look forward to a stunning display of skill and determination that we expect out of Chunin representing the great villages. Without further ado, let us commence the finals. Genma, if you would. Genma took over and made a show of introducing the finalists. He explained the rules of the fights, which were to be one-on-one, -on -one, no holds barred matches. The winner would be determined by fatality, knockout, surrender or if Genma determines a competitor is no longer fit to fight. After confirming that the finalists understood the rules, he called for Gara and Mitsuchi to remain on the field. Gara received multiple slaps on the shoulder, pats on the back and a kiss on the cheek from Hinata for good luck. There were catcalls around the stadium and an enraged looking Hyashi from the display, but the show must go on, as they say. Genma took the fighters to the center of the arena, which was a 100 meter in diameter circle speckled with a lake, a clove of trees, some boulders and a flat area in the center. Genma started the match to a magnificent roar from the crowd as the Iwa and Sunijanan commenced their fight. Mitsuchi immediately enveloped himself in steel and layered earth armor on top of it. Gara simply stood immobile with his arms crossed as he sent the cork of his gourd flying at Mitsuchi where it pinged harmlessly off of his armor. Mitsuchi took offense to the gesture and darted forward in an attempt to slam his fist into Gara. Gara had no need to move, no need to free his hands and no need to exert himself. Mitsuchi was strong and resilient, but he was far too slow to bypass Gara's sand. After making a mockery of the Iwa Janan for a couple minutes, Gara finished it off with an over exaggerated yawn. Are you done yet? He taunted, which earned laughs from the crowd and a scowl from Mitsuchi. Mitsuchi was in a bind, his whole specialty was reinforcement techniques and he had very little ninjutsu prowess to back it up. He usually counted on slugging it out with his opponents and relying on his impenetrable armor to outlast them. It was clear that his tactic wasn't going to work against this opponent. Very well, it is my turn, Gara said monotonously as he began to spin in a rhythmic dance. Sand flowed around him and followed every movement of his hands and arms as Gara used his enhanced magnet release to control the sands. He began making circular throwing motions with each of his arms. Each motion produced a sand shuriken that was the size of a standard Fuma shuriken. Mitsuchi began dodging the projectiles, but they just kept coming one after another. When the first one impacted, it hit with enough forces to draw blood through two sets of his armor. Gara, seeing his first attack landed, increased the speed of his spinning dance and sent a volley of over 40 sand shurikens directly at the tumbling Mitsuchi. Mitsuchi rolled with the momentum and attempted to dodge the volley, but it was futile. After dodging a few of the shuriken, he took 10 of them to his chest one after another. Gara has halted his spin to observe the results of his attack and he noticed Hinata clapping in the finalist box for his display. Gara's dance originated from Hinata's kata, and he applied the principles of the Hyuga's kaiden to enhance his control of the sand. As the dust cleared, Mitsuchi was back on his two feet, but blood was trickling out from underneath his earthen armor. One of the shuriken had impacted his face and he was bleeding for a sizable gash on his left cheek. The Iwa Janan licked the blood and spat it onto the floor before taking a defensive stance. Gara simply cocked an eyebrow at his opponent. Are you a glutton for punishment? I have clearly demonstrated the ability to wound you and you cannot bypass my defenses. I would suggest surrendering, Gara said in his usual monotone. In his head, Shukaku was howling in laughter at the pathetic look of defiance on the Iwa Janan's face. Shut up, an Iwa Shinobi never gives up, no matter the odds, Mitsuchi yelled, sounding more like a petulant child than a battle-hardened warrior. Very well, I will end this, Gara said as he stomped the ground. As Gara's foot impacted the ground, globules of sand rose from all over the arena and responded to his call. Like iron responding to a magnet, the sand resonated with Gara's chakra and swirled around him. Gara bent low and raised both hands above his head while calling out Great Sand Waterfall. 
a tidal wave of sand spanning nearly half of the stadium rose from Gara's position and towered over Mitsuchi. The Iwa Janan braced for impact knowing that he couldn't outrun or dodge the wave of sand. A colossal roar echoed as the sand tidal wave crashed into Mitsuchi's position and continued forward in a powerful slam into the wall. The sand slackened enough to show Mitsuchi struggling to his feet with his armor almost completely destroyed. Gara cupped both of his hands before bringing them together in a clinching motion. As he did this, the sand responded and formed a headless coffin around Mitsuchi. Surrender, Gara said plainly. Never, Mitsuchi spat defiantly. Gara looked at Genma, who was munching on a senbone. Proctor, are you going to call the match? Gara held his hands in the clinched position as Genma walked slowly over the newly created sand dune to where Mitsuchi was being held. Genma wrapped his knuckles on the hardened sand and whistled before he announced the victor. Winner by immobilization, Subaku no Gara. In the cage's box, Rasa was clapping proudly for his son's display of strength. Behind him, Chio and Pakura clapped politely as well. I gave a nod of approval, your child displayed an amazing control over the sand, Rasa. That was truly impressive. Yes, it has been a pleasure to work with Gara over the last month, Lord Kazekage. He has a lot of untapped potential. Itachi added from his Hokage seat. Hiruzen, seated at Itachi's right, added, Rasa, how did you train up his control of magnet release so much at a young age? I dare say his control almost rivals your own. Rasa chuckled, you should know the answer to your own question, Hiruzen. My son's best friend is Naruto and they have been training together since they were six. Tsunade's chakra control technique allowed him to harness the power of his magnet release along with his earth affinity. I barked out a laugh, that kid is his fingers in everyone's pie. Truly was a remarkable display, I think there is no doubt he is fit to be Chunin. A round of concurring statements later had Gara marked as a show-in for Chunin. Onoki decided to get some information, has the Senju boy helped everyone except Iwa? Don't take it personally, Lord Tsuchikage. He asked if it would be appropriate to open communications with you, but we were concerned about the grudge your village bears towards the boy. Your granddaughter reaffirmed our decision during the preliminaries, Itachi said calmly. Onoki scoffed, it was a fight. She was simply going to finish her opponent off before the Senju boy intervened. I still expect compensation for that offense. Rasa scowled, that opponent is going to be a sister wife to my daughter. I was watching the fight, Suchikij. There was no need to further incapacitate her opponent and she looked right at Naruto before attempting her jutsu. Your teams also referred to him as demon on multiple occasions. Do not think such petty obfuscation will deceive us. As the Kijas engaged in a tense battle of words, Gara returned to the contestant's box and got a hug from an excited Hinata. Gara took her hand and placed a kiss on the backside of her hand before wishing her good luck in her fight. Karu and Hinata made their way down to the stadium floor for their fight. Everyone was interested in the outcome of this fight because it could go either way. Hinata took her place across from Karu and saw that the usually quiet Hyuga clan had started a wave. The wave wrapped around the stadium and made Hinata giggle. She was so happy that her clan had changed so much for the better. Genma slashed his hand down and started the fight. Karu drew her katana and dashed forward, Hinata unsealed her bow and dashed backward. Hinata repeated this process while loosing one arrow after another with precision accuracy to the roars of the crowd. Kairo could keep up with the arrows and used her sword to block the arrows she couldn't dodge. The relentless attack stopped her from closing the distance and using her sword to end the fight. Kairo sheathed her sword and weaved through hand signs while still attempting to close the distance with Hinata. Hinata saw the change and launched a triplicate of stun arrows at Kairo. The Hyuga clan was watching the new fighting style with looks of anticipation mixed with pride. This was the Hyuga clan's statement to the world that you could no longer predict what a Hyuga was going to do. Hinata's graceful dance around the battlefield made the clan, Hanabi and Hyashi swell with pride, despite the fact that she hadn't landed a decisive shot yet. Hyashi saw the technique Hinata was about to use, one of the first true techniques that the clan had developed. With use of the Byakugan and with predictive ability, three arrows were shot simultaneously at three of the most likely vectors. It would be nearly impossible for an unsuspecting opponent to dodge. Kairo finished her hand signs and called out lightning style, lightning ball as Hinata loosed her three arrows. The ball of lightning was closing the distance on Hinata when one of the stun arrows nailed Kairo in her right thigh. The lapse in concentration caused the lightning technique to dissipate and Kairo tumbled to the ground on her numb leg. The stun arrow used condensed chakra to overload the tenketsu in the region around the point of impact. Much like the Jukin, it injects the user's chakra into the adversary's chakra system to disable the flow of chakra, which is why the Byakugan is necessary for this technique. Hinata saw Kairo stumble, and she dashed forward, intent on using her bow as a close-range weapon. 
Kairu recovered in time to block a downward slash of Hinata's bow with her katana, but she wasn't ready for Hinata to slide her blade into the arrow catch and twist. Kairo was disarmed and Hinata dropped her bow before she dropped into the Jukin stance and said, You are within range of my divination, 8 trigrams, 64 palms. Kairo, recently disarmed and lacking a firm foundation, took the full force of the speedy and accurate Jukin attack. Hinata's technique ended with a duel, open palm Jukin strike to the chest and abdomen that sent Kairo flying backward with blood dribbling from her chin. Before Genma even called the matched, Hinata had dashed over and began reopening Kairo's important tenketsu. Genma called the match and medics joined Hinata on the field. After a minute, Hinata informed Shizun that she had opened most of the important tenketsu. The medics took Kairo to the infirmary and Shizun took over her case in an attempt to get her battle ready in case the invasion happens. In the Hyuga section, loud cheers were heard, and many clan members were congratulating Hyashi. The camera panned on a rowdy band of Hyugas that were throwing one of their children into the sky in celebration. It amazed many in the crowd to see the noble Hyuga clan acting in such a manner, but almost everyone cracked a smile at the change. Tsunade was pointing and laughing at the display alongside Kinji who couldn't believe the difference a year without the caged bird seal made. In the cage's box, I was clapping politely at the display. Let me guess, this was Naruto's doing too? Itachi chuckled lightly as Hiruzen responded. Yes, he created an alternate dojutsu protection method and was able to free the clan of their seals after the massacre. The surviving branch family accepted Naruto's terms of forgiveness for Hyashi, Hinata, and Hanabi. It was their price for being freed from the cursed seal. Rasa smiled proudly at the contestant's box. You may not like his father, Onoki, but you cannot deny that the boy is doing good things for the world. Not for my country, Onoki hissed under his breath. Itachi ignored the Tsuchikage and posed his question. Was that enough of a display for a promotion to Chunin? I nodded, I think so, but I would like to see her fight once more. She used her new techniques very well against a Kenjutsu user, was keenly aware of her battlefield positioning and she struck with lethal efficiency when the opening presented itself. Rasa agreed with I, she is off to a great start, and I would be tempted to promote her from that display alone, but I would also like to see more. Itachi concurred, very well, I will mark her as a favorable recommendation, and we will wait for her next fight. Onoki merely grunted at Itachi. Back in the arena, Genma projected his voice, will Shino Abarame and Maki Kamazura please come to the arena for your match? Naruto walked into the stairwell with Shino after letting Maki pass. All right Shino. I don't want you using your Senjutsu Hive yet since we haven't tested it. Feel free to use the Bijou bugs though. Shino put a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Thank you, Naruto. I truly appreciate all the help you have given my family and clan. I am excited to see what we can do with your summons when this is all over. Naruto clasped Shino's forearm. Just go win this thing and we will talk about that later. Good luck. Shino walked calmly into the arena and stared down one of his clan's greatest rivals. The Kamazura clan hated the Abarame because the Abarame nearly wiped out their clan during the Second and Third Wars. Now, it was time to settle this grudge match with international attention. Shibi saw his son walking forward and he began vibrating with excitement as his hive resonated with his emotions. Genma started the fight and immediately the two bug users poured insects out of their sleeves. The mid-air fight both disgusted and awed the audience as the initial clash of hives looked like a horde of mosquitoes flying around the arena. Each individual bug was winning or losing a battle that would contribute to the overall outcome of the bug war. Through the cloud of bugs, Maki saw Shino weaving through hand signs before he stomped on the ground and called out Earth Style, Muddy Labyrinth. From Shino's foot, the ground began turning to mud and walls erected around Maki. The walls rose nearly 15 feet in height and locked her in place. Maki panicked and wanted to jump while the ground was still solid, so she bounced from wall to wall and made it to the top of the earthen outgrowth as she left her bees to finish the fight. When Maki made it to the top, she knew that something was wrong. Flying around above the walls were dozens of red beetles. These bugs were much bigger, roughly five times bigger, than a standard kikaiku and they were twice the size of the Kamazura bees. Maki unleashed half of her remaining hive to counter the threat, but to her horror she saw the beetles tear through her bees and fly towards her. Shino, watching from atop one of the mud walls, saw his insects in range and sent the command to his bugs. The bijou bugs, as Naruto dubbed them, were formed from a colony that Naruto let form while he was practicing with Kurama's chakra. After many attempts, a queen finally survived the saturation of bijou chakra. The queen tripled in size and began laying red eggs. These red eggs developed into rapidly maturing beetles that had a 48-hour lifespan. As the queen took in more of Kurama's chakra, the beetles developed new abilities. 
one of the new abilities was the increased pincer size, which made them a physical assault type bug. The second thing was a hardened carapace and wings that made them incredibly durable as well as fire resistant. Finally, Shino found out that the beetles could detonate themselves. They naturally did this upon their death, which made them hard to manage and it made their habitat quite fickle. However, once the queen understood this, the beetles would leave the hive and detonate before their natural end came. Now, Shino harvested the hive, and they reside in a gourd underneath his cloak that is plants infused with Kurama's chakra. The queen sent the older bugs to head Shino's call and now the world was about to see the newly improved Aburame clan. As twelve beetles closed within five feet of Maki, they glowed a brilliant red before they each detonated with the power of a medium-yield explosive tag. The explosions that surrounded the Kamazura, immediately killed the bees and created a dust cloud atop the earthen walls. Onoki clenched his fists tightly enough to draw blood as Konoha displayed yet another remarkable innovation. His decision had been reaffirmed, the Senju boy needed to die. He watched his Kunoichi from one of Iwa's most prominent clans collapse to the ground, smoking from multiple burns on her body. To make matters worse, his shinobi are being embarrassed one after another on live television and his granddaughter had to fight the hardest opponent of them all. Onoki looked at his watch and realized that he needed to stall for time since the initial matches had progressed too quickly. TSK, yet another disappointment for my village. Hokage, I need to use the restroom and I believe there are many in the audience that would need the same, Onoki said just above a growl. Very well, Lord Tsuchikic. I will call for a 10-minute intermission. Will that be enough time for you to use the restroom, or do you need to sit? Itachi asked in his usual monotone. This drew snickers from the cages and their guards, even the masked Iwa guard. Onoki didn't even dignify that with an answer, so Itachi called a 10-minute intermission. Tsunade had money signs and hearts coming from her eyes as she looked adoringly at Naruto. All the brat had to do was win and she would have enough gambling money to last a couple years, even with her luck. Meanwhile, Kinji was sharing his frustrations with Hodo. Yes, it is most unfortunate that Naruto has already declared his love and future wives. I am close to the boy, and he didn't even take my daughter on a date, Kinji said. Hodo smirked, at least his niece had gotten a date. Well, I have not given up hope. Kiyami said that she is sure to win his heart in time. Kinji laughed heartily, ho ho ho, Hodo, have you not seen the stubborn streak in that boy? Not to mention the loyalty he displays to those he loves. I would not hold my breath if I were you. Hodo frowned at that, knowing the words to be true. He turned his frown into a smirk. I will simply give him escort missions whenever Kiyami wishes to travel. Given enough time, surely, he will find room in his heart for my lovely niece. Tsunade had recovered from her thoughts of future winnings and was listening in. I don't think so, Hodo, but I won't stop you from trying. The Senju clan will be more than happy to take your money though. Ho ho ho, Tsunade, you are too funny. Tell me, princess, is there a man in your life? Kinji asked while eyeing her closely. Not really, I am more focused on my career and re-establishing my clan, Tsunade said despite her blush. I do believe the lady doth protest too much, Kinji said trying to prod more information out of the Senju clan head. Oh, shut up and drink Kinji. Tsunade huffed before she downed a saucer of sake. She immediately purged it from her system since Naruto hadn't given her the all-clear yet. In the contestant's box, Naruto was trying to focus and spread his senses around the arena. The number of people made it very difficult to distinguish individual chakra signatures and there were too many emotions to sort through. He huffed, no he would need to go fully into sage mode if he wanted to get any valuable information. Unfortunately, his friends wouldn't leave him well enough alone during the break. As Samui and Tamari left the booth for their match, the Suna blonde jumped into Naruto's lap and placed a smacker of a kiss on Naruto that left him seeing images of 100 Tamaris when she sauntered her way to the railing of the contestant's box before flying on her fan down to the arena floor. Naruto smirked with pride as his fiancé showed off her skill for all the world to see. Lucky bitch. Samui muttered under her breath, looking back toward the booth to see Tamari making out with Naruto. Her spirits were lifted when Lee's voice sounded out from the rest of the crowd as he cheered her on. A silly smile cracked its way onto her face, and she shook her head when thinking about the fiery passion of that silly man. It contrasted so uniquely with her own cool personality. The crowd cheered like mad as the intermission came to an end and the two beautiful blonde Kunoichi squared off in the arena. Genma took his place as the two Kunoikas drew their weapons of choice. Samui's katana began to glow with lightning chakra and Tamari held up two decorated sensu, Japanese-style handheld fans. They were her mother's war fans and Naruto had used chakra engraving to enhance their control over the wind element. 
Tamari took a stance and flipped both fans open as Samui took a stance that indicated she was about to dash and close the distance. Begin, Genma shouted before jumping back and giving the two Kunoichi the space they needed to fight. Where is your war fan? It is strange seeing you without it. And what good are those two little fans? Samui asked as she surged more lightning through her body and onto her sword. Tamari smirked at her opponent, unlike with Ruto, in this case bigger doesn't mean better. Naruto was disturbed from his attempt to enter sage mode by Tamari's impromptu innuendo. Samui blushed profusely, um, Tamari, everyone can hear us. Tamari blushed tomato red before she decided to throw caution to the wind. So what? I am proud of my man. You tell him girlfriend. Ino had risen to her feet and shouted to provide support to her future sister wife. Naruto was sputtering as his friends all laughed at the incredibly awkward situation. His previous focus was shattered, and he could no longer hold it together. He ran to the railing, gripped it and shouted down to one of his soulmates. Mari, that's all well and good, but could you keep our private life private please? I love you too, now you two beautiful ladies fight it out and show everyone what kick-ass Kanoikas can do. The stadium audience was laughing uproariously at the comical situation and the camera crew was panning back and forth between Tamari and Naruto. Ino's temporary spurt of confidence resided and now she had her head buried between her knees as the rookies that didn't make it to the finals ribbed her endlessly. Oh, Ino. How come you never shared the size of Naruto's sword? Sakura said through a giggling fit. Yosh. Naruto is most youthful, and his flames of youth burn brightly and proudly for everyone to see, Lee shouted, not understanding the word games that were played. Neji face palmed, clearly ashamed of his teammates' obliviousness while Tenten was bent over laughing. Yes, Lee, his flame is so big everyone can see it. She started slapping her knee as the last bit of her professionalism faded. On the arena's outer walls, Jiraiya was giggling profusely and scribbling every detail into his notebook. As he determined what to write next, the eraser of his pencil rubbed to relieve an itch from the new scar on his head. He couldn't remember what had caused that scar but whenever he had a perverted urge recently, the scar started itching. Back in the stadium, the two blondes' blushes had faded, and they remembered that it was time for them to fight it out. As Samui dashed forward, Tamari swiped one of her fans forward and Samui noticed a blade of wind coming directly for her chest. She maneuvered her sword to intercept the wind blade and she noticed that the lightning nearly crackled out of existence when the wind blade impacted the sword. After blocking the first one, a cat and mouse game began, much like Hinata's match and strategy from before. Samui had to keep recharging the lightning chakra to her sword as the wind blades threatened to snuff out the circuit that she had created. She was starting to feel the drain on her chakra reserves and knew that she needed to change her strategy. She took some kunai out of her pouch and began trying to answer the ranged attacks. The weapons were deflected and scattered as Tamari danced and dodged with the wind. It wasn't a perfect setup, but it would have to do. She had used her first brace of shuriken and half of her kunai, so it was now or never. Samui weaved through some hand seals and called out lightning style, lightning web, before she shot a thick bolt of light blue lightning at the closest kunai. As it impacted the kunai, jolts of lightning began sparking to life in between the metal scattered on the ground. Tamari took a shot of lightning to her right leg, which disrupted her dance and temporarily made her fall to one knee. Samui saw the opportunity created by her jutsu and she darted forward at her top speed to claim her win. Tamari saw Samui darting forward again, and she funneled as much wind chakra to her sensu fans until a white, translucent aura surrounded both of them. She called out futon, dual sickle weasel funnels and twin horizontal twisters of wind shot out of Tamari's fans and caught Samui mid-dash. The wind funnels were a combination of blunt force wind with blades of wind mixed in and they effectively countered Samui's attack. Naruto knew his time was soon coming to fight and he needed to perform his senjutsu scan. He didn't know if the invasion would happen this time around and he didn't know what the trigger would be if it was planned. He needed more information and sage mode was the only way he was going to get it. Forcing himself to retreat into his own world, Naruto closed off the rest of his senses and focused on his connection to nature. As he focused, the noise of the stadium faded, the smell of the food and alcohol no longer filled his nostrils, and the vibrations of the stadium no longer disturbed his concentration. As Samui activated her lightning jutsu, Naruto's sage markings appeared on his face and his senses spread. First came the overabundance of life in the arena along with all of the emotions that accompanied human life. Naruto ignored the influx of sensory information and pushed his senses out. He could feel the anxiety of Anbu patrols, the boredom of the guards on the wall and the scattered life forms throughout Konoha. Concentrating more and willing the nature energy to commune with the forests of fire country, Naruto kept spreading his senses out in an even radius from Konoha. Fuck, fuck fuckity fuck, 
Fuck, fuck. He felt it, he felt what he had hoped he wouldn't, and it was worse than expected. 2,000 sound shinobi were in the forest nearly 10 miles away from Konoha. 3,000 shinobi were approaching from the direction of Iwa and their chakra felt earthy. He felt they were 25 miles out and moving closer at a steady pace. He sensed the anxiety and terror of a small group that was speeding towards Konoha, probably a Konoha patrol. Fuck. Naruto's eyes snapped open, and he created 10 wood clones that dashed out to perform their assigned tasks. He leaned over to Gara and whispered in his ear. Brother, I need you to trust me. We are about to be invaded. I need you to go to the north gate and inform the shinobi posted there. I will send you some Hyuga Bowman. Take Konkuro, we won't make it to his match. You have 30 minutes to get set up. Gara didn't react, he simply leaned his head in and listened to Naruto. He nodded before he turned and said, Good luck, brother. Then he disappeared in a sand sunshine with Konkuro. Kurotsuchi saw Naruto acting weird and turned around to get a better look after the sand brothers disappeared. She gasped when she saw the sage markings on his face and her spine turned frigid when his intense emerald eyes locked on hers. They carried a potent power and promised pain, which terrified her to no end. Did he find out? How? The invasion wouldn't start for another hour. She tried to regain her composure, but she was distracted by a roar from the crowd. Tamari limped over to Samui's down form and saw that she was shredded pretty badly. That was her most powerful jutsu that she could use with her sensu fans, and she had landed a direct hit on her friend. Samui was groaning on the ground, and she was struggling to stand up. Tamari coated her sensu fans in a sharp wind chakra and held the wind blades to her neck, claiming victory in the match. The crowd roared in excitement at the display of skill, speed and jutsu that had lasted for the last 10 minutes. Kurotsuchi turned around after the distraction to see Naruto's gaze looking over the arena wall toward the north. She watched him disappear in a forest green flash of light and the frigid feeling in her spine only intensified. It was nearly crippling at this point as her body nearly refused to respond to her commands. As the match was wrapping up, Tsunade was startled by the appearance of a wood clone of her son. It was hard to tell the difference, but after interacting with them almost every day for the last seven years she could tell the difference. What's going on, brat? She whispered. 5,000, coming from the north. 30 minutes to an hour tops. Boss is informing the others. Boss plans to capture the Tsuchikage's granddaughter. The clone informed her in a low tone. Hodo and Kinji were watching him closely, so the clone addressed them Lord Hodo, Lord Kinji, please remain here. The forest grows dark in the day. My barriers will protect you. The forest grows dark in the day. It was the land of fire's code phrase for imminent attack and Kinji had been notified of a possible invasion. His shock could wait, his country needed him to be a leader. Naruto Senju, I am ordering you to tell everyone in this booth what is going on. The clone bowed, Lord Kinji, Boss entered sage mode and tried to see if anything was off. There are approximately 5,000 enemy shinobi that have penetrated our defenses and they are 20 miles out and approaching quickly. Boss has set barrier seals around the stadium and village. Your booth is protected with his strongest barrier seals. I implore you to remain here. No can do, kiddo. My samurai and guardians will cover things here. Proceed with your mission. Kinji ordered in a commanding tone. Don't overreact yet, Lord Kinji. Let me capture the Tsuchikage's granddaughter first. Iwa is part of the invasion force. Kinji pondered the words. Very well, we will move on your signal. Hashiman. The samurai general, leader of the Land of Fire's samurai forces, appeared on bended knee. Inform your forces of the threat and be discreet. When the time comes, they will move civilians into the barrier seals. It will be done, my lord. Hashiman responded. In the cage's box, an Anbu entered the box calmly and walked up to Itachi. The cloaked figure bent down and whispered into Itachi's ear. Itachi sensei, the forest grows dark in the day. 45 minutes. Sound an Iwa. Wait for my cue. Itachi nodded almost imperceptibly as the Anbu walked out of the cage's booth. Onoki saw the Anbu and shifted nervously in his seat. Is everything alright, Lord Hokage? The old Iwa leader asked. Itachi turned his head and met Onoki's gaze. Nothing to worry about, Lord Tsuchikage. A bar brawl got out of hand and some of my shinobi were involved. Onoki let out a sigh of relief internally, before he responded. Welcome to it. You will have many more such incidents. If only those incidents didn't come with some much paperwork. This statement earned a collective shudder from every leader in the booth, all leaders dreaded the p-word. With the Jonin senseis, Naruto approached calmly so as not to draw attention. Asuma turned and cocked his head in confusion. Aren't you up next bud? The clone made the universal hand sign for gather around, 
and the Jonin knew better than to question Naruto when he had such a serious look on his face. The forest grows dark in the day. 5,000 in about 40 minutes. Wait for boss's signal. The five Jonin, Asuma, Kurinai, Gai, Kakashi, and Anko, all failed to suppress their body's shocked reactions. Luckily, they didn't verbalize their shock. The Naruto clone answered a couple of their questions and the Jonin sensei began reviewing their assigned roles for the impending invasion. The Naruto clone went down to Ino and gave her a tender kiss on the lips and told her to follow Asuma's instructions. Hyashi was surprised when Naruto appeared next to him, and he was even more surprised to see the sage markings and serious look on his face. The clone held up a hand in a request to let him speak. The Naruto clone leaned in close. Lord Hyuga, the forest grows dark in the day. We need the Hyuga bowmen on the northern and western walls. Be discreet. Wait for boss's signal to go loud. Naruto's tone was firm, and it let Hyashi know that nothing more need be said. Hyashi nodded curtly. Very well, you will have them. I will remain here for your signal. A barrier is set up in the conference room immediately behind this section, get the civilians and children in there as soon as you see my signal. Another nod from Hyashi and the wood clone phased into the floor of the arena. Tamari was confused when she returned to the contestant's box and sensed that her brothers were no longer there. Naruto's transformed clones could no longer deceive her senses and she looked at him for an explanation. Naruto walked up, placed a chaste kiss on her lips and pulled her into a hug. As he rubbed her back, he whispered, invasion is happening. Iwa and sound, best guess is 35 minutes. I am going to capture Kurotsuchi in my fight. Stay safe, my desert lily. Naruto gave her another passionate kiss before he used the standard Konoha sunshine to appear in the arena. Tamari was left stunned for a full 30 seconds before she recomposed herself and prepared for the events to come. As discreet messages echoed around the arena and attempted to alert Konoha's forces, Naruto squared off against Kurotsuchi in the arena. The match hadn't even started, and she was sweating and breathing heavily. She was nervous because they were 30 minutes ahead of the scheduled time which meant that the forces in the arena would be without reinforcements for far too long. She couldn't reasonably back out of the fight, so her only option was to stall. She had Han Sensei in the stadium with her and her grandfather. Then her father would be coming along with Roshi, she just needed to make it until then. Genma stepped forward and took the senbone out of his mouth. Finalists ready? Naruto nodded immediately and Kurotsuchi looked at the cage's box before she nodded shakily. Begin. Kurotsuchi placed her cockiest smirk she could muster on her face and decided to try and stall. All right, send you. She was interrupted by a shaking from the ground that caused her to jump backwards. She watched in amazement as wooden vines emerged from the ground. The stadium joined her as a stunned silence fell over the arena. Now, Kurotsuchi, I recommend you don't resist. It was my mistake for nearly killing you with that kick last time. Naruto began walking forward calmly toward Kurotsuchi and leveling his aura on her. I do not appreciate what you attempted to do then or what you are attempting to do here today. Kurotsuchi kept dashing around, avoiding the tremors in the ground that preceded the emergence of wooden monstrosities. WW what D do you M mean? Kurotsuchi was now in a full state of panic as the demon's child showed off his monstrous strength. Naruto closed his eyes and focused on pulling water out of the air. The water condensed around him and formed two bubbles that began hovering over each of his hands. Naruto held both hands out and the water globules continued to grow as they hovered over the top of his hands. Water style, machine gun water pistols, Naruto called out loud enough to be heard as water balls the size of marbles were propelled from Naruto's gun-shaped hands at astounding speeds. Kurotsuchi was in full panic mode as she was dodging the vines and then she saw him pulling water out of the atmosphere like some freak of nature. She saw water bullets heading toward her fast and she did the only thing she could think of. She flipped through four seals before calling out lava style, lava wall. A wall of lava 10 feet wide and 6 feet tall was spat out of her mouth and absorbed the multitude of bullets that were speeding toward her. She listened to the dull impacts and the hiss of sizzling water in fear, trying to form a new plan. Naruto wasn't surprised by a defensive wall, so he dropped the handguns and weaved through five hand seals before he used the available water to create water style, crashing waterfall. The water rushed up into the air before crashing down on the area behind the lava wall. He saw Kurotsuchi jump to the side to avoid the deluge of water and he focused his chakra into the ground. After the groundwater saturated, he stomped on the ground and called out, wood style, tree binding death. Before Kurotsuchi could recover from her dive and roll, wood snared around both of her ankles and painfully immobilized her. Suddenly, the wood grew around her and immobilized her whole body, stretching her arms out to the sides. 
The tree kept growing and ensnared her and left only her head visible as Naruto transitioned his hands into the snake seal. Having his match won, and completely ignoring Genma, Naruto looked directly up into the cage's box. Invasion and upheaval. Projecting his voice, Naruto shouted, The forest grows dark in the day. To the enemies of Konoha, stand down or that Tsuchikage's granddaughter dies. Onoki had stood up and was clutching the rails of the cage's box. That wasn't a Janan down there, it was a monster. When his granddaughter was completely immobilized, he hesitated, knowing that it was too early to launch the invasion. Then the boy just challenged him, and he could feel the Hokage, Kazekage and Rakage beginning to rise. Fuck. Orochimaru, from his position as Onoki's guard, saw things fall apart and knew that he needed to prematurely activate his invasion. He gave a hand signal to Kabuto and his hidden guards before he threw four, super dense smoke bombs down on the ground of the booth. He darted forward and grabbed the third Hokage and jumped onto the roof of the stadium. He saw Jirobo, one of his biggest guards, with his curse mark activated as he threw the Kaze Kage up toward the roof as well. His sound four fixed themselves into position and erected a barrier, barrier technique, four violet flames formation, around the designated battlefield. When all was said and done, Onoki was floating above Orochimaru, and they were backed up by twenty sound jonin. Across the rooftop from them was Itachi, Hiruzen, Rasa, and I. Go, my loyal shinobi, buy me time to activate my jutsu, Orochimaru hissed, which prompted the twenty sound jonin to dart toward the kijas. I cracked his neck and punched his fists together before he bellowed out in his loudest voice, Kumo fights with Konoha. Then he dashed forward, encased in his lightning armor, to engage the incoming enemy. Itachi, this is my fight. Back me up. Try to find a way out of the barrier to lead our forces, Hiruzen said, throwing off his cage cloak and emerging as his old school battle uniform. Rasa had dark rings form around his eyes as gold dust began pouring out of a seal on his arm. I will assist the rakage. As the smoke bombs went off in the Hokaye's box, feathers fell over the arena and captured the civilians and Janan in a wide scale just that induced sleep. Naruto saw this, condensed his chakra and then emitted it in a single, powerful pulse to dispel the genjutsu. That was one of Orochi team's plans foiled, however, that momentary distraction provided the opportunity for nearly 20 Iwa Jonin to surround Naruto. He sensed some incoming reinforcements, but he would need to deal with the enemies that were currently surrounding him. The fight was fast and violent as Naruto dodged and weaved through Earth Jutsus, Kunai, Shuriken and many other attacks. One thing was for certain, the Iwa Jonin were not expecting the level of speed, reaction time and power that Naruto was currently bringing to the table. He had shown no mercy as he dodged around and countered attacks with his own arsenal. After collecting enough chakra and determining enemy positions, Naruto rolled out of the way of an earth bullet and placed his hands on the ground while calling out Makuten, pit of wooden spikes. The ground fell out from under a group of five Iwa Jonin, and they screamed as they fell and were met by sharp wooden spikes that impaled them all over their bodies. Han had dispatched two Konoha Jonin when the chaos began, and he was making his way to the arena. After a brief tussle with Might Guy, he sent the eccentric green beast flying with a steam-powered kick. He saw his fellow Iwa Shinobi and sound allies fighting around the arena, but they were outmatched. They needed to turn the tides of battle. He flashed into a three-tailed cloak, the maximum that he could force out of Kokuo, and dashed to the arena floor. Tamari had gathered Samui, Karu, Amoi and Yugito and they were attempting to reinforce Naruto on the stadium floor. The fighting was fierce throughout the stadium, but it was clear to her that the Iwa Jonin were the only threats. The sound shinobi were poorly trained one-trick ponies, and they couldn't stand up to her or team Yugito. Tamari saw a red cloak with three tails emerge around Han and she saw him moving toward Naruto. Her body moved on its own as she performed a wind sunshine and appeared immediately behind Naruto. Han was nearly to the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki and he collected steam into his arm and flung it forward with the intent to snuff the life out of his primary objective and save Kurotsuchi. He saw the boy was on the ground with his back turned as he cast yet another jutsu that took out three of the remaining Iwa Jonin. Suddenly, Han saw the Suna Kunoichi appear in between him and his target, but his fist was already in motion, propelled by the potent steam power of Kokuo. The sound of shearing metal followed by a fleshy squelching sound echoed through the chaos of the arena. Naruto was fighting off the Iwa Jonin and it was getting easier to avoid their attacks as their numbers dwindled. He saw two of them attempting to remove Kurotsuchi from her tree binding and formed a snake seal, which made the tree surrounding Kurotsuchi sprout two wooden spikes that tore through the Iwa Jonin's flak jackets like a bullet through target paper. He dodged out of the way of a kick from another Jonin, and he lashed out with Ryuoko, the blade he received from Tempest, and severed the forearm of said Jonin. 
He then channeled wind chakra into the blade before swiping horizontally and throwing a wind blade at stomach height that bisected three Iwa Jonin that were moving toward him. Naruto felt the surge of Kokuo's chakra and knew the real battle would begin soon, but he still had too many enemies right in front of him to deal with. After lashing out with his wind blade and killing those three Jonin, he felt Han's chakra closing fast and then he heard the sound of shearing metal and flesh being torn. His senses told him what happened before he turned around, but his mind refused to believe it. He couldn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it. Naruto's head turned and saw Han standing with his arm extended and he could see his hand covered in red chakra emerging out of the back of a kunoichi with four sandy blonde buns. In that moment, Naruto's world turned red. In that moment, death would be unleashed upon the world. In that moment, Han realized that he just fucked up. The whole battlefield stilled as a terrible, visible, potent ping of red chakra spread around Konoha. Everyone froze as the chakra ring expanded at the speed of sound and heads turned towards the point of origin. A second after the pulse was released, a dome of blood red, potent chakra formed around Naruto and a pillar of red chakra shot into the sky. Civilians and dignitaries around the stadium froze mid-step in their evacuation efforts when they felt the sinister ping of out-of-control bijou chakra. Fear, overwhelming fear, with a dash of hopelessness overwhelmed their senses and demanded all of their attention. Their heads turned mechanically, eyes widened in fear, urine flowed down legs, heart spasmed uncontrollably and ration fled. What was once a controlled evacuation effort became a mad dash away from the source of their fear. In the evacuation bunkers, civilians and younger ninja teams experienced similar reactions to the civilians in the arena. Despite being protected by hundreds of feet of earth within the Hokage Monument, terror saturated every cell of their being. People fainted, crumpled to the ground in sniveling messes, shook with fear and latched onto loved ones. After the first minute of shock wore off, terrified screams filled the bunker. Nobody could calm the fear in their hearts and thus pandemonium reigned supreme. The overall result, inside the barriers, scared whispers started, and rumors fueled by speculation began to spread. Ino was working with Team 10, Hinata and Shino to evacuate the civilians toward the nearest safe zone. Asuma was in charge and was handling most of the fighting, but she was already bloody from fights that she was forced to take. She had just protected a mother and child from some sound thug when she felt the pulse of chakra. Her head immediately turned toward the arena and her heart was overwhelmed with fear for Naruto. Something had gone wrong, something had gone terribly, terribly wrong. Asuma snapped her out of it and returned her focus to the mission, but it was difficult to ignore the sinister feeling that fell over the stadium. Hikari, Rias and Yosuke froze from within the daimyo's barrier and their heads turned toward Naruto. As the pulse spread through the arena and penetrated the barrier, they were each forcibly drawn back into the mindscape. The wood clones they were occupying disintegrated as they lost the will to hold their form, which earned curious looks from those in the booth. As they entered into a chaotic mindscape, they saw Kurama attempting to fight and restrain his chakra, but it was futile. Kurama was watching from the cottage inside the seal as his partner dismantled the enemy forces. The sun burned intensely and the whole mindscape vibrated with energy and Sinjutsu chakra as his host drew upon the might of his potent chakra to combat his enemies. Suddenly, he saw Tamari's form through the mental link and everything went crazy inside the seal. Kurama was forced into his fox form, the mindscape went black with a blood-red moon that somehow pierced through the fierce chakra storm that emerged out of nowhere. Kurama was fighting the pull of his chakra, which was creating the chakra storm. Suddenly, he saw Naruto's unconscious form and he took up a defensive position around his partner and continued to attempt to close the chakra link. Tsunade was down in the medical bay where the injured finalists were being treated when she felt the chakra pulse followed by the potent flare of Kurama's chakra. It was clear to her that something bad happened and Naruto had lost control. When he was in control, Kurama's chakra felt warm, protective and overwhelmingly powerful. This chakra felt enraged, sinister and bloodthirsty. Tsunade focused chakra to her fist and unleashed a potent wave of it on four frozen sound shinobi. They were splattered against the wall before the tunnels of the stadium were blown away from the force of Tsunade's punch. She dashed through her newly created tunnel and out into the arena. Shinobi around Konoha froze as a familiar, sinister aura nearly caused them to shit their pants. Their hearts beat rapidly and they nearly short-circuited when memories of 13 years ago flashed through their minds. The vile chakra of the QB had returned to Konoha and they were beyond terrified. In the middle of counter-invasion operations, Shinobi either froze or pulled upon their will to overcome their fear. That day, many Konoha Shinobi would permanently brand themselves as heroes that overcame their fears or cowards that gave into the trauma of their pasts. Five seconds after the chakra surrounded Naruto, Han had remained frozen stiff if fear with his hand still holding Tamari's lifeless body. 
he removed his hand from her chest and let her fall unceremoniously to the arena floor, which was a, big, fucking, mistake. As if the ominous chakra could feel what happened, a blood-red, wooden tail covered in potent red chakra shot out of the chakra ball and slammed into Han. Han was sent flying into the arena wall, only alive due to his own chakra shroud and the instant reaction that allowed him to block the sudden attack. As the dark chakra ball faded, Naruto could be seen in his stage 2 transformation. All of his skin was melted off, his body was composed of blood red and black chakra, eight tails waved about frantically behind him, fox ears made of chakra bone were fixed upon his head, his nails were overgrown like fearsome kitsune claws, his face was distorted as a cracked mouth appeared and let out an ear-piercing roar. As the stage 2 transformation started to settle over Naruto, there were bones forming over his black and red body and a fox head snapped into place over Naruto's own. The pupils of this chakra form were a solid black sclera with a single red slit in the center of the black orbs. Yami Naruto had returned to wreak vengeance upon the world. As is operating on instinct, the Kyubified Naruto disappeared and reappeared above Han as he attempted to free himself from the arena wall. Yami appeared above Han and slammed two linked fists down on the Iwa Jinchuriki's head. A massive dust cloud filled the arena as a 50-meter crater was formed. Yami continued pummeling the stunned Han with a fearsome barrage of fists and tails. Each strike sent a shockwave of chakra and power echoing through the crater. Digging deeper and deeper into the arena floor Yami continued his assault of the defenseless form of Han. Han was able to shake off some of the disorientation after he dodged out of another crippling blow that sent earth, dust and bits of the stadium flying. He righted himself and was able to condense some steam within his body to prepare for a counterattack. Within the veil of the dust cloud, Han waited for his opportunity as the enraged Kyubi Jinchuriki locked onto his new position and lunged at him. Han felt his power swell from the steam gourd on his back as he channeled the powerful medium through his back and arm. His fist connected with Yami's face and cracked some of the bone skull that was forming around the rampaging Jinchuriki. Yami was sent careening into the stadium wall despite using his tails to slow his flight. With a shake of his head and a roar, Yami darted back toward Han once more. This time, the Makutan tails blocked Han's attack before Yami condensed potent yokai around his right hand and launched a counterattack into Han's abdomen. Han folded over Yami's fist like laundry in a monastery before coughing up a sizable quantity of blood that spatted Yami's feet. Before Han could react, another double hammer fist slammed into the back of his head to propel his face into the dirt and create another crater. Han couldn't think clearly, each blow carried staggering force and Kokuo's chakra could no longer protect him against the might of the QB. Han continued to try and pull Kokuo's chakra, but even if he had all five tails, it would still be vastly inferior to the eight tails of QB's chakra that were laying into him. He had tried to keep a defensive form, his mind unable to react or do anything other than defend. The steam and bijou chakra he was emitting in an attempt to defend himself was scattered by each deadly blow. After another minute of pummeling Kukuo's container, Yami threw his head back and let out a bestial roar that echoed around Konoha. Yami picked Han up by his throat, the Iwa veteran no longer shrouded in his chakra cloak. Yami was choking the life out of the man that had robbed him off his soulmate. Completely overwhelmed by grief, anger and hatred, Yami let loose another roar into Han's face. The concussive force inflicting more damage on the nearly dead Jinchuriki. Yami couldn't contain his rage, he couldn't stop the overwhelming sorrow that poured out from the hole in his shattered soul. He threw Han up in a fit of rage and eight tails chased the airborne form of the Iwa Jinchuriki. Eight tails ripped into Han's now lifeless form and held him suspended in the air over the arena. Bloodred Makutan tails ripped into each arm, two tails impaled the torso, one in the groin and one in the neck. With a roar, Yami shredded Iwa's Jinchuriki into pieces and closed his eyes as Han's blood rained down on his face. Caught in a moment of brief reprieve, Yami basked in the bloody essence of his slain foe. With another bestial roar, Yami darted toward the barrier where he felt some familiar chakra. Earlier in the barrier, Orochimaru had finished his jutsu as two of his sound jonin remained standing. Onoki had held off Ai, Rasa and Hiruzen with liberal application of his dust release. Five coffins emerged from the ground and Hiruzen formed an earth and fire combination jutsu to stop the fourth coffin from emerging. The earth and fire dragon slammed into the fourth coffin before it could open, but that was the only one that could be stopped. Hashirama Senju, Toborama Senju, Mito Uzumaki and Kushina Uzumaki stepped out for the four remaining coffins. Their forms appeared cracked, their skin pale, the bodies were mere husks and the visage of their former selves. What? What are we doing here? Where are we? Hashirama asked while looking around manically. Toburama sighed while Mito looked adoringly at her husband. Easy dear, it appears that your brother did not heed your warning. I sense we are back in Konoha, 
If all of these chakra signatures are what I think they are. Toburama growled, I created the jutsu to talk to fallen comrades lost in important missions. How should I know it would be used in such a manner? Hiruzen watched his previous mentors in a state of stunned disbelief. It was too much for him to take in. S. Sensei? His cracked voice escaped him and garnered the attention of the newly resurrected. Hashirama turned and beamed a smile at Hiruzen, Oh, Hiruzen, how are you so old? Toburama face palmed, Brother, clearly much time has passed since our deaths. This didn't deter Hashirama, and my village is still standing. And look at that, Tobi. Anuchiha is the Hokage, Hashirama said proudly, giving a thumbs up to Itachi. I, Rasa and Itachi watched the bizarre conversation among legends, it was then that I noticed the silent figure. Kushina? Is that you? Kushina looked toward I and smiled. Unlike the others, her skin seemed healthy and there were no cracks in her form. Hello again, I. Thank you for helping to defend Konoha. Ku, 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 you are not here to defend Konoha. Orochimaru dashed forward and placed three kunai into the back of Hashirama's, Toburama's and Mito's heads. He attempted to put one in Kushina, but he was forced to dodge backwards as chains escaped her body and attempted to pierce him. How? How are you resisting my jutsu? Kushina jumped over to the side of the other cage, turned around and smirked devilishly at Orochimaru. Easy, my soul is never, and will never be, under your control. She thanked Kami for this opportunity mentally. Orochimaru growled and ordered the resurrected souls to attack his enemies. They were about to engage in combat when an ominous pulse of chakra halted the imminent battle and gathered everyone's attention. That's the Kyuubi's chakra, Mito said while looking toward the source of the chakra pulse. And it is powerful and out of control. Toburama added. Onoki floated up and paled when he saw the Kyuubified Yami beating down Han. Orochimaru, we need to hurry up. The boy has eight tails, and he is in his stage two form. He is ripping Han apart. Kushina looked concerned over towards her Sochi before her attention snapped back to her resurrected enemies. I will take Mito. I am the only one that can counter her combat Fuenjutsu. I smashed his fist into an open hand. I always wanted to fight Toburama. Rasa looked at Itachi, think you could hold off Lord first? I have an old goat to gut. Itachi nodded. Hiruzen summoned Enma and had him take his staff form. Very well, Orochimaru, it is high time I corrected my past mistakes. A pitched, multifaceted battle ensued. Jutsus were flung around freely, and carnage reigned supreme on the stadium roof for the next five minutes. The barrier was the only thing protecting Konoha from multiples rank Jutsus that were powered by some of the most powerful shinobi of all time. The barrier was only 100 meter by 50 meters, which didn't leave quite enough room for fives ranked battles to take place without clashing into one another. Hashirama's prodigious use of the Makutan created a forest that was destroyed a minute later as Rasa da Jonoki's dust release. I sent Toburama flying through trees only for him to reform and use a high-powered water jutsu to slice through trees as I dodged the attack. Kushina and Mito pitched Uzumaki-style Fuenjutsu battle creating explosions from Kushina and molecular disintegration from Mito. It was complete and total pandemonium within the barrier. In comparison to these fights, the fight between Orochimaru and Hiruzen was fairly stale. Bow vs. Sword clashed with Enma complaining every now and then about taking damage from the legendary Kusnagi sword wielded by Orochimaru. Every now and then, the two would exchange jutsu that proved completely ineffective, despite looking fairly flashy. Hiruzen jumped back onto a tree grown by Hashirama to take a moment and catch his breath. That was when he noticed something red and menacing coming through the barrier. Yami had reveled in the blood of the five-tailed Jinchuriki for a couple seconds before he darted off in search of his next target, a target he decided was responsible for the death of his soulmate. He could feel the influence of the alternate personalities and Kurama trying to regain control but he wouldn't give it back until his vengeance had been taken. With single-minded determination, Yami launched himself at the barrier. Eight tails made primarily of Makutan chakra that was sucked up by Kurama's chakra ripped into the barrier. The purplish barrier wavered as the tails penetrated it and then Yami gave a mighty roar and pulled the barrier apart. An Anbu squad had posted themselves next to the purple barrier after watching one of their comrades burn alive after simply touching the barrier. As they were trying to discover a way through, they felt the chakra ping before the overwhelming pressure of the Kyuubi's chakra froze them in place. They were unable to avert their eyes from the brutal pounding that the Senju boy imposed on Iwa's Jinchuriki. Their eyes widened and jaws dropped when they watched the Iwa veteran get dismembered in a brutal fashion. Holy shit captain. How are we going to stop that thing? A boar-masked Anbu asked his leader in a stunned and terrified voice. Hawk was broken out of his shock by his subordinate's question, I, I don't know. We need to find a way through this barrier first and foremost. 
This is the four violet flames formation barrier. We cannot break through and if we attempt to meddle with it, well, you saw what happened to Bear, Kat said. Well we can't, holy shit, Hawk shouted as Yami's tails impaled through the barrier. Hawk watched as the tails forced their way through with a wiggle. It looked like some terrifying snake writhing out of its hole before Hawk heard Yami roar. As Konoha's Jinchuriki roared, Hawk watched the barrier begin to pixelate, then crack and finally shatter. With a mighty crack, the arena side of the barrier shattered into millions of shards and pixels of residual chakra that led to a chain reaction of the barrier disintegrating. The backlash of the barrier being forcibly destroyed rendered the sound four momentarily unconscious due to the sudden drain and backlash of their chakra. Through the disintegrating barrier, a red blur moved with startling speed towards where Yami could sense an old and dusty feeling chakra. Onoki was floating above the earth, dodging clouds and clumps of gold dust that were threatening him. It had been years since he engaged in such a battle and even ten minutes of operating at nearly full capacity was taking its toll on the ancient Tsuchikage. He darted through the air to avoid multiple golden spears when he processed the barrier shattering. He knew their time was up and he needed to break contact and join the invading forces. As he had this thought, a red chakra-covered fist sent him careening into one of the few Makutan trees that were standing. Yami enjoyed every millisecond that his fist connected with the Tsuchikage. The power of Kyuubi's chakra urged him forward and fueled his rage, he would never stop until he had his revenge. Yami landed from his voyage through the air, skid for a couple meters and immediately dashed toward where Onoki was recovering from the surprise blow. Yami was forced to dodge a ray of dust release chakra that disintegrated a tree behind his position. As Yami closed the distance, he saw a square cube of dust release chakra hovering in between Onoki's two old hands. He was too close and moving too fast to dodge, so as Onoki released the attack Yami folded his tails in front of him and absorbed the impact of the potent jutsu. It hurt, it burnt the chakra-covered skin of Yami as Kurama's chakra fought against the disintegrating effects of the dust-release jutsu. Eventually, the Jinchuriki won out and sent a tail extending toward a panting Onoki. Onoki couldn't believe it, this damn demon boy ruined everything. He had already captured his granddaughter, foiled the invasion by forcing its preemptive activation, killed one of his Jinchuriki and now he had become the first beast to ever survive his dust release. Then a burning tail slammed into his gut and knocked him on his back for the second time in the fight. Onoki rolled and dodged a tail that attempted to impale him, but the second, third, fourth and fifth tails connected. Yami took great pleasure as his chakra tails impaled the ugly midget of a man. His screams were pure joy to Yami's ears, his writhing sent shivers of pleasure through Yami's tails and right up his spine. The corrosive chakra eating the Tsuchikage alive by killing every living thing it touched combined with the chakra-absorbing effects of the Makutan tails took a heavy toll on the Tsuchikage. Orochimaru saw the barrier shattering and he saw his sensei struggling to catch his breath. He wanted more time to drag out his torture, he wanted to savor the death of his perceived betrayer. Once again, the Senju brat interferes with his plans and denies him the ability to savor the moment. He molded a great quantity of chakra before he hunched over and spewed out an uncountable number of snakes by using his formation of 10,000 snakes jutsu, so I guess the count would be roughly 10,000. As Hiruzen prepared a jutsu to counter this, Orochimaru used his hiding in the surface jutsu to phase into the ground. Hiruzen countered the innumerable snakes with a wide-scale regal fire dragon jutsu. The regal variant was approximately three times larger and stronger than the normal fire dragon and it consumed a considerable amount of chakra. Hiruzen spouted the regal dragon and flames descended on the writhing mass of snakes that seemed to have swords sticking out of their mouths. As the last of the oxygen left his lungs, the jutsu died down showing that only ashes remained of the impromptu summons. Hiruzen scanned the battlefield, and he couldn't locate his student. He knew Orochimaru was slippery and there was no way he would have been caught in such an obvious jutsu. He saw Hashirama get released from the impure world resurrection as Itachi's reddish-orange Sasano stabbed him with the sword of Tatsuka, sealing the Hokaye's soul into the Sasano's gourd until such a time that Itachi released it. That momentary distraction cost him dearly as Orochimaru emerged out of the tree behind him and stabbed him with the Kusanagi. He noticed too late that his student had taken his back and he was unable to completely dodge the Kusanagi that stabbed through his right shoulder. He managed to prevent a scream from escaping his throat and his good arm grabbed his student's left arm. Sarutobi breathed out a small, dense cloud of ash and clicked his teeth to ignite the explosion, which blew him apart from his student. Kushina was battling with Mito in a high-stakes battle and was having a tough time dealing with her predecessor despite Mito holding back quite a bit. The battle continued after the barrier shattered until Kushina was finally able to trap Mito in her sealing chains. Kushina gave her a brief but heartwarming goodbye before her adamantine chains dug into her head and removed the kunai tag that was anchoring her soul to the sacrificed body. 
the body crumbled to dust and Mito's soul waved goodbye as it returned to the pure world. As Kushina caught her breath and took stock of things, she saw her Sochi in his eight-tailed state standing over a downed opponent. Without thinking and with her chain still flailing, she darted towards her son. As she got closer, she saw that he had tails that looked eerily like her chakra chains, and they were impaled in the Tsuchikich. Well, shit, here's to the start of the Fourth Great War. Kushina extended her chains and began to wrap her Sochi in each of his tails, struggling against the concentrated might of Kurama's chakra. Yami felt the chains wrapping around him and he would not be denied his vengeance. As he was immobilized, he focused on pulling his tails apart and he was rewarded by the sickening sound of bones cracking and flesh being ripped apart. With his final act of vengeance fulfilled, Yami accepted the forced immobilization from his mother's chains. Yami closed his eyes, with the suppression from his mother he could no longer deny the influence of Naruto and the altars. In Naruto's mindscape after Han was killed, Rias was finally able to stir Naruto awake. He was confused and looked around before the image of Tamari with a fist through her chest flashed into his mind. He crumpled into a ball on the ground, completely oblivious to the chakra storm that was encompassing the mindscape. Completely oblivious and uncaring of the chaos caused by a personality he thought he had long since integrated. Hikari's hugs, Rias please, Yosuke's stoic support and a struggling Kurama attempted to snap Naruto out of it. They needed him to get his shit together and regain control of his body before somebody he loves got hurt. Naruto remained oblivious until the image of his mother forced its way through the mental link. The feel of her chakra and the warmth of her love wrapped around him and gave him strength as her chains forcibly calmed the angry chakra. In the last moments of Yami's control, Naruto saw that Tsuchikage get ripped apart and he felt Yami stop fighting against his own will. With a disorienting rush, he closed his eyes, and he was looking into the violet orbs of his mother when he returned to the real world. Naruto's skin was smoking as Kurama worked overtime with his remaining chakra to undo the damage caused by such a potent phase 2 transformation. That was the most of Kurama's chakra that Naruto's young body had handled at one time. Luckily, it was only active 10 to 12 minutes, he couldn't really tell since he was unconscious for a while. As he peered into his mother's eyes, her chains receded, and she sped to his side to prevent him from falling over in exhaustion. Mom, how are, you here? Naruto asked through gasps of breath. Kushina smiled radiantly and answered softly, well, the snake team tried forcing me to serve him with the impure world resurrection. Kami simply wouldn't allow it, but she said that I could help you defend Konoha since Orochimaru was breaking the rules of the natural order anyway. Naruto looked around, still trying to recover despite the fiery pain coursing through his body, on his skin and in his heart. He closed his eyes and tried to force himself to calm down enough to absorb nature energy to assist in the healing. It's good to see you again, mom. Thanks for helping me. Take care of Tamari when she gets to Kami's realm. Tears started falling from his eyes. Itachi had been listening to the interaction since Orochimaru had used a reverse summoning jutsu to flee and the other reincarnations were sealed away or dealt with. Raso was standing next to him and fell to his knees in sorrow. Itachi spoke, is that what made you lose control? Naruto nodded, the pain and shock went so deep. It seems Yami made his comeback and took control. He is being tied up in my mindscape and the others are keeping a close eye on him. It seems like he no longer wishes to fight now that he has taken his revenge. Kushina smiled with a soft sadness before she raised Naruto's chin and forced him to meet her gaze. It is not your fault, Sochi. Now, this isn't over yet. Kami is calling me back now that the snake bastard is no longer here. I love you. I am proud of you. I believe in you. Kushina had pulled Naruto into a hug and placed a loving kiss on his still smoking forehead. Itachi let the two have their moment and an Anbu stopped by to tell him that Hiruzen had been evacuated to the hospital for treatment. I walked up to the group and whistled when he saw the shredded remains of Onoki. Damn, brat, how are we going to explain this one? Rasa stood with a look of rage in his eyes. Naruto, you said that there are 5,000 shinobi incoming? Naruto watched his mother's soul leave the body and it crumbled to ash and leaves as her soul returned to Kami's realm. He shifted positions away from Onoki's remains and the auto corpse before he sat in his meditative position. Give me a second, Papa Rasa. Naruto gathered the turbulent nature energy that was in the stadium and surrounding forests. He felt strength return to his body as the potent natural life force flooded his tenketsu and worked alongside Kurama to repair the damage. He tuned out those sensations and focused on forcing his senses externally before he spread his area of influence. After two minutes, his sage markings returned, and he gathered the overflowing information from his senses. Death, grief, panic, terror, despair, rage and many more emotions flooded his senses and made it difficult to glean the information he was looking for. 
he also felt a strange, yet somehow familiar, energy hovering in the stadium in great quantities. Filtering out all of the unnecessary information, Naruto was finally able to feel the battle raging at the village walls. It was fierce and he felt Gara was in his fully transformed state fighting off what felt like snake summons. His eyes snapped open, they are here, north and west gates are under heavy assault. I didn't waste time counting but we need to go. Gara is already synced with Shukaku, and he can only hold that transformation for 20 minutes. Without another word, the group of the most powerful shinobi in the nations darted off toward the raging battle. Naruto ignored the burning in his coils and the overwhelming feeling of exhaustion. When this was over, he was going to be in bed for a long time. Fifteen minutes prior, the sound shinobi made their move. It started with five massive snake summons, and one summon was a giant three-headed snake for Kami's sake. Thanks to the early warning and early start of the invasion, a perimeter defense force was able to be summoned. The bad news was that the snakes were resilient and very difficult to dispel. It was as the snakes were summoned that the pulse of Kyuubi's chakra hit the perimeter guard and they all saw the pillar of demonic chakra shoot into the sky. They felt the overwhelming presence and rage contained in the chakra, but Kuza Akimichi was able to rally the defenders to focus on their assigned tasks. Despite having a platoon of Akimichi, the snakes were able to create four sizable holes in the wall. The desperation of the defenders forced Gara's hand, and two minutes after the walls were breached, he was able to synchronize with Shukaku. The Tanuki was more than happy to get some time out of the seal and let loose a little chaos. The defenders fell back and Gara became the front line of defense in between the wood line and the breached walls of Konoha. It was the Akimichi that bought the time for Gara's transformation, but the snakes lashed out with their giant tails and that was how the walls were breached. The Uchiha police force answered the early call for reinforcements, and they joined the hectic battle. The Hyuga bowmen ignored the giant summons since their arrows were ineffective and they focused on holding the groups of sound shinobi at bay. After 10 minutes of fighting, more reinforcements were able to reach the wall as the initial wave of attackers was mostly dealt with. Unfortunately, after 10 minutes of pandemonium, three of the five summons remained and the casualties on both sides continued to grow. Gara and Shukaku were engaged in a clash of titans against the three-headed snake summon while Konoha defenders did their best to keep the walls plugged. Unfortunately, when Iwa's reinforcements arrived, multiple enemy squads were able to get past the defensive lines and enter the village. Jiraiya had been cleaning house around the stadium after the barrier was erected. He was infuriated to see that his old teammate had launched such a bold offensive against his village of origin. He was further incensed by the fact that Iwa joined the invasion, and he wasn't even aware of it. He panicked when Naruto went into the out-of-control QB mode, but there was literally nothing he could do about that except pray he didn't target Konoha Shinobi. Last he saw, he was completely focused on Han, and he couldn't afford to stand around and watch him. He cursed as massive explosions shook the village near the Uchiha police station and district. He knew those explosions, he had fought against them many times in the Second and Third Wars. It was the Iwa Demolition Corps that had the most potent wielders of the explosion release bloodline and other massively destructive jutsus. He changed course to go deal with that threat since there didn't appear to be any action at the walls yet. He was able to follow the explosions and neutralize three shinobi bearing the insignia of the Iwa Explosion Corps. After eliminating the three shinobi, he saw the snake summons and knew he was needed at the walls. Unfortunately, it was then that he was ambushed by the two remaining members of the Explosion Corps. He was able to survive the ambush by covering himself in his hair and hardening it. He then used the hardened hair like a porcupine shaking out its quills to wound one of the shinobi. It took him 8 minutes to finish off the two elite Jonin level shinobi and he didn't escape that fight scot clean. After catching his breath, he darted towards the battle at the village walls. Jiraiya appeared in his favorite way, a very flashy manner. After summoning Gamakan and Jeratora, two of the elite snake summons were crushed by the food cart destroyer no jutsu, as Jiraiya dubbed it. Jiraiya left the three-headed snake to Gara and focused on stemming the flow of Iwa shinobi that were entering the village. Shortly after arriving, he felt the arrival of the big guns and grinned in satisfaction. A horn blew that informed Konoha shinobi to fall back and reform lines and Jiraiya heeded that call with everyone except Gara. As the horn blew, the rookies were joining the counter-attack effort after they had dropped of the last of the civilian evacuees. They were all mortified by the terrified faces of the adult civilians and the hushed murmurs they picked up. They each knew that the terrifying feeling earlier was Naruto, and it really did feel like he had lost control. They were each scared in their own way, but they were resolved to protect their home and fight side by side next to their comrades. They were able to arrive on the wall to bear witness to an act that would go down in history amidst the greatest heroes and protectors of Konoha's vaunted history. Naruto had asked Shikaku to sound the horn and he began molding his chakra. 
It was time for the world to fear the Makutan once again. Naruto jumped from the village walls over the last of the retreating defenders and landed in a crouch in front of a couple thousand Iwa and Sound Shinobi. Before they could react, Naruto called out with style, violent deep forest emergence. Unlike the serene rebuilding of the great Jura forest, this was a violent demonstration of the power of nature. Massive trees sprouted rapidly in the direction of the attacking forces. Each tree creating sharp thorns and wooden spikes as they sought out chakra signatures in their path. It became a violent symphony of Mother Nature's rage as a newly grown forest laid waste to the invading forces. The violent symphony escalated to its natural crescendo as the terrified screams mingled with the roar of a newly emerged forest. The symphony's name was Death, and its debut upon the elemental nations was absolute. The encroaching Iwa and Otto forces let out terrified screams as wooden branches, thorns, vines or trees tore through their ranks. Iwa hadn't seen true war for nearly 20 years which meant that most of their attacking force had never bore witness to the chaos of battle before. Thus, the inexperienced invaders perished as panic disabled their rational thinking. The wooden forest claimed many frozen victims whose blood became the first offering to the woodland monstrosity. Kyuchi was working alongside Han to organize the charge and maintain the momentum of the invasion. He was waiting to involve himself until the big guns showed up and he had ordered Roshi to do the same. Then, he saw one of their primary targets of the invasion land on the ground in front of Konoha's walls after the retreat was organized. His experience to him to run, hide, defend or do anything to escape the wrath of this man's chakra. He could feel the massive quantity of chakra molding and instinct guided him into gathering his own chakra. To his side, Roshi was doing the same as twin domes of earth and lava were erected over Iwa forces within range of the two's jutsu. Kyuchi wrote out the brief earthquake that the emerging forest caused and let out a breath of relief as the wood didn't manage to penetrate through the multiple earthen domes his forces had erected. Then he felt a serene feeling was over the domes and the sounds of battle outside came to a brief halt. Through cracks in the multiple earthen domes, he saw what looked to be yellow pollen floating all around. More domes, now. And don't breath in the air, Kyuchi roared loud enough to be heard by all those in his vicinity. His forces moved to comply with his orders as they fought off the serene feeling that was calling them to sleep. After holding the deep forest emergence jutsu for 20 seconds and creating acres of forest, Naruto flipped to the snake and bird seals before calling out, wood style, flowery deep forest bloom, which caused giant red flowers with multiple golden stamens to emerge from trees all over the forest. Switching to the rat hand seal, Naruto finished the final jutsu of the series with wood style, pollination of the divine forest. Big globules of golden pollen suffused the air and began putting the attacking shinobi forces to sleep. On the wall, the rookies watched alongside their Konoha brethren as the rebirth of Hashirama Senju laid waste to the invading forces in a single decisive blow. Their jaws were on the floor and their brains were barely comprehending what their eyes were showing them. If not for their many comrades repeatedly saying things like unfreaking believable or Lord First or the power of Makutan or Lord Senju saved us, then the rookies would have remained in a stunned state of denial. However, the reverent whispers were able to confirm that this was indeed happening. Their comrade, friend and fellow shinobi was indeed halting an invasion single-handedly. Shika, how? H how is this possible? Kuji asked as he stood completely still next to his friend. I, I don't know, Kuji. Shika responded. I knew, I mean I knew Naruto was strong. I knew he could use the Makutan, but, but I never, I never even imagined he was this strong. Ino said in a reverent whisper as silent praise for her lover. It is because he loves you all. That is what gives him this strength, Konkuro said. He had been supporting Gara, but he rejoined the rookies when the horn was sounded. I grew up with the guy and he is a brother to me. He did this for y'all. Not for your village, not for your Hokage but for each of you. Neji, who had been pulled by Hyashi to join the Hyuga Bowman Corps early on joined the conversation as he broke out of his shock, thanks to a trickle of blood falling into his eye. It is unbelievable. I always wondered how Naruto stood up to my father on that night when he was only a boy, but now, now it is clear. He must have let my father go for some reason because my father could never stand up to someone capable of doing this. Rock Lee walked onto the rampart with a limp, and he was supporting Ten Ten who was injured and bleeding from a wound to her side. She was also in a state of shock from watching the display, but her shock deepened as she watched a volley of fireballs get shot into the woods. Naruto's sage mode faded after the final jutsu and he collapsed to the ground in a heap. Itachi ordered Inoiki Yamanaka to take him from the battlefield and get him to the hospital. After watching the monstrous display of power from his student, the fifth Hokage ordered fire users to launch a volley of fire jutsus into the newly emerged and pollinated forest. The remaining Uchiha launched several fire dragons that led the volley of fireballs into the forest. 
the flammable pollen ignited upon contact with the flames which caused a massive explosion in the newly emerged forest. After the heat from the explosion died down to tolerable levels, Itachi, I and Rasa led the counter-offensive into the fiery forest. What ensued was a slaughter of the survivors until they ran into nearly 1,000 Iwa Shinobi that had managed to regroup under the leadership of Kyuchi, son of the third Tsuchikage and father of Kurotsuchi. This led to a pitched battle that lasted until less than 500 Iwa Shinobi scattered into an unorganized retreat. Rather than hunt them down, Itachi ordered his forces back to Konoha to secure the village and begin recovery. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.